This is the year 2055. The entire earth is shrouded in bizarre stories about rules. The world of rules will randomly select participants from various countries to take on challenges. Those who successfully pass the challenges will win great rewards for their entire country. Conversely, punishments according to the rules will befall that country, causing immeasurable disasters and the country I'm in. Long country has failed consecutively five times, leading to the deaths of many citizens. This time, I, an 18-year-old, have been randomly selected but I have no experience and am not expected to do well. The Dong Dao country, which has continuously and luckily passed the challenges five times before, immediately sent mocking messages upon hearing the news. But they don't know that they are about to be slapped in the face because those who enter the bizarre world for the first time all have a chance to draw a talent. And the talent I drew is the extremely rare 3S level talent called Innate Bone Defiance. In the bizarre world, regardless of the rights and wrongs of the rules, as long as you defy, you won't be tainted by any bizarreness. This is completely suitable for me. I'm not good at developing in a stealthy way, but when it comes to the level of defiance, I'm sure I'll score high. Relaxing myself, I immediately stood up and observed my surroundings. This time, I entered the bizarre world called Scraps of Mother. I need to evaluate whether the information on those scraps of paper is right or wrong to pass the challenges in the upcoming days. Rule 1. Whether day or night, you must not draw the curtains. Rule 2. There is frozen beef in the fridge, but it's best to eat it raw. Absolutely do not cook it thoroughly before eating. Rule 3. Absolutely do not turn on the light in the bathroom. Rule 4. The wall clock will tell you the time, but you absolutely must not use it as an alarm clock. Rule 5. Absolutely do not open the door, even if someone knocks. Rule 6. Take good care of the cat in the house, but absolutely do not name it. Rule 7. You must feed the cat noodles, absolutely do not give it cat food. Rule 8. At night when sleeping, you must hug the cat beside you, absolutely do not leave it in the living room. Rule 9. When the neighbor comes to visit, open the door and give them cat food. Rule 10. Absolutely do not watch TV. After reading through the rules, I quickly walked to the window. Then, with a pull, I flung the curtain open. Now, I am mainly a defiant one. In this situation, those outside watching the live broadcast also began to feel perplexed. Could Rule 1 be wrong? And more citizens of Long Country felt excited about my reaction. Accurately assessing the correctness of the rules so quickly was completely unlike the first time entering the bizarre world. Long Country might still be able to redeem itself. Meanwhile, other countries around the world also hurriedly sent reminders to their selected participants, telling them that Rule 1 was wrong. Hearing that news, the selected participant from Dong Dao Country, not wanting to be outdone by me, immediately flung open the curtain, but as he was proudly basking in the sun, a bizarre stream of pollution suddenly descended upon him. Luckily, he drew a talent that could resist three purifications, otherwise, this guy would have grown green grass by now. But the candidates from a few other small countries were not so lucky and were eliminated one by one. This made the remaining candidates more cautious. An hour passed, and nothing happened, so I got bored and hungry. Then I stood up, walked to the fridge. Inside were five blocks of beef and a bundle of noodles, but since the time limit was seven days, clearly five blocks of beef wouldn't be enough to eat. So to avoid going hungry, I reached my hand towards the noodles, and this action of mine once again shocked everyone outside, because the rules clearly stated that the noodles were for the cat to eat. But I ignored it, grabbed the noodles, cooked them, and even cracked an egg into them. But right then, an orange cat appeared from nowhere and stood behind me, observing. Then it jumped down from above to stand beside me, looking back and forth with a humanized gaze. I picked it up, found it so cute that I couldn't help but give it a memorable name. From now on, I'll call it ugly. The cat let out an angry meow, its gaze becoming sharper. At the same time, the outside world also erupted because my words had violated another rule naming the cat, but I completely didn't care what form the cat took. In the bizarre world of rules, the survival rate of the scraps of mother is 99%. If I had to guess, I would surely die, but I have a defiant nature. I just need to keep defying, and then my talent will continuously protect me and help me pass successfully. So no matter how terrifying the scene is, I have to try to endure it. Thinking that way, I didn't hesitate anymore and began to eat the noodles heartily. After finishing, I even burped. I had to admire myself for cooking so deliciously. After eating and drinking my fill, I looked at Ugly staring at me intently beside me. I poured the cat food into its bowl. At this point, the cat also became stranger, 
but I didn't care at all and leisurely washed the dishes in the kitchen. I had to keep defying to the end, seeing me continuously violating many rules. Other countries also rejoiced as if they had a bumper harvest, but the leaders of Long Country were anxiously worried. What the hell is this 18-year-old kid doing? The cat is very important, clearly it can't be named and can't be fed cat food. Now it's great, we've lost the cat's help. The following days will definitely be very difficult. Before, we thought it would be the ray of hope for Long Country, but now we see it's still too young. The leaders of Long Country were dejected, each disappointed by my reaction. Then they decided to use a precious opportunity to remind me to pay attention to the changes in the cat. But right then, the large screen suddenly displayed the latest announcement. The candidates from six countries like Kwa Country, Mean Country, had been swallowed by the bizarre world. Seeing this news, everyone was shocked. Only then did they realize that other countries had probably imitated my approach. As a result, the candidates from powerful countries used their talents to avoid being swallowed, while those from smaller countries were all infected. This inadvertently accelerated the process of the bizarre world. Meanwhile, inside the bizarre world, as noon approached, the candidates from various countries were staring intently at the beef, unsure whether to eat it raw or cooked. But I was different. I cheerfully threw the beef into the pan to fry and then enjoyed a delicious meal. Afterwards, I leisurely lay down on the sofa, intending to take an afternoon nap. At this point, Ugly's eyes had completely lost their humanized look. Full of veins, they exuded a bizarre aura. Seeing this scene, countries around the world also immediately sent reminders to their candidates that Rule 2 was wrong. But some candidates from smaller countries, afraid of making the same mistake as with Rule 1, chose to eat the beef raw. As a result, they were immediately swallowed. Now I had become the guiding light, which infuriated John, the candidate from the United States. He had drawn an S-ranked talent, but was being outshone by me, which he couldn't accept. And when he saw Long Country sending me a reminder, I also realized that other countries were imitating my choices. I smiled faintly, thinking to myself, if they like to imitate, then let them. At this point, I didn't care at all, grabbing Ugly and locking it in the bathroom. Without Ugly around, my mood was much more relaxed as I lay stretched out on the sofa, thinking disdainfully that there was no need to play with a cat. So I turned on the TV, and a pink pig appeared on the screen. I watched intently, but I didn't know that seeing this scene, the outside world erupted in scandal because I had violated another rule. What the hell is this? Watching a naughty pink pig in the bizarre world. Is he taking a vacation? Meanwhile, in the high-level meeting room of a Dong Dao country, a group of elders jumped up and down, still guessing the rights and wrongs of the rules like fools. Why is that kid so relaxed? That bastard John, what is he doing? Is he just going to let long country rise to the top without doing anything? Meanwhile, in the bizarre world, a candidate from a small country also couldn't help but turn on the TV out of boredom. But on his TV, instead of a pink pig, there was a huge bizarre mass. Then he was pulled into the TV before everyone's eyes and disappeared completely. Next, the system announced that due to the elimination of that country's candidate, the bizarre world was about to descend. Only then were the high-ranking officials of various countries hit with a cold reality. The high-ranking officials suddenly realized, continuously guessing that I had drawn a high-ranked talent. Because among the high-ranked talents, there was one that granted immunity to three bizarre intrusions. But now I had consecutively violated three rules. This made the initial relaxed mood of the Long Country leaders tense again. That afternoon in the bizarre world passed, the candidates from the Dong Dao countries and Korea still obediently wanted to imitate me but didn't dare take risks. Meanwhile, I didn't bother with those things and hurriedly ran to the bathroom. Eating too many noodles and beef made me a little indigestive. As soon as I entered the bathroom, it was pitch black inside. In the darkness, there was also a bizarre black shadow moving. According to Rule 3's hint, when using the bathroom, you absolutely must not turn on the light. But for me, not turning on the light was impossible. Without hesitation, I flipped the switch on. The bathroom immediately lit up, very clean, with nothing bizarre at all. Only ugly came running out from under my feet, but as I was about to finish up, I noticed a few scratch marks on the wall that looked exactly like cat claws. These scratches perfectly formed the word death. I immediately pulled up my pants angrily and ran out to the living room, grabbing ugly. It was you who scratched all over the bathroom wall, wasn't it? If you can't write, then don't write. If I see you vandalizing again, I'll make you into soup. Saying that, I slapped it twice. Seeing it look at me somewhat defiantly, I threw it back into the bathroom, yelling loudly, behave yourself. No matter what bizarre thing you are, 
I have enough ways to deal with you. If you don't clean up those scratches on the wall tonight, tomorrow I'll cook you up to eat. This action of mine once again caused the crowd watching outside to buzz with discussion about my cruelty. How could you hit such a cute cat? Those two slaps must have really hurt it. Meanwhile, a candidate from another country, having held it in all day, could no longer hold his bladder and was about to wet his pants, so he hurriedly ran into the bathroom without bothering to turn on the light. And the crowd watching the live broadcast outside thought this was a live stream with a certain flavor. But just as he sat down on the toilet bowl, ready to enjoy himself, countless bizarre things rushed at him from all sides to attack. Everyone thought he was about to die, but a glowing ring of light suddenly appeared around him blocking the attacks from all sides. But before he could catch his breath, the bizarre things attacked again, and his immunity seemed to only work once. Soon after, there were signs of it breaking. Without time to put his pants back on, he quickly ran out of the bathroom door and quickly turned on the light, and as soon as the light came on, the bizarre things disappeared as if they had never appeared. So, before countless eyes, the pantsless guy sacrificed one immunity to temporarily ensure his safety. Seeing him escape the bizarre danger, the Dongdao country leaders also cheered joyfully. But they didn't know that the pantsless guy who had just escaped death couldn't be happy because now he only had one final immunity left. But he was still lucky to at least survive, unlike some candidates from other countries who didn't turn on the light, who were swallowed up immediately. And when other countries were eliminated one by one, now there were only six major countries and three small countries still standing firm. Meanwhile, in the bizarre world of rules, a day had passed until 10 p.m. I showered early and lay on the bed. Unlike the other candidates, I continued to rebel by consecutively violating two more rules. I took the wall clock down, set the alarm, and placed it on the bedside table. And when sleeping, I didn't hug a cat to sleep like the other candidates, but left ugly in the living room, letting it fend for itself. This meant I had chosen a direction completely opposite to theirs. In the late night when the other candidates were asleep, nothing bizarre happened. But ugly outside my room underwent horrific changes. First, its fur fell off in patches, then its skin tore open. A human figure climbed out from inside its body, with no one able to make out the face, only guessing it was a woman from the long hair and figure. So under the tense gaze of countless people outside, she walked around and then stopped in front of my bedroom door, just standing there bizarrely. The crowd watching the live broadcast outside also complained, sister, why are you like that guy? How long has it been with no movement? You've been standing there for over three hours. Can you do anything or not? If not, we're going to sleep. But before they finished speaking, they saw the woman suddenly shudder and turn around, letting out a miserable scream. At the same time, all the live broadcast images suddenly went pitch black. This scene also startled the people of Long Country. Comments kept popping up. Great, now we're wide awake. Now we're even more excited than when injecting drugs. My mom asked why I haven't slept yet. I showed her the video clip just now and now she's shivering with me under the blanket. Meanwhile, it took 30 minutes for the live broadcast to gradually return to normal, showing ugly sleeping soundly as if nothing had happened to it. But at this point, the long country leaders could no longer sit still because the scene from earlier was too bizarre to ignore. However, this also proved that my decision not to let ugly into the room was correct because this cat has issues. Quickly send a warning message to the kid again telling him to stay away from the cat. Meanwhile, my bizarre video clip also appeared in the leadership meeting rooms of various countries. Then an hour, the Dong Dao country, which always opposed Long Country, was extremely excited. Believing that the cat's bizarre transformation was due to me violating the rules, hoping I would be eliminated soon. Meanwhile, the leaders of Mi Country also raised their heads arrogantly, looking at the scene with disdain, believing that my and Long Country's luck had ended here. Only the leader of Ba Thiet Country looked worried, closely watching the video and cheering me on. He even sent a secret message to Long Country saying he would always stand on the same front with Long Country. The next morning, as soon as I woke up, I received a warning from the leaders. This was the second time they warned me about the danger of the cat. What did they see last night? That ugly is actually a woman? Although ugly is truly a bizarre creature, as long as I keep rebelling and violating these rules, it can't do anything to me now. Otherwise, it would have acted against me last night. There's no way I could have survived until now. I reorganized my thoughts, and after careful consideration, I was no longer worried about Ugly's transformation. I opened the bedroom door, walked into the living room, glanced at Ugly licking its paws on the sofa, then headed straight to the bathroom. But when I entered the bathroom, I discovered that the word death scratched on the wall last night had disappeared. The wall was very smooth, as if the scratches had never existed. Seeing this, 
I had a definite suspicion that Udli had issues. Otherwise, how could a cat erase those scratches so perfectly? I really shouldn't be too kind dead. Then I went to the kitchen to cook noodles and also fed Ugly, still giving it cat food, but as I was enjoying my delicious breakfast, the live broadcast from other countries fell silent. Meanwhile, in the bizarre world, while Fak Ha from Ba Thiet country and I woke up on time, the candidates from other countries remained silent, unable to distinguish day from night. This left the leaders of other countries puzzled until they realized that Fak Ha and I shared one thing in common. We both used clocks as alarm clocks. That meant the fourth rule was actually half right and half wrong, and in the bizarre world, mistaking the time meant death. Once the challenge went past the time limit, the punishment would be far more cruel than usual. There was a powerful country that disappeared in just one night because of this reason. So, when they saw their candidates still sleeping, the high-ranking officials of the countries panicked. Only the American leader remained calm taking the lead to send a reminder to their candidate. Other countries followed suit, but by the time the candidates were woken up one by one, their three valuable hints had been used up. Now, apart from Long Country and Bathiat Country, who still had their last hint remaining, the other countries had no more hints left. Those outside the screen could only watch the situation unfold. Meanwhile, in the bizarre world, the candidates who had just woken up also understood what was happening. Regarding me taking the lead once again, John from America felt extremely angry, like the main character in a movie suddenly having the spotlight stolen by an extra. He couldn't accept that, but he didn't know this wasn't Hollywood. Here, I was the main character. As for the guy from Dong Dao country, he was still sitting on the sofa, hastily compiling all the available information on his mother's 10 pieces of paper. According to what he had gathered so far, there were only 10 rules, with rules 1, 6, 7, 8, and 10 being correct. Rules 2 and 3 were wrong. Rule 4 was half right and half wrong, while rules 5 and 9 couldn't be confirmed yet, but there were clearly contradictions. Rule 5 had a very strange point that didn't mention neighbors at all. That meant you couldn't open the door for strangers, but you could open it for neighbors. But how could you determine if the person knocking was a neighbor or some other bizarre creature? At that very moment, simultaneous knocking sounds echoed in all the candidates' rooms. The sudden noise startled them so much that they didn't dare breathe. Only I, watching TV, shouted towards the door, who's there? It's me, your neighbor, said a polite sounding male voice from outside. Then I stood up and walked to the door. But when I opened it, there was no one outside. As I was looking around in bewilderment, a bizarre black shadow suddenly appeared and lunged at me like lightning. Immediately, accompanied by a series of screams from the outside world, my live broadcast went pitch black. Seeing this, almost everyone in Long Country collapsed to the ground. Teachers and students cried bitterly, their eyes full of despair, thinking I had been eliminated. The bizarre world was about to descend, and Long Country would have to face the catastrophe of extinction. Meanwhile, the leading countries, led by America, also saw my image and applauded gleefully. They all believed that my reckless decision had caused Long Country to lose all hope, and the era of Long Country was about to end. They sneered mockingly, saying they would witness our extinction firsthand. As time passed for five minutes, what disappointed the other countries made the people of Long Country rejoice. That was because the bizarre world did not appear, and everything remained normal. At this point, everyone was surprised and confused, completely unaware of what had happened. But the people of Long Country kept staring at my live broadcast, hoping for a miracle, and just a moment later, the miracle did happen. After being pitch black for 10 minutes, my screen suddenly returned to normal. Seeing that I was unharmed, the entire Long Country cheered with joy. I also laughed loudly, reporting to everyone that I was fine. Sorry, earlier I was attacked by the bizarre creature, so the screen was blocked, but now I'm okay. My arrogant statement caused a stir in Long Country. What, just a little attack? You're understating it. This time, your performance deserves a perfect score from me. Don't be too proud. My words made Long Country beam with pride. For the first time, someone dared to look down on the bizarre creature like that. But as there is joy, there is also sorrow. Seeing me return safely, the leading countries, led by America, were furiously angry, shouting and pounding the table violently. Meanwhile, in the bizarre world, the knocking on the door never stopped. Apart from me, no one dared to get up and open the door. Everyone remained huddled and trembling on the sofa, but since they didn't react for too long, the knocking turned into loud, thunderous banging on the door. A candidate from South Korea, terrified, held his head, went crazy with red eyes, and shouted at the door, stop knocking. Who are you? What do you want? The knocking stopped immediately after those words, but just when Park thought everything was fine, a massive blade suddenly slashed through the door, 
breaking it open. The intense scene made Park wet himself, curling up on the sofa and groaning non-stop. Seeing Park's cowardice, the people of Long Country naturally didn't miss this golden opportunity. A barrage of insults aimed at Park erupted from Long Country's netizens. Meanwhile, South Korea's leaders, reading those comments, were so angry they nearly fainted. It was like they had eaten what Park had just excreted. Thirty minutes later, the noise outside the door finally stopped, but everyone remained tense, fearing that the bizarre creature could attack and beat them up at any moment. Only I remained calm, eating a piece of beef and planning to take a nap on the sofa. But at that moment, the knocking on the door sounded again. Who is it this time? The voice outside the door sounded normal and polite. But that politeness made me feel it was unreasonable. Wasn't once enough? Why are you back? Actually, the first time, I was prepared to open the door, knowing it wasn't a neighbor outside. How could a neighbor in the bizarre world have a normal tone? Only the bizarre creature would use a human voice to lure others into opening the door. But even though I knew it wasn't a neighbor outside, according to the hint from Rule 5 that I couldn't open the door, I had to do the opposite. Only by completely defying the rules could I continuously receive the protection of my talent. So, after mentally preparing myself, I opened the room door again. But unlike the previous time, this time there was nothing outside. Perhaps the bizarre creature was just going through the motions, knowing it couldn't harm me, so it gave up. Seeing this, I felt it was unreasonable. I mentally prepared for so long just to open the door, and you're not attacking me. You really lack professional ethics. Meanwhile, the people of Long Country, seeing that I dared to open the door even after being attacked earlier, all bowed their heads in respect. At the same time, on Park's side in South Korea, the knocking on the door sounded again. Everyone thought he would cower like a quail on the sofa again like the first time, but his reaction left them in utter shock. Park laughed hysterically and walked straight to the door. It turned out that after the previous door slashing incident, his spirit had been shaken. And so, under the watchful eyes of countless people, Park, without hesitation, flung the door wide open. But unlike me, the moment Park opened the door, his live broadcast immediately went pitch black. Then a chilling voice echoed throughout the world. Candidate Park of South Korea has been swallowed by the bizarre creature. The bizarre world is about to descend. The countdown begins. At this point, the entire outside world erupted in heated discussions. Why did we both open the door? but I was unharmed while Park suffered the opposite fate. But the leaders and people of South Korea were not at leisure, cursing Park, you wretched Park. To be so foolishly afraid of just a knocking on the door, seeing South Korea, a country that had continuously mocked us, finally having to face the bizarre world, everyone applauded. With the elimination of South Korea, now in the bizarre world, there were only two small countries left, excluding Long Country. Bothiat Country, which had been friendly with Long Country and Dongdao Country. Based on experience, larger countries have more information about the bizarre world, so their candidates tend to remain calmer during incidents compared to smaller countries. But the bizarre world is complex and diverse, and even when larger countries study that information thoroughly, they cannot guarantee 100% success. Two consecutive incidents of someone knocking on the door in the bizarre world made the surviving candidates more cautious. But just as they thought it couldn't happen a third time, the knocking sounded again. This time, at 7 p.m., the knocking resumed causing the candidates to become tense once more. This time, it was also someone claiming to be a neighbor, saying they came to borrow food for their cat and could trade for it. But this time, the voice was clearly different from the previous two times. I realized it might actually be a neighbor this time, but since I still had plenty of food, I stood up, went to the door, and politely declined their request. The neighbor seemed surprised. After making sure I wouldn't open the door, the footsteps gradually faded away on the stairs. Looking at the other countries, John of the United States did the complete opposite of me. He decided to open the door and trade food with the neighbor. During the process, he was not attacked at all. Meanwhile, the guy from Dongdao country was still trembling, curled up on the sofa like the previous two times. The description of him as a turtle retracting its head was quite accurate, but just as people were mocking him, an unexpected scene occurred. A black shadow, resembling a tentacle, seemed to have entered his house and charged straight at him. But just as the black shadow was about to attack him, a bright yellow ring appeared, causing the bizarre creature to retreat. Meanwhile, the people of Long Country, watching the live broadcast, saw this guy narrowly escape the monster's attack once again, and began to engage in heated discussions. This guy is really lucky. It didn't hit him at all. What was that bright ring around him? 
was it the chosen talent? I counted, and it appeared three times already, so it must be his talent. And this talent can grant immunity from the monster's attacks, at least rank air higher. He's so lucky to have drawn such a good talent. What talent did he get in the bizarre world? The second day in the bizarre world passed amid everyone's debates. Until now, there are seven candidates remaining in the bizarre world. Me from Long Country, John from the United States, Fak Ha from Bathiat Country, Eldora from England, Arthur from Germany, Adolf from France, and the guy from Dongdao Country. On the morning of the third day, the candidates woke up to the sound of an alarm clock, but when they looked at the scraps of paper from their mothers, they saw several new rules added. Rule 11. The cat will protect you, but it can also harm you. Rule 12. If you see the cat exhibiting abnormal behavior, kill it immediately. Rule 13. Sometimes a strange woman will appear. Try to talk to her and trust her completely. Rule 14. Time will become chaotic, so you cannot rely on clocks. Rule 15. You can go outside, but you must stare at your shoes. Rule 16. Do not lock your bedroom door. Rule 17. There is nothing on the balcony, no matter what sounds you hear, do not be curious. Rule 18. Mother will not return. Open the door after 7 days, and everything will end. The sudden appearance of these 8 new rules also left the candidates feeling confused, as the first 2 rules made them feel uneasy. In the eyes of the other candidates, cats were always good characters, and apart from me, they had all slept with cats for the past 2 nights. But the emergence of rules 11 and 12 made them shudder. When I saw the new rules, I found ugly sitting on the sofa even more strange, but I wasn't scared of it at all. I gave it two slaps and said I wanted to eat cat meat today. Ugly cried out pitifully and ran off into the bathroom, but as I stood by the window, wondering how to deal with Ugly, I discovered a doll suddenly appearing on the balcony. The doll wasn't made of fabric but seemed to be made of skin. I was dazed, did Ugly do this? I didn't see it yesterday. After saying that, I walked closer and picked up the doll, but as soon as I held it, my hand felt icy cold. Looking down, I saw it was drenched in blood somehow and the blood seemed to crawl onto my hand like a worm. Luckily, I'm always protected by my talent. A faint yellow glow appeared on my palm, dissolving the blood. Next, the doll's skin started to rot and fall off. More blood gushed out. What a disgusting thing to ruin my morning. After saying that, I threw it into the restroom. Soon after, the sound of ugly jumping up and down came from the restroom, and my action also caused a heated discussion among the crowd outside, wondering if ugly was still in the restroom or if this doll was also part of the bizarreness. I mean, using the bizarre to counter the bizarre, that's a good idea. Meanwhile, the scene of me neutralizing the doll's attack also caught some people's attention. The American leaders believed my talent must be S-class since until now, both Eldora and I were able to be immune to the monster's attacks. But my immunity had exceeded three times, so they realized I wouldn't be easy to deal with. They could only hope their candidate John would soon surpass me to complete the challenge. Meanwhile, in the bizarre world, America's John was hesitating whether to use his talent or not. He had three chances to distinguish right from wrong rules, plus his talent allowed him to talk to any candidate for 30 seconds, without needing direct contact. However, out of those three chances to distinguish right from wrong, he had already used two chances on the previous two days, so now he only had one chance left. At this moment, he was hesitating whether to use his last chance to distinguish the good or bad nature of the cat, but ultimately decided against it because regardless of whether the cat played a good or bad role, he still had to be cautious of it, so distinguishing it here wouldn't hold much significance. Moreover, Rule 18 was the most important, whether the challenge in the bizarre world really only lasted 7 days. If this was a wrong rule set to deceive, it could easily lead to failure. After thinking it over, he decided to use his last chance on Rule 18. When his talent was activated for the third and final time to distinguish right from wrong, a hint appeared on the scrap of paper from his mother, Rule 18 wrong. Seeing this, John breathed a sigh of relief. Indeed, this was a wrong rule. There's no way the kid from Long Country could have come up with it. But just as he was smiling happily, the sound of a baby crying suddenly rang out from the balcony. John was dazed, his body instinctively wanting to pull back the curtain to look, but then Ugly suddenly appeared, blocking him. Its mouth kept meowing incessantly. You want to warn me not to go, don't you? John knelt down and petted Ugly. Under his gaze, Ugly nodded repeatedly. Seeing this, John also realized that the cat was truly protecting him, but it was certainly no ordinary cat. In fact, even without Ugly, John would not have risked going to the balcony to check, because the rules clearly stated not to be curious about the balcony. The reason he pretended to want to go to the balcony was just to confirm the cat's reaction. 
Meanwhile, at the other candidates' houses, the sound of a newborn baby crying also rang out. Needless to say, Eldora's first reaction at this moment was to tremble. It's not that he didn't want to go check, he just didn't dare. And with the sudden sound from the balcony, most of the candidates chose to ignore it. But Adolf from France, due to his tense nerves and chaotic thoughts, hastily pulled back the curtain. Before he could react, the doll lunged at him. Then, the cold system announcement rang out, candidate Adolf from France has been swallowed whole. The bizarre world is about to descend, the countdown begins. Adolf's elimination caused panic among the French people, but the leaders remained relatively calm, quickly issuing a nationwide warning message and initiating level 1 alert. Activate the chip, immediately transfer all data related to the scrap of paper from the mother into the people's brains. That's the difference between major and minor countries. Major countries have chip technology that can transfer information to the public immediately to minimize casualties. While all of that had nothing to do with me, at this moment, I was leisurely leaning against the bathroom door, listening to the sounds of ugly and the doll fighting inside. After a while, when the bathroom fell silent, I opened the door. Just as I was about to check the situation inside, Ugly suddenly dashed out. When I looked closely, I saw that its fur had fallen out completely, looking quite embarrassed. It seemed to have lost. After that, seeing Ugly lying on the sofa, glaring at me resentfully, seeing that it was still not ready to admit defeat, I mocked, what's this? Haven't you two decided the winner yet? How about we bring it out so you can have a rematch? But before I could finish speaking, Ugly suddenly cried out, leapt three meters high in fright and scurried under the table. Seeing Ugly's fear, the online spectators all praised, saying that doll must be a master. It seems the doll was the real winner. Suddenly, I felt a bit sorry for Ugly, as it had met its toughest opponent this time. Using the bazaar to fight the bazaar is a good idea. If the bazaar world descends on long country, we should do the same. Forget it, only that kid would dare do that. If we did that now, we'd already be lying underground. While everyone was excitedly discussing, I dragged the doll out from the bathroom. I only saw two scratch marks on its body left by Ugly. There were no other wounds. But when I picked it up for inspection, it was also staring at me with those pitch black eyes. Then its face gradually became ferocious, the corners of its mouth curling up frighteningly. Seeing that, I quickly tore open the doll's mouth, praising myself for being smart. Luckily I broke its spell in time, avoiding a horrific battle. Thinking it was useless now, but could still be used to guard the door tonight, I gave it two more slaps and threw it back into the bathroom. As for me, I leisurely went to eat lunch. It was still beef today. Although I also wanted to change my palate, but this was still the bizarre world of rules, not a five-star resort. There was no other food at home, so I had to endure it. If the other candidates heard this thought of mine, they would probably spit blood from anger. After eating, I lay on the sofa as usual and turned on the TV to watch the Peppa Pig cartoon series. But soon after, the initial scene reappeared. A bizarre creature with disheveled hair, uglier than Sadako, crawled out from the TV. I had never seen such a horrifying scene before so I ran into the bathroom and grabbed the doll. Then, in front of the monster, I slapped the doll two more times. After I slapped it, both the doll and the monster looked at me with a dazed expression. The doll didn't understand why I did that. As for the monster, it didn't know what to do next. The two sides faced each other like that for about one minute. Finally, the monster remembered its task and growled, lunging towards me. After all, it still had to prove its professional ethics. I had no choice but to use my final move, dragging Ugly out from under the table and continuing to slap it twice right in front of the monster. These two slaps became a series of three consecutive slaps. They, the monsters in various bizarre forms, stood dumbfounded watching me with blank expressions. Then, after a moment of silence, the monster seemed to realize my position in this house and stood up, respectfully bowed to me, then seriously crawled back into the TV. The monster that came out from the TV was certainly not as terrifying as the doll and ugly. Seeing those two get beaten, it decided not to dare cause any more trouble. In this way, I successfully avoided a tragedy. Feeling more formidable than usual, my crisis was resolved. The crowd outside was completely shocked. What the heck is this? Everyone praised that I could subdue the world. I could defeat the entire universe. I was definitely number one in the bizarre world. The British leadership also began paying more attention to my live broadcasts. The German and British leaders even sent secret telegrams to long country expressing goodwill. However, some countries were not pleased. The American and East Island country leaders now only had dark expressions. East Island country even mobilized the entire nation to monitor me closely, determined to confront Long Country to the end. Meanwhile, the Long Country leadership also received friendly secret telegrams from Germany and Britain, 
wanting to become allies. This performance of mine exceeded the leadership's expectations. They thought that as long as I handled the cat issue well, passing the challenge would not be impossible. And the final remaining hint would help me a lot at the decisive moment, ensuring my successful completion of the challenge. Meanwhile, in the bizarre world, I was completely unaware that my actions were causing such a great stir on the outside. I was still leisurely frying beef, planning to eat my fill and then go to bed early, after all. Slapping people is tiring. But at that moment, the sound of high heels suddenly rang out from the living room. Turning around, I saw a woman who had been standing behind me. I didn't know since when. Eye to eye. I almost fainted. I clearly remembered that all the doors in and out of the house were locked from the inside. This woman seemed to have appeared out of nowhere. At this moment, I recalled the content on my mother's note. Rule 13. Sometimes a strange woman will appear. Try to talk to her and completely trust her. My brain was working at full capacity. If this was the correct rule, then I now needed to find out about this woman. But I didn't want to do that because here, I had to resist in order to receive the protection of my talent. So after a brief eye contact, I carried the plate of beef out. The first thing I did was look for ugly all over the house, but strangely, it had disappeared at this point. Or was it really as the long country leadership warned, that this woman was related to ugly? Wait, could she be the one who left those notes? Could this woman be the one who left those notes? Or was it just because I slapped ugly a few times, so I couldn't take it and transformed into this woman to take revenge on me? But when I was about to go back to the kitchen to look for clues from that woman, I found that she had disappeared, I didn't know since when. My mind was in a mess, completely unable to understand what had happened, mysteriously appearing, then mysteriously disappearing. Full of doubts, I carefully checked the kitchen again but still couldn't find any useful clues. But the crowd outside could sense that the two women who appeared one after another, although similar, also had some differences. Meanwhile, at the other candidates' homes, similar women also appeared. Arthur from Germany, seeing the woman appear suddenly but not attacking him, immediately thought rule 13 could be correct. So he took the initiative to approach, converse with, and completely trust that woman, hoping to gather some useful information. But his communication wasn't smooth because the woman didn't say a word, only giving Arthur a strange smile before disappearing. Seeing the woman disappear, Arthur was also dumbfounded, standing frozen on the spot. But unlike me, he quickly realized that at the place where the woman disappeared, there was a piece of paper. Opening it up, he only saw a small line, I am me, I am not me. But the meaning of this sentence was completely vague. From the time she appeared to the time she left was only about 10 minutes, and in the evaluation of this rule, three people received the woman's notes, but no one understood the specific meaning of that sentence. Back to me, two minutes after the woman disappeared, Ugly crawled out from under the sofa. Seeing Ugly suddenly appear, I was annoyed, because earlier, I had carefully checked under the sofa and didn't see any trace of Ugly. This reinforced my judgment that Ugly and the woman could only appear one at a time. I silently thanked my luck that initially I didn't get close with it, nor bring it into the bedroom. Otherwise, the consequences would be hard to predict. Today, I'd have to keep it outside the room. Among all the candidates besides me, John also realized the cat wasn't simple. But the others still let the cat sleep in their rooms. Currently, the cat still seemed very normal, so they didn't notice anything unusual. Until midnight, the others' cats were still normal, but the cat John left in the living room started meowing, scratching and clawing everywhere. John could only break out in a cold sweat, lock his room door, and pretend to sleep. But compared to John's cat, Ugly's transformation was clearly more terrifying. If John's cat was just in the initial evil transformation stage, then Ugly had definitely reached the final evil stage. Before the eyes of countless long country citizens, that horrific scene replayed. Ugly was seen sitting eerily still in the living room, the moonlight shining on its naked body creating a creepy feeling without any fur covering. From behind it looked like a naked child. And before long, it stood up straight, its front legs tearing through the outer layer of skin. After 10 minutes of bloody struggle, a female figure finally crawled out from Ugly's body, writhing. But unlike before, after appearing, the woman didn't wander around but looked straight towards my bedroom, approaching me. Her whole body exuded an eerie aura, then she suddenly gripped the door handle tightly, as if wanting to open it. This scene also made the crowd watching the live stream in the middle of the night so scared that they couldn't breathe. But luckily, I had the habit of locking my room door before sleeping, so the door remained closed. But just as everyone had breathed a sigh of relief, the woman forcefully, the lock was instantly deformed. In no time, she tore it off and threw it hard to the ground. And at that very moment, whether due to the noise from the lock or the doll sensing danger, the doll, which had been bowing its head, suddenly looked up, its red eyes glaring at the woman, 
its mouth twisted in a terrifying grin. Then it suddenly lunged forward, laughing loudly, attacking the woman. But at that decisive moment, the live stream suddenly went black, the signal cut off once again. The abrupt interruption of the live room also left the long country citizens a bit disappointed. They didn't care about the battle between the doll and the woman, but were concerned for my safety. Didn't expect the doll to protect the kid. The kid made the right decision at the right time again, huh? If I hadn't placed the doll in front of the bedroom door, who knows what kind of horrific thing would have happened. The kid always looks nonchalant but is actually very attentive to details. Amidst the non-stop discussions, a long country citizen stayed in my live room from midnight until morning. Now it's the fourth day in this bizarre rule world. At 7am, my live stream finally returned to normal. I was just yawning, having just woken up, opening the door to see, and as expected, I knew everything that happened outside my bedroom door last night. In such a state of high nervous tension, even though I knew the monster couldn't harm me, I still didn't dare sleep soundly. In this bizarre rule world, completely letting your guard down is no different from going to the bathroom with the lights on, looking for death. Looking at the chaotic scene on the floor, I knew there must have been a fierce battle last night. When I found the doll on the floor, I saw it was in terrible shape, its right hand gone, one eye taken out, its body covered in wounds, only the upper half remaining. Looking at the doll, I also felt sorry for it. After all, it was injured while protecting me, so I planned to sew its body back together. Although I only knew basic sewing, it would still be better than its current state. But in reality, my sewing it back together wasn't entirely out of kindness. I realized the doll would still be useful in the remaining days. At the very least, having this free bodyguard would make me much safer. I wouldn't have to worry about the woman barging in and attacking me while I slept. What surprised me was that during the sewing process, the doll no longer seemed as frightening as before. It seemed to have its own consciousness. So, I spent about an hour sewing, and finally finished sewing the doll's entire body, then placed it on the sofa to fix the door lock. This task also took me over an hour, but finally, it was done. Looking at the doll and the newly fixed lock, I couldn't help but feel proud of myself. Turns out I'm a little genius too. But when I finished these two tasks, I realized it was almost 12 noon already. Something was definitely off. Sewing the doll and fixing the lock shouldn't have taken that much time. I realized this clock seemed to be running faster than in the earlier days. It was then that I remembered the content of rule 14 time will be in disarray so I can't rely on the clock. But the problem here is that the clock is the only source to tell accurate time. If I don't trust it, how can I know how much time has passed? But since I have a natural rebellious talent, I have to look at this issue from a different angle. The rule wants me to completely distrust the time on the clock, so I'll deliberately trust it instead. My principle is to go against everything. In this bizarre world, besides me being the first to notice the time disarray, John from the US also paid attention to the time issue. But his choice was completely opposite to mine. He began to doubt the accuracy of the time on the clock. Apart from John and me, the other kids didn't know what to do and completely ignored the changing time. But precisely because they didn't realize it, they unconsciously chose the same approach as me. I have a protective talent, while they don't. If they keep being unaware of the time issue, it won't be long before they're eliminated. Of course, that has nothing to do with me. At this moment, I'm sitting comfortably on the sofa, watching TV leisurely. The program on TV is the bizarre sight of a Sadako cosplayer jumping rope. Judging by its ability to stretch its body, I feel it must be a professional. Today is abnormally quiet, but not everyone can remain calm in the face of this quietness like I can. Some people are too idle and have to find trouble. Eldora from the UK is a prime example. She decided to explore the outside world because there's a rule that you can go out but must stare at your own shoes. It was this rule that led to her misjudgment. She thought there must be important clues outside the room, and finding them would give her information others didn't have. From there, she could take the lead and increase her chances of passing the challenge. But reality often differs from expectations. Before the eyes of millions, Eldora decided to open the door and step out, and nothing happened, because she hadn't gone far before being swallowed up. Immediately, the cold system announcement rang out across the world. Candidate Eldora from the UK has been swallowed up. The bizarre world is approaching. The countdown begins. Thus, the fourth day passed in the strange peace of the bizarre world. At 8 a.m. on the fifth day, I opened the room door on time. As expected, I was greeted by a chaotic scene. The doll had another fierce battle with the woman last night. Seeing the doll missing limbs, I felt helpless. I just sewed your arm yesterday, and now it's torn apart again. This woman is so crazy, still trying to defeat me. I have to sew it every day. I'm going to become a tailor soon. I don't know how much longer the doll can hold up. I sat on the sofa, quickly sewed up the doll then threw it into the bathroom. Because I thought, 
If the woman didn't let me sleep well at night, then the ugly one shouldn't rest peacefully during the day either. I had to recoup some profit from it. After all, the ugly one is an evil thing, innately rebellious. As for me, while the doll and the ugly one fought in the bathroom, I went down to the kitchen to cook and eat a bowl of noodles. But when I brought the noodles out, the woman who previously wore red high heels suddenly appeared again, sitting silently and staring at me intently. Her gaze sent shivers down my spine, but I didn't dare talk to the woman either, because if I made contact, I would lose the protection of my talent. So I just sat beside her and ate the noodles by myself. But after finishing the big bowl, when one looked up, the woman had disappeared again. However, this time she left me a piece of paper. The red writing stood out prominently. Deal with the cat before 12 noon. I'll find you tonight. I stared at the piece of paper, a bit confused. The ugly one has been with me for many days, could it be replaced? Moreover, I'm not sure if this can be considered a new rule or not. If this sentence is a rule, then logically I should do the opposite to be protected by my talent. But if it's not a rule, then I need to consider the real purpose and meaning of this passage. Suppose this woman is like the one last night who wanted to attack me, then her words need to be considered carefully. But I feel the woman just now didn't mean any harm to me. At this moment, I'm puzzled. On one hand, I feel the woman who appeared just now is the mother who left the note. On the other hand, I sense she could be the same woman who appeared outside the room last night. But if they are the same person, why did their attitudes change so drastically? I'm completely baffled. But at that moment, the ugly one's miserable screams suddenly rang out from the bathroom. I rushed in to check and saw that the ugly one had been killed by the doll. Seeing this scene, a sense of unease arose in me because everything that happened today had gone far beyond my expectations. For the first time, I felt flustered. I didn't understand why the doll would do such a thing. Although it treated the ugly one badly, it never intended to kill it. Why did it suddenly take action? Or maybe the doll accidentally overheard me reading the message on the paper. I should have realized this doll is not an ordinary toy. But in a way, it has also helped me a great deal because whether the message on the paper is a rule or not, it no longer affects me now. Meanwhile, the other candidates are also staring at the woman's note, puzzled like me, facing the same difficult decision. Because in the mother's instructions, there are quite a few rules related to the cat. But apart from me and John from the US, the other four have not seen anything unusual about the cat until now. If the 12 o'clock rule is correct, then the woman's message contradicts the rule. So after intense consideration, Arthur Ivanov, the representative from the island nation, decided to keep the cat. As for Faka, since he received the final reminder from his country's leadership, he decided to follow me and eliminate the cat. As for John's cat, after two nights outside the living room, it had become quite abnormal, so the choice was not difficult for John. But the timing of taking action was a big issue because the woman's note requested dealing with the cat before 12 noon. However, since John didn't trust the time on the clock, he couldn't determine what time it was now. At this moment, the clock showed 12.01. But according to John's estimation that the clock was running a few hours fast, he thought taking action now would still be in time. After that, John didn't hesitate any longer and immediately rushed towards the cat. 10 p.m., the fifth day was about to end. At this time, I sat wearily in the living room, guarding the dead ugly one, waiting for the woman's appearance. As I was drowsy and about to close my eyes, the woman appeared right on time. But this time, she didn't appear abruptly but crawled out from the ugly one's corpse right in front of me. Witnessing that scene, I felt a bit nauseous. The woman stood before me, speaking for the first time, and her first words were thank you. I was stunned, but she didn't explain, only recounting everything herself. It turned out all the rules and notes were left by this woman. She was that mother who realized she had become part of the bazaar, so she could only turn into a cat to stay here, because she wanted to wait for her real son. But in the end, she understood she couldn't wait any longer, so she left the note, telling us to eliminate the cat so she could escape the monster's control and regain her sober self. The woman's voice became increasingly choked, like an ordinary mother expressing her longing for her child. And at that moment, I was no longer afraid of her because I saw the love of a great, steadfast mother. After saying thank you, she finally disappeared before my eyes. I stared intently at the spot where the woman vanished, and it took me a long time before turning to the doll and saying, cry if you want to cry, because I realized the doll could be her son. So every night it was ready to sacrifice its arms and legs just to avoid harming the woman. The message to me is me. I'm not the woman's me, but I can also understand that during the day it was the doll's real human form. But at night, it had become part of the monster. At this point, the doll had cried into a puddle of tears. Although it couldn't cry out loud, the tears kept flowing. 
I didn't know how to console it, I could only silently stay by its side. Suddenly, a system notification rang out, breaking the somber atmosphere. Candidate Tohyu, congratulations on completing the challenge perfectly. Challenge rating, 5 stars. Completion reward, the doll's monster resistance ability increased by 1%. Current monster resistance ability increased by 1%. Introduction to the doll, a part of the bizarre world outside, at the critical moment. The doll will protect you safely. Only then did I realize that the first part on the mother's paper was also a rule, and it was a wrong rule. The actual time for the paper challenge was only 5 days. The hint information was actually there from the beginning, but no one thought of it. For example, the amount of food in the fridge was only enough for 5 days. I silently thanked my luck for making the right decision. Otherwise, I might have foolishly waited until the 7th day. Then I saw a black imprint silently appearing on my arm. This is the talent I obtained after passing the challenge, and this talent can be kept and used in the next challenge. Meanwhile, the outside world also erupted because of my 5-star achievement, so the Dragon Nation received a special reward. The life expectancy of the Dragon Nation's people increased by 10 years. The people of the Dragon Nation said their backs no longer hurt, their legs no longer ached. Even my bedridden uncle for many years could stand up. But where there is joy, there is sorrow. The US and island nation leaders are now jumping angrily, cursing and blaming each other. But all of that has nothing to do with me because I need to prepare for the next challenge in 3 days. After successfully passing the mother's paper challenge, I was transmitted to the real world under the watchful eyes of the Dragon Nation's people. Back there, I was treated like a hero. Meanwhile, the remaining candidates in the bizarre world of rules faced different outcomes. Faka also passed the challenge successfully because he followed the leadership's instructions, eliminating the cat. But because he only achieved one star, he didn't receive any rewards from the bizarre world. After Faka and I were taken away, the remaining four people in the bizarre world were John from the US, Arthur from Germany, Ivanov from Russia, and the person from the island nation. At this point, in front of the four of them was a woman, but this woman seemed strange and looked very frightening. After looking at John for a short while, the woman suddenly rushed towards him and tightly gripped his neck. In fact, although John realized the clock was running fast and had dealt with the cat according to the time he thought was accurate, he failed to realize that the previous night was exceptionally long. The clock had restored to the correct time at that point, and rule 14 was essentially a misleading rule. So John was swallowed whole, immediately departing in hatred. The three remaining people looked at the woman before them with increasing bewilderment and fear, completely unaware of what was happening. Because right before the woman appeared, they didn't sense anything unusual about the cat. The woman didn't say anything, only saying time's up, and then swallowed them all. Immediately after, the system notification sounded. John from the US, Arthur from Germany, Ivanov from Russia, the person from the island nation have been swallowed. The bizarre world is about to arrive. Countdown begins. Meanwhile, in the outside world, the US and island nation leaders were angry but not afraid, because they had fully understood the process of the mother's paper challenge. As long as they sent information through the brain chip to their people, even if the bizarre world arrived, they could easily cope with it. But things often don't go as expected. The bizarre world that descended was not the mother's paper, but a different random challenge. So amidst the curses of the US and island nation leaders, the bizarre world of rules descended, causing severe damage. But all of that had nothing to do with me. At this time, I was enjoying an unprecedented wonderful life. But joyful times are often short-lived. So after three days, it was time to enter the bizarre world of rules again. Like before, after bidding farewell to the Dragon Nation's people, I was brought into the bizarre world. Opening my eyes, I heard the system notification. This bizarre world is a long-distance train journey. The destination station is the bloody mausoleum. You need to play the role of train attendants. Before taking on the attendant role, please put on the proper work uniform. Remember which car you are in and read the attendant rules carefully. Your task is to ensure your train car arrives at the destination successfully. The train is expected to reach the destination station in about three days. After the notification, I quickly observed my surroundings and memorized that this was car number six, then hurriedly opened the door and stepped out. Because now I need to find the rules for attendance as soon as possible. The sooner I find the rules, the better. Only then can I freely act as I did in the mother's paper challenge. Soon after, I found the uniform and attendant rules in the connecting area between the cars. I quickly changed into the uniform. I had to say, after putting on the uniform, I really looked like a proper attendant. Then I opened and carefully read the rules. Strange passengers will appear on the train, but no matter what kind of passenger, serving them well is your duty. Rule 1. When passengers are rude to you, 
you must endure and be humble. Rule 2. If passengers use the restroom or smoke carelessly in the car, ignore them. Rule 3. Dropping things in the car is common. If passengers ask you to find their dropped items, you can refuse, but if it's a child, you have an obligation to help. Rule 4. When children run and jump around in the car, do not stop them. They have done nothing wrong, after all, they are still young. Rule 5. Food will be provided in the car, but you must not take food from the connecting area between cars. Rule 7. Each car has only one attendant, and boiled meat will not be sold in the car. There are a total of 17 rules, and the rest will be mentioned later. If I say them all now, the video will be too long, and you won't be able to remember them all. After carefully reading all the rules for attendance, I discovered that the last page of the rules was torn off. Clearly, the rules were not just those, and the last page of the attendant rules could be hidden somewhere in this train car. To fully understand all the rules, I had to find the last page before the passengers boarded the train. Then I began searching frantically, but no matter how thoroughly I searched the entire car, I couldn't find that last page. The two connections between car 6 and the other cars were currently completely sealed. Maybe the last page of the attendant rules was not in this car. Although I didn't find the remaining page, thanks to this thorough search, I understood the situation in the train car. While I couldn't find the missing page, this frantic search helped me fully grasp the condition of the train car. The sleeping environment in the car was quite comfortable, mostly with convenient beds, mattresses, and pillows. My sleeping area was at the end of the car, connected to another car. Since I couldn't find the remaining part of the rules, I dejectedly went to my sleeping area and plopped down. When I took out my doll, about to bend down and look under the bed, I was surprised to find the doll staring intently at the pillow, not taking its eyes off it. I was startled. Could there be something in the pillow? I pressed my hand on it, and indeed, there was a rustling sound of paper. Opening the pillow, sure enough, a sheet of paper resembling the attendant rules fell out onto the floor. This doll is really useful. As I patted the doll's head, I hurriedly picked it up and looked. It clearly stated the rules I hadn't read on the previous page. Rule 11. Respecting the elderly and loving children are good traditional virtues. If a passenger wants to exchange pillows with you, give them the most comfortable one. Rule 12. No matter what happens, you must not open the windows in the car. Rule 13. Pets are not allowed in the car. If you see a pet, leave its line of sight as soon as possible. Rule 14. If a passenger is injured or has a relapse in the car, try your best to provide medical treatment. The remaining three rules were too long, so they weren't written. Just as I finished reading the rules, I heard footsteps and conversations echoing in the previously quiet car. Looking out into the corridor, I saw that the once empty car was now filled with people. The sound of arguments, children crying, and laughter could be heard. The passengers had boarded the train. Amidst the chaos, the train also started moving. Suddenly, I saw a group of men gathering in the connecting area between cars, preparing to smoke. I approached them, and under the bewildered gaze of the two men, Without a word, I immediately extinguished the cigarettes in their hands. Right from the start, I had violated one of the rules. Although rule 2 states that I should ignore passengers smoking in the car. Who am I? Born a rebel, I have beaten up the entire world, leaving ugly bruised and swollen. Even as a newcomer, I won't follow these petty rules. But these two punks don't seem to realize my power yet. Showing their anger, they prepared to confront me. I immediately banged loudly on the no smoking sign. Can't you read the sign? You too can read, can't you? He didn't seem easy to provoke, but still grumbled discontentedly that he would go to the toilet to smoke and see what I could do about it. Hearing them show no respect in front of me, I was instantly enraged. How dare they provoke me like that? I turned around, grabbed one of them by the collar, and pinned him against the wall, sternly threatening him not to cause any trouble for me. In fact, these passengers are no longer human. They have all been devoured by monsters and are now merely a part of the bizarre force, so I don't need to treat them kindly. Since they are no longer human, I can deal with them as I please without showing any mercy. My continuous threats and intimidation made them very displeased, immediately transforming and fighting with me. But I wasn't afraid at all, taking out the doll hidden on me and shoving it right in their faces. It seemed that over the past few days, the doll had also been very agitated. Ugly's departure left it without an outlet for its power. With red, fierce eyes exuding a dark aura, it charged forward immediately. Luckily, I managed to hold the doll back, or else, these two punks would have been growing grass over their graves long ago. Seeing them scared to the point of trembling on the ground, the doll is actually a high-level monster. Their fear of the doll is instinctual. Seeing them so cowardly, I didn't pay them any more attention. But turning around, I saw an old lady leading a child defecating right in the corridor, which really put me on edge. I immediately shouted threats that if they went to the bathroom in the corridor, 
I would spank the child into eight pieces. As I was about to discipline the mischievous child, the old lady was also startled, her eyes flashing a strange look, then reluctantly carried her grandchild into the restroom. After being taught a lesson by me, the group of men and the old lady realized I was not an attendant to be trifled with. Immediately, the lively atmosphere in the car felt completely silent. The air also grew considerably colder. That was exactly what I wanted, to take the initiative instead of being bossed around by these passengers. Meanwhile, Ichiro, the new candidate from the Eastern National Archipelago, was patiently advising passengers not to smoke, but soon after, he was pushed to the ground by a few men, who roughly rubbed against him. During the scuffle, they even mocked him for being just a lousy attendant daring to interfere with their business. He must have never experienced the cruelty of society. After beating him up, they even spat a few mouthfuls of saliva onto his face. Ichiro had never witnessed such a horrific scene before and he curled up in the corner of the car, suffering immense pain and humiliation. While Ichiro began to doubt his life, the candidates from other countries were not treated well either. However, there was an exception. Nikolai, the candidate from Russia, demonstrated the talent he had acquired. His talent, called the leader, allowed his words to have absolute authority, forcing passengers to obey him. Seeing this, the curious crowd outside sat restlessly, speculating about what my talent might be. From the paper test given by my mother to this train now, they saw me continuously violating the rules. But they didn't know why I could disregard the accuracy of the rules, and even be immune from being devoured. However, my talent is a closely guarded secret. Apart from me, perhaps only a few leaders of the dragon country know about it vaguely. Meanwhile, in this bizarre world of rules, after inspecting the car, I didn't see any particular situation that truly terrified the passengers. They seemed to be obedient, with no more violations appearing. Exactly at 7 a.m., the sound of a door opening rang out. I looked up to see the door at the front of the connecting area between cars, which had been tightly locked, suddenly swing wide open, and a bizarre hand reached through from the other side. Then a cold voice called out from the mist, car number 06. Here is the attendant's breakfast. The hand set down the breakfast and withdrew. The door also closed again. Witnessing this scene, I was stunned because when the door opened, I stared intently at the space behind the hand but saw no train car at all, only mist obscuring everything. This made me doubt whether the car I was in, with its connections at both ends, was really a train or not. Whether other cars existed or not, or if it was truly as the rules stated, attendants must not leave their assigned car. Perplexed, I decided to eat breakfast first. Only with a full stomach would I have the strength to deal with unexpected situations. Although rule 5 clearly stated, do not eat food in the connecting area between cars, I immediately realized. This was essentially like rule 2 an incorrect rule. Moreover, since I needed to rebel against the rules, not only should I eat in the connecting area, but I was obligated to do so. But as I was eating heartily, an elderly figure suddenly appeared before me. I looked up to see an old man hugging a pillow, saying it was too firm to sleep on, and he wanted to exchange pillows with me. I listened with a serious expression, thinking to myself, definitely, and it's coming soon. I clearly remembered rule 11 in the employee handbook. Respecting the elderly and loving children are good traditional virtues. If a passenger wants to exchange pillows with you, please give them your most comfortable pillow. Although this rule seemed normal, it was placed on the very last page of the employee handbook. If I didn't know the secret hidden in the pillow, I might have exchanged it out of respect for the elderly. But now, I smiled and refused. But seeing that he was old, otherwise I would have slapped him a couple more times. My sudden change of attitude left the old man stunned, but he couldn't do anything except curse and leave. However, he didn't get far before immediately changing his expression. The pillow in his hands also began to turn black gradually. Meanwhile, the other candidates also faced a similar choice, but most of them refused to exchange pillows and realized there was something strange about the pillow. From there, they found the hidden last page inside. Nevertheless, there were still three people who chose to exchange pillows. Among them was the Champa Kingdom, which had just experienced an attack from the bizarre world. Next was the opening scene, where the Champa leaders urgently and angrily sent a message reminding their candidate to exchange the pillow back. Meanwhile, I had finished my breakfast and was about to rest when I was drawn by the shouting outside. What's going on? 
Looking out, an elderly woman was screaming loudly in the second class section. I approached closer and understood the situation somewhat. It turned out the woman had just finished cooking an instant noodle cup, went to the restroom for a bit, and when she returned, the noodles had disappeared. Meanwhile, those seated nearby all said they hadn't touched her noodles. Of course, she didn't believe them, leading to a fierce argument. According to the principle in the bizarre world, the fewer incidents, the better. Initially, I didn't intend to intervene and planned to sneak away. But suddenly I remembered something in the employee handbook. Rule 3. Losing items in the car is common. If a passenger asks for help finding a lost item, you can refuse, but if it's a child, you have an obligation to assist. However, I was born to rebel. The problem was, if I didn't rebel, my talent would also lose its effect, so I was obligated to do the opposite of the rules. Either way, I had to help the woman find her instant noodles. At the very least, I needed to provide an explanation. Then I patted her shoulder and said with a smile, don't worry, ma'am, I'm here to help. Seeing my eagerness, she seemed intimidated and quickly refused, saying it was just a pack of noodles, no need to trouble me. But I absolutely couldn't agree. Wasn't this my life's mission? I immediately flashed a warm smile and said not to worry. An attendant's duty is to protect the safety and property of all passengers. The noodles may be small, but it's still my responsibility. Just leave this to me. My sincere words made the woman and other passengers grateful. Everyone was touched by my diligent and serious attitude. But at that moment, an old lady came running and grabbed my arm, saying, Attendant, my grandchild has gone missing. Please help me find them. The old lady was very worried. Everyone looked at me, thinking I would happily assist, but I only said one thing that left them all stunned, get lost. They couldn't believe those words came from me. Just a moment ago, I was wholeheartedly dedicated to finding a pack of noodles, yet now my attitude had changed so drastically. The woman next to me was also surprised and advised me, the noodles are a small matter, why don't you help find the child first? Her words made sense, and everyone nodded in agreement, but I remained unmoved. She said, I understand, but there's an order to things. Finding a child is a big deal, finding noodles is a small matter. Never mind, I'll go find the noodles for you right away. If we don't, the noodles will get cold and won't taste good. My serious statement left all the surrounding passengers bewildered. Although they felt something was off, they couldn't refute it. The old lady, seeing my determination not to help and my eloquent words, glared at me angrily and went to search for her grandchild throughout the car. I didn't care and, bidding the woman farewell, started searching for the noodles myself. But after more than 10 minutes of searching the entire car, I still couldn't find the sour cabbage flavored noodles. With no other choice, there was only one place left to check, the restroom. Running into the restroom to search for noodles is certainly an idea no one would think of. But I intentionally didn't follow the beaten path. I didn't believe the noodles could have just vanished into thin air. So I rushed into the restroom to search, and to my surprise, the noodles were there, lying on the floor. Then I quickly went to the restroom door and flung it open. The sight before me left me stunned. A child was standing in front of the toilet, eating noodles with tomato sauce. Their face was covered in tomato sauce, and upon seeing me, they smiled broadly and invited me to join them. I hurriedly covered my mouth, nearly vomiting the breakfast I had just eaten. As I turned to leave, I noticed a teddy bear appearing behind the child, its eyes glowing bright red. I clearly remembered rule 13 in the employee handbook. No pets are allowed on the train. If you see a pet, leave its line of sight as quickly as possible. Clearly, this teddy bear-like creature was the pet mentioned in the handbook. However, running away as the handbook instructed didn't seem possible. In the end, only by rebelling could I be protected by my talent. So if I couldn't run away, the only option was to stay and face it head on. Then I took out a doll from my coat, preparing to fight this teddy bear creature. But at that moment, the old lady searching for her grandchild suddenly burst in. Seeing the scene before her, without a word, she slapped the sauce-covered child repeatedly. Didn't I tell you not to eat carelessly? And now you've come in here to play with poop. The old lady scolded while looking nauseous, clearly bothered by the foul smell. Although her words were harsh, her actions weren't very forceful. Otherwise, the child wouldn't have been able to stick their tongue out at me so casually. When I looked back into the restroom, the teddy bear creature had vanished, gone without a trace. I wasn't sure what had just happened, but I was certain the teddy bear creature would reappear. Therefore, I decided to take it one step at a time. First, I needed to resolve the issue with the noodle cup. After washing my hands, I quickly returned to the second class area and recounted the entire incident to the woman. At this point, she was eating a freshly prepared cup of noodles. Perhaps due to my overly detailed description, 
She listened with wide eyes, then covered her mouth and rushed into the restroom, about to vomit. My good deed was also unanimously acknowledged by the crowd outside. Although I didn't understand their words of praise, I still felt proud, thinking, indeed, I've done a good deed again. Meanwhile, the other candidates also encountered situations involving finding noodles and lost children one by one. But unlike me, most of them chose to find the child first. And when they saw the teddy bear, the majority immediately chose to run away. However, a few candidates, having not found the last page of the handbook about pets, failed to recognize the teddy bear as an extreme danger. By the time they noticed something was amiss, it was too late. The teddy bear opened its mouth wide, its dangling tentacles shooting out and swallowing them whole instantly. The system announcement also sounded, five candidates from Lithuania, Norway, Myanmar, and Vietnam have been swallowed. The bizarre world is about to arrive. The countdown begins. At this point, the leaders of the five small countries that were eliminated slumped to the ground. These small countries were all eliminated in the mother's no challenge. Before they could even rest for a few days, the bizarre world had arrived again. The successive shocks left them unable to endure any further. If this continued, they would have to declare national extinction. The small countries had no other choice but to seek help from Dragon Country agreeing to exchange 50 million tons of food for chip technology. Normally, the small countries were aggressive, taking advantage of US support to blockade Dragon Country. However, Dragon Country had faced the bizarre world five times in a row, severely depleting its strength and leaving it short of food supplies. Therefore, Dragon Country agreed to the exchange but said the chips would be delivered a week late. Meanwhile, in the bizarre world, I was sleeping soundly without a care. But soon after, the noisy commotion in the car woke me up. It seemed I had another task to handle. Although the handbook stated, when children run and jump around in the car, do not stop them. They are not at fault, they are still young. But everyone knows disturbing someone's sleep is equivalent to seeking illegitimate gain. Moreover, all the passengers in the car were monsters, so I didn't need to be polite with them. Holding my doll, I quickly approached the child. Don't shout and make noise in the car, or I'll spank you into eight pieces if you keep being noisy. Initially, I intended to discipline them gently, but unexpectedly, the child didn't react at all. The woman next to them got angry first. With her hands on her hips and a contemptuous tone, she said, Hey, how can an adult like you be so stubborn towards children? Children love to play, what does that have to do with you? Before my anger could subside, I stepped closer and slapped her twice. After being slapped, she was completely dazed, with an expression of disbelief on her face. She charged towards me, intending to strike back, but I didn't give her a chance. A kick sent her tumbling to the ground. After disciplining her, I looked towards the child. With my temperament, the child's buttocks would surely receive a beating. Suddenly, the old lady's face turned pale, her eyes reddened and fierce, completely transforming, but I wasn't afraid at all. I smiled, took out my doll, and said to her, is this the power of a monster? I'm sorry, but I have one too. Then I threw the doll towards the old lady and instructed the doll to only discipline her, not kill her. At this point, my live footage was cut to black again, and the curious crowd outside became restless. What's going on? Why is the signal blocked every time a monster takes action? The monster's tricks won't be easy for us to see. If humans could fully understand these monsters, perhaps the bizarre world wouldn't have appeared. Meanwhile, Ichiro from the eastern island country also encountered a similar situation, but he didn't seem to discipline the child. Instead, he was taught a lesson by the child. The old lady just looked at him, and he was so scared that he collapsed to the ground, motionless. If the eastern island country wasn't currently occupied by the bizarre world and too busy to pay attention to him, the leaders would probably have been furious enough to spit blood. As the people of Dragon Country were cursing Ichiro, my footage was finally restored. By this time, the battle between the doll and the old lady had ended. The result was obvious. The old lady was beaten to a pulp, her face swollen, completely losing the ferocious look from earlier. The child was also terrified, trembling as they apologized to me, promising never to repeat the offense. Seeing their sincere remorse, I didn't intend to make it difficult for them, but I still had to slap them twice in the face to ensure they remembered the lesson well. After that, amidst the child's loud cries, I cheerfully returned, intending to go back to my resting place, but halfway there, I encountered a saleswoman. She said that internal staff were entitled to free drinks and snacks. However, Rule 16 clearly stated, outside of mealtimes, there may be people selling food in the cars. 
If anyone offers you free items, refuse, as they may attract monster attacks at night. Seeing this, I didn't hesitate and immediately took a few snack packs and snacks. But after I took the items, the saleswoman's warm smile suddenly disappeared, and she silently left through the connecting passage between the cars at the back. I was quite puzzled. So the connecting passage between the cars was open, but I didn't know if others could leave like that. As for these snacks, I had no intention of eating them, so I immediately threw them aside because aside from the daily scheduled food rations, I shouldn't eat anything else. The reason I accepted the saleswoman's kind offer was solely to violate the rules and continuously receive protection from my talent. If it weren't for rule 16, I definitely wouldn't have paid attention to the saleswoman. In the end, in this bizarre world of rules, the fewer things to deal with, the better. But accepting doesn't necessarily mean having to eat. Although protected by my talent, I still need to be cautious. Meanwhile, the other candidates also faced similar choices. Quite a few chose to accept the items, but they weren't foolish enough to not realize this was the bizarre world. Although the food appeared normal, with no issues, it was definitely related to the rules. Moreover, the current food supply wasn't lacking, so they decided to keep the items and consume them gradually. The first day was about to end. At this point, most people began to summarize the information they had gathered throughout the day. From what they had so far, they could confirm that rules 1, 3, 13, and 16 were correct, while rules 2, 4, 5, and 11 were incorrect. As for some other rules, their accuracy remained undetermined. At 8 p.m., the other candidates all followed rule 8, turning off the lights in their cars as per rule 8. But my car was brightly lit as if it were daytime, clearly indicating I had no intention of turning off the lights, especially since passengers were still actively playing at this hour. So I waited until 10 p.m., when the lights in the car automatically turned off, but I still couldn't sleep. Tossing and turning, because I kept thinking about that teddy bear. It gave me the feeling of being similar to a doll or perhaps it was also a conscious monster. And what were the rules governing its appearance? By midnight, my mind was in a mess, so I decided to give up. I placed the doll beside my bed, intending to rest first. But shortly after, in the pitch black car, a strange chewing sound suddenly rang out, startling me awake. Opening my eyes, I saw the doll had levitated, emitting a red glow, standing in front of my bed. Its eyes were fixed on a corner of the car, unmoving. But without any lights, I couldn't see what was in that corner. However, the chewing sound sent shivers down my spine. What the hell was that? I let out a sound. The chewing in the darkness immediately stopped. Interrupted during its meal, the monster seemed displeased and charged straight towards me. Fortunately, the doll was standing in front of my bed. And with a slap, it sent the monster flying. Otherwise, I would have been done for. Then, the sound of a fierce struggle ensued. The struggle continued for over 10 minutes before abruptly stopping. I rushed over to see only the doll standing alone in the corner of the car. It seemed the battle had ultimately ended with the dark figure's departure. But looking at the doll's dejected stance, the battle didn't seem to have been an easy victory. Perhaps they were evenly matched. Meanwhile, a few other candidates also encountered the dark figure one by one, but without a protective doll. They were instantly devoured by the bizarre dark figure. Only now did the crowd clearly see that the dark figure was the same creature resembling a teddy bear that had appeared before. Along with the elimination of some candidates, the system announcement sounded again. Three candidates from Japan, Laos, and Cambodia were devoured. The bizarre world is about to descend. The countdown begins. Seeing three more countries eliminated, the crowd outside was buzzing with discussion. The Japanese leadership must have fainted in the bathroom by now. The bizarre attack on their country hasn't ended yet. I seem to understand why they were attacked. Those who were attacked had all accepted food from the saleswoman during the day. According to my reasoning, what they had in their hands was the key to their demise. Perhaps the teddy bear-like monster was attracted by the food they had. They discussed it all night. To be fair, the crowd had some intelligent people who analyzed the situation almost accurately, but I couldn't know those analyses. At this point, I was kneeling on the ground, carefully examining the crime scene from last night, afraid of missing any details. All I saw, apart from my rule book and the partially eaten food, was that nothing else was damaged. Maybe last night the monster only came to steal my food. I had somewhat figured it out. I planned to wait for the saleswoman today to ask for more food. Meanwhile, on the Korean side, candidate Park Woojin was frantically searching for something. It was his rule book that had gone missing. He searched everywhere but couldn't find it and was about to cry from worry. Because according to the hint in Rule 10, 
passengers must never see the rule book. If a passenger accidentally sees it, immediately incapacitate that passenger. That also meant if rule 10 was correct, then losing the rule book was equivalent to revealing all weaknesses to the passengers. If they used the rules in it against him, he would be powerless, certain to fail. But he didn't know that on the other side of the car, a passenger was flipping through the rule book with a terrifying smile. 12 p.m., lunchtime arrived, and the door opened on time as usual. But unlike other times, this time, in addition to the tray, there was also an employee following behind. Although I didn't know him, the crowd outside did. It was the Japanese candidate who had just been devoured. Seeing him carrying a steaming hot bowl of stew, approaching, he said this was a specialty dish from their car, very delicious, and brought it for me to try. But according to the hint in rule 6, in the rule book, sometimes employees from other cars will visit. If they offer you stew, accept it. However, rule 10 states that each car has only one employee and no stew is sold in the car. These two clearly contradict each other, so one must be wrong. I realized this employee was definitely not a good person, but I didn't refuse immediately and accepted the bowl of stew. Placing it aside, saying I'd like to save the delicacy for last. I'll finish my meal first before eating the stew. Seeing I had no intention of eating the stew, he urged, Brother, the stew is just cooked, it'll get cold and won't taste good. You try it first. Seeing his eagerness, I became even more certain this was a trap, so I dared not eat it. But I didn't refuse outright, just kept stalling and dragging it out. Seeing me evading him, his expression gradually darkened, seeming to realize I was mocking him. He then pretended to leave. After a few steps, his expression suddenly changed, his head spinning 180 degrees, yelling, why don't you eat? Why not eat? Then I saw his eyes suddenly bulge white, black smoke spewing from his mouth, surrounding me. But I wasn't scared at all. No more pretense? If you've shown your hand, I'll show mine too. Then I silently took out the doll from my body, and my live footage was also cut to black. Outside in the real world, people were used to me being cut off, seeing that I recognized the villain from the start. The Long Kingdom leadership also breathed a sigh of relief, very satisfied with my reaction. They intended to use a valuable hint to remind me, but now saw it was unnecessary. And as they were relieved, waiting for my footage to be restored, the system's chilling announcement rang out again. Five candidates from five countries were devoured. The bizarre world is about to descend. The countdown begins. Hearing the announcement, everyone panicked. The Bali Kingdom is also a powerhouse country. How could they be eliminated so quickly? It turned out the monster had tricked the Bali Kingdom candidate, saying if he accepted and ate the stew, he would receive an additional hint and be guaranteed to survive and leave the car. The Bali Kingdom candidate also realized this could be a trap, but his gambling spirit rose up, and in the end, he decided to take the risk. The result is obvious. And at this moment, my footage was also restored to normal. The crisis resolved thanks to the doll. Seeing the doll smiling at me, it seems the opponent was just a small worm, not requiring much effort. Seeing this, the doll's fans showered endless praise. I love the doll. I'm crazy about the doll. I could slam into a wall for the doll. The disappearing employee scene also helped me understand the bizarre world better. The existence of monsters here is not limited. It could be a doll, a gremlin, or even black smoke. If I find the origin of the monsters, it may thoroughly resolve the risk of them appearing. At dinner time, the saleswoman appeared on time in my car again. But this time, before she could speak, I proactively approached and took some snacks. In her surprised gaze, I silently waited for the monster's appearance. While waiting for the monster to appear, a passenger came running, telling me, a passenger in the car suddenly became irritable, about to assault others. Quick, go help. Hearing this, I immediately realized it was another trap, because currently there are two contradictory rules before me. Rule 14 requires, if someone is injured or has a relapse in the car, try to provide treatment, while Rule 10 states, from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. is a dangerous time. If someone looks for you during this time frame, ignore them. If I want to continue being protected by my gift, I must violate all the rules. In the current situation, if I defy one of these two rules, it will certainly mean following the remaining rule. I feel these two rules seem intentionally designed to limit my gift, but I couldn't do anything, only try to think of a way to deal with it. Suddenly, I had a clever idea to resolve both. I verbally agreed to go help, but my body remained still, unmoving. This way, I had agreed, but not really agreed. My gift remained in effect. My ambiguous action left the passenger completely confused. He thought I had agreed, so why wasn't I going, just sitting there like a motionless statue? 
Then he kept urging me to go. Meanwhile, I continued dragging it out, my body unmoving, saying my legs were numb. Don't help me up or I might become paralyzed. The guy couldn't take it anymore, realizing I was just mocking him, and wouldn't help at all. He angrily left. Only then did I sneer and slowly stand up. Want to harm me? No chance. Meanwhile, the candidates from other countries also faced similar choices. At this time, Park Woojin of South Korea had a huge headache facing the contradictory rules 14 and 17. He didn't know what to do, but the passengers didn't care about him. Seeing him still hesitating, they urged him more urgently. Faced with their insistence, Park Woojin also lost patience, angrily saying he wouldn't go help. The urging voices suddenly stopped. Looking up, he saw the passenger's face had become bizarre and frightening, laughing loudly. I was just waiting for you to say that. You violated the rule now. Stay with me forever. Saying that, he lunged at Park Woojin, swallowing him whole immediately. This passenger was the one who had picked up his rule book. No one expected Park Woojin to be tricked by a passenger. Next, the system announced, Korean candidate Park Woojin has been devoured. The bizarre world is about to descend. The countdown begins, turning back to me after the passenger left. Seeing the monster hadn't appeared, I lay down to rest, but soon heard the familiar munching sound. I smiled and woke up, deciding this time to confirm if it was the teddy bear pup. I shone my flashlight over, and sure enough, it was the teddy bear pup happily eating french fries. But this time it didn't hurry to attack me, perhaps knowing the doll was by my side, so I didn't want to waste energy. I confidently approached to observe this little pup closely, to see what it was, but as soon as I got near, the system announced, congratulations, candidate, you have received initial recognition from the black general, continue to please the great general to increase the black great general's loyalty, when the loyalty reaches a certain level, you will have the opportunity to receive support from the black great general, but after receiving the assistance, you cannot take the black general out of the carriage or beyond the train's range, hearing this, I was quite surprised, this little teddy bear pup has such an imposing name, seems like a good assistant, this train journey will definitely be successful, but the snack saleswoman has been gone for a while, so I'll have to use some special measures, I immediately walked down the aisle, shouting loudly, wake up, within 3 minutes, give me all your snacks, or don't blame me for being impolite, my shout startled all the passengers in the middle of the night, but they quickly regained their senses, hearing I wouldn't be polite, knowing they couldn't provoke me, they brought their snacks over, jostling each other, soon, a large pile of snacks had accumulated, seeing everyone cooperating, I was delighted and called the black general, whose eyes shone brightly, allowing it to savor the snacks slowly, the black general wasn't polite either, after a whirlwind of tearing and devouring, the food disappeared cleanly. At this point, the system announced again, congratulations, the candidate has received recognition from the black general. The black general considers you trustworthy and has decided to temporarily support you. Success. I was overjoyed to hear the announcement, thinking I'd have to feed it a few more times, but unexpectedly, one time was enough. I patted the black general's head, extremely delighted. How incredibly lucky. Outside in the real world, the live audience was in an uproar. Damn, isn't Tuo Shu now invincible? Just by feeding it, he can tame monsters. All the luck comes to him. With the black general protecting him, he slept very soundly, but early on the third morning, I was woken up by the black general running around. Waking up, I saw it circling the carriage. I was completely confused, not knowing what it wanted to express. Seeing me awake, the black general ran quickly towards the connecting door between carriages, barking loudly. I realized it wanted to warn me about something. Looking up, I was startled, drenched in cold sweat. I was clearly in carriage 6, but now it was carriage 8. Right from the start when entering, the system emphasized staff must remember their carriage number. Unexpectedly, that would be useful here. Indeed, no line in the rules is meaningless. Immediately after, the system announced, candidates may have noticed your carriage numbers have changed. Now, you have two choices. 1. Stay where you are. 2. Go through the mist at the connecting doors to return to your original carriage. I had a serious expression, hesitating. At this point, not only did I have to judge the correctness of the rules, but also assess the accuracy of the system's suggestion. My talent wasn't very effective in making this assessment, but Nikolai from Russia used his leadership talent and communication skills to gather information from passengers, so he didn't hesitate to rush into the mist to return to his original carriage. Facing the system's suggestion about the carriage numbers, I still chose the second option because right from the start, the rules emphasized that staff must remember their carriage number. Surely the rules weren't written so pointlessly. Moreover, the snack saleswoman with her cart also left through the connecting doors between carriages. 
so I believed those misty areas were just meant to scare people. The second choice was the right one. After thinking it through, I didn't hesitate anymore and headed towards the mist. Meanwhile, the other candidates also made their choices. The British candidate Keeves was always anxious, but suddenly revealed his talent for pathfinding. And this talent was quite simple. When facing difficult situations, it would point out the right path for the candidate. So he also didn't hesitate to choose returning to his original carriage. Besides him, Pasha from Paris was also guided by his leadership circle. At the decisive moment, it made him follow my choice. So among all the candidates, only I, Nikolai from Russia, Kiev's from England, and Pasha from Paris, four of us chose the second option. The rest, candidates from other countries all stayed put, some out of timidity, not daring to pass through the mist, others because their leadership circles were busy dealing with the encroaching bizarre world and couldn't provide guidance, leading them to make the wrong decision. Not long after, the system announced, the choice time has ended. All those who chose to pass through the mist survived. All those who stayed were eliminated. Immediately, those who stayed were engulfed in darkness. A cold announcement sounding, six candidates were devoured. The bizarre world is about to arrive. The countdown begins. At this point, I had successfully returned to my carriage 06. Although I made the right choice this time, I knew the challenge wasn't over yet because there was still one final rule before me. Rule 15. The connections between carriages will open each time food is served. When opened, passengers from other carriages may take the opportunity to sneak through. If you discover passengers not belonging to this carriage, you must definitely expel them. Looking at the meal boxes, the food cart must have already passed through. That meant during the time I was gone, a monster had infiltrated this carriage. But there were over 40 passengers in the carriage. If it disguised itself as one of them, how could I distinguish it? As I was thinking, outside the Dragon Nation's conference room, they were also discussing fervently. They quickly came up with the idea of asking each passenger in the cabin to verify each other. Then send the suggestion to me. But when they finished drafting it and were about to send it, the system reported that suggestions couldn't be sent at this stage. The candidate had to complete it alone. Wasn't this just avoiding responsibility? Or was the bizarre world already starting to target me? But at this point, I was completely unaware. Only looking back at the black general, its eyes shining brightly. As a high-level monster, detecting a small intruder wouldn't be difficult for the black general. I let it roam free. I saw the black general, after circling around once, suddenly charge at and growl towards one passenger. That passenger was completely helpless, chased by the black general, tumbling and running towards the connecting passage. When the passenger left the carriage, the system announced, Thank you, candidate, for your contribution to carriage 06. You have disciplined the rude parent, helping the stubborn child reform their character in this carriage. Received assistance from the black general. Congratulations on successfully completing the distant journey train challenge. Assessment completed. New reward. The black general's monster resistance increased by 1. Current monster resistance 2%. Introduction to the black general. It is always here, protecting you. It awaits its master to take it along. Very loyal but also a big eater. If one day you wake up and don't see the black general by your side, don't panic. It's just hungry. I looked at the black general, overjoyed. The completion reward was it again. That meant in the next challenge, I would have the black general and the doll, two bodyguards right from the start. Meanwhile, Nikolai from Russia and Kievs from England also used their talents to gather passenger information and complete the challenge. But Pasha from Paris was eventually eliminated. Fortunately, Paris had received chip technology from the Dragon Nation. Otherwise the invasion of the bizarre world would certainly have been a great disaster. At this point, I had returned to the outside world. Since the appearance of the bizarre world, I was the only one who had completed it twice. My value had increased nearly many times over. As soon as I returned, I was strictly escorted and protected by the Dragon Nation. Over the past few days, I recorded all the information about the monsters and sent it to the state as classified material. Exactly three days later, I was transmitted to a new challenge. I observed my surroundings. This is a zoo, isn't it? Then I saw an employee in a green uniform approach and hand me something like a map, saying this was a map of the zoo's trail distribution. Remember to carry it so you don't get lost. I took the map, seeing that the zoo was very large with accurately marked locations of various animals, divided into nine areas. The back had the rules to be followed in this bizarre world. Rule 1. Please tour the zoo in a civilized manner. Do not feed the animals. Rule 2. If you see pink rabbits and blue elephants, don't feel strange. When the animals look at you, make sure your face is turned directly towards them, otherwise they will attack immediately. Rule 3. If you see staff chasing animals, go ahead and help them. They will be grateful to you. Rule 4. 
the markings on the map are wrong, don't trust the map. Rule 5, if you accidentally get lost in the zoo, stay calm, you can rest on the benches, but if it's night time, be careful of animals that may appear at any time. Rule 6, if you're hungry, you can get free food from the vending machines. As advice to avoid vomiting, choose goat meat if available. Rule 7, if needed, you can ask for help from the staff in the zoo. The staff in navy blue and red will be very willing to help you, but if they're in black, run away immediately. Rule 8, the aquarium is a safe area. Rule 9, there is no aquarium in the zoo. Rule 10, always remind yourself in your head, I am human, not an animal. After reading carefully, I found the rules this time were even more bizarre. The last one even sent chills down my spine. The entrance had also disappeared, and many tourists like me appeared. But I was certain they weren't candidates. If not candidates, they must be monsters. I immediately summoned the black general. With it protecting me, I wasn't worried anymore. I decided to go see the rabbit area first. As soon as I reached the gate, I saw the green uniform staff handing out carrots to tourists. Of course, the carrots were for the rabbits to eat. But rule 1 clearly prohibited feeding the animals. This seemed to be the first judgment challenge the candidates had to face. But for me, this was the easiest part. I just needed to do the opposite. I took the carrots and casually fed them to the rabbits. But the rabbits in the zoo, though wanting to eat, didn't dare approach. Because the black general was always by my side, growling threateningly at them. I also didn't see any pink rabbits. Was ruled too wrong? Without hesitation, I called the black general to visit the other areas. Meanwhile, Samit from India was happily feeding the rabbits a few carrot sticks. But he, being in the bizarre world for the first time, completely failed to notice the approaching danger. Because at this moment, a rabbit was staring intently at him, its eyes glowing red. The rabbit kept staring at Samit. And as soon as he turned his back to leave, it leapt up and bit hard into his neck. Samit panicked struggling to break free, but the rabbit held on tightly. He could only cry out for help. It wasn't until the green uniform staff came running and lifted the rabbit off Samit's neck that he was freed. Only then did Samit angrily, covering his neck, scold the staff. What is this? How could the rabbit attack a person? What are you staff being paid for? Can't you manage properly? The staff could only bow and apologize, saying it was due to negligent management, and they would handle it immediately. Samit kept arguing non-stop while covering his wound, but he didn't realize his eyes were gradually turning red, his pupils also changing to the same color as the rabbits earlier. Seeing this, the crowd outside, recalling the final rule for visitors, guessed that it wouldn't be long before he turned into a rabbit. Meanwhile, I had reached the southern part of the zoo according to the map's directions, but the map clearly indicated there should be zebras, tigers and goats here, but I could only find the zebra and tiger areas, but couldn't find the goat area anywhere. Rule 4 was right, the map was wrong. To verify my own thoughts, I decided to go to the elephant area to see. But as soon as I reached the elephant area, I was shocked by the sight. The herd of elephants had glowing red eyes, ears standing upright. Those were not elephants, but clearly giant rabbits. Yet the surrounding tourists didn't seem surprised at all, as if they were already used to it. While observing the bizarre elephant herd, pondering, suddenly a normal elephant charged out from somewhere. But as soon as it appeared, it was ganged up on and attacked by the giant rabbit elephants. The outcome was predictable. One against more than ten, completely disadvantaged. The normal elephant was gradually assimilated, its eyes slowly turning red. Seeing this, I felt something was amiss. But before I could figure it out, an even stranger incident occurred. The rabbit elephant herd suddenly transformed into goats, rampaging towards the fence, as if wanting to ram the tourists. Only then did the tourists finally snap out of it, scattering in panic. But not long after, a group of green uniform staff came running, shouting loudly, Everyone, don't panic. The elephants are just temporarily agitated. Please follow us to the lion area. It's temporarily safe there. I thought in such a noisy environment, the staff's words would be ineffective. But to my surprise, after hearing them, the tourists fell silent, as if everything was just a performance. Why did they obey so easily? No doubts at all? Moreover, why would the rampaging elephants go to the lion area? Rule 8 didn't say the aquarium was safe? Seeing the strange scene before my eyes, I was also confused. But in the end, I still decided to follow and see what would happen. Meanwhile, the bizarre zoo also caused a lively discussion among the crowd outside. What's happening to this zoo? Elephants looking like rabbits turning into goats? Is this a dream? Why are they going to the lion area? 
Although in green uniforms, these staff don't seem like good people. While everyone was arguing, suddenly the system announced, Candidate Babru from Papua New Guinea has been swallowed whole. The bizarre world is about to descend. Countdown begins. It turned out Babru also encountered the rampaging elephant herd, but he couldn't escape in time and was trampled to death. The outcome was predictable. Meanwhile, the surviving candidates after the elephant rampage, like me, were led into the lion area, which was said to be safe. Among them was Nikolai from Russia. Although burly, he was very cautious. As soon as he entered the lion area, Nikolai immediately asked loudly why the staff had locked the gate. But before he could hear the answer, the roar of a lion rang out. Nikolai turned around, seeing the lion had started mauling the tourists. Only then did he realize these staff weren't protecting them, but intended to turn them into prey for the lions. Nikolai immediately climbed over the fence and escaped. That tall iron fence couldn't stop him. Great physical strength indeed. As for me, I also faced a similar situation. Two lions with glowing red eyes were eyeing me, but I wasn't afraid at all, because I was always holding the black general. When the two lions charged at me, the black general immediately took action. Or should I say opened its mouth? I only saw it spit out a few long tentacle-like strands that tightly wrapped around the two lions, then swallowed them whole. Seeing that, I was heavily shocked. To be able to swallow such large lions, it must definitely be an alien monster. The black general was licking its lips, seeming still unsatisfied. Unlike the previous times, this time the monster's attack didn't cause my live footage to be cut to black. The leaders of Dragon Country judged that it was because last time I brought back too much information, causing the monster to realize there was no need to hide anymore, so it just went public. They placed great expectations on me, hoping I could continue on this path to lead Dragon Country out of the monster's invasion. Facing the monster's public attack, most countries were delighted, because this way, they could collect more information about the monster to prepare for the bizarre world's invasion later on. But there were also displeased countries. The US, for example. The US leadership was furiously jumping up and down, cursing how lucky I was to get help from two monsters. They also blamed John for being unworthy despite having an S-rank talent but still letting me surpass him. They said this time they would definitely focus on supporting their candidate, Thomas, to overcome the challenge. Returning to the bizarre world, I was hugging the black general and praising it. But when I turned my head, I saw a tourist climbing over the fence and escaping. I realized this person must be extraordinary, able to escape on his own. It's very likely he has valuable clues on him. So I asked the black general if there was a way for us to get out. Without hesitation, it spat out two thick iron doors that were immediately blown away. Truly a monstrous beast. But I didn't have time to be amazed, hurriedly chasing after that tourist. Not long after, I saw him trembling on a stone bench in the zoo. He seemed extremely desperate. I don't know what he had been through. Half an hour later, he took out a pen from his clothes, bent down and wrote something on the stone bench. Around 15 minutes later, he stood up and left in a hurry. But the piece of paper was still there, not taken with him. This unusual behavior made me extremely curious. I immediately picked up the paper and read it. I know I cannot survive and leave this zoo. It appeared as if by magic, luring us in here. Coming to this zoo was the biggest mistake of my life. I lost my best friend, cannot find him anymore. I am lost. This zoo is so bizarre. Everything is distorted monsters. I witnessed with my own eyes the zookeeper turning into an elephant. He bravely charged into those monsters, wanting to protect us. But unfortunately, he failed. Assimilated by the monster. Reading up to here, I felt very complicated, because I had just witnessed that exact scene. So the elephant that suddenly charged out and was surrounded was the transformed zookeeper. I continued reading, we have all been infected. I'm so scared and desperate. I've been in this zoo for over three days now. I don't know what my fate will be. If you can read this piece of paper, I hope you follow the rules. Remember to find the aquarium as soon as possible. Perhaps it truly exists. After reading, I couldn't stay calm. The content also confirmed my thoughts. All the tourists in the zoo have been captured, and have been contaminated. And through the paper, I also confirmed one thing. The aquarium mentioned in Rule 8 could really be a safe zone, even an exit. That means Rule 9 is probably wrong. But the aquarium, even the staff don't know where it is. As I was thinking, the countries outside also realized the importance of the paper. The leaders of Russia and England used the only hint opportunity to notify their candidates to immediately find the paper on the stone bench. Meanwhile, Indian officials were regretting, beating their chests. Because after being bitten by the rabbit, Samit's mind had issues. Now even if they sent him a hint, he might not see it. At the same time in the bizarre world, an announcement rang out over the zoo, 
It is now 4.35 p.m. Tourists who need food and drinks can go to the designated shop to buy delicious meat. Please note that the zoo closes at 6 p.m. If there are still tourists in the zoo by then, we cannot guarantee their safety. Hearing the announcement, I was surprised. It's already 4.30 p.m., so to avoid hunger, I need to find where that special shop is. While searching, I accidentally discovered the goat area in the east of the zoo. But there were no goats in the zoo. And according to the map, the goat area shouldn't be here either. Fortunately, the shop was nearby, so I didn't think too much about it, and quickly entered. The staff in green uniforms saw me and enthusiastically greeted, Welcome, tourist. Every day, we provide each tourist with three free portions of goat meat and drinks. Please help yourself. Following the staff's guidance, I easily found the goat meat on the shelves. But I remembered in the rules for tourists, there was one that said, if you're hungry, you can take free food from the vending machines. The advice was, to avoid vomiting, choose goat meat if available. So should I take the goat meat here or not? Although according to the hint in rule 6, I shouldn't eat goat meat. Only by defying the rules can I be protected by my talent. But I really want to eat meat, and there's no other meat here. So I came up with an idea. As long as I don't take the free food from the vending machines, then I'm not completely following rule 6. Theoretically, it's not completely violating the principle of defiance. Thinking that, I couldn't help but praise myself for being smart. I then took three portions of goat meat, planning to eat my fill. But when I was about to take a drink, I discovered that the cabinet only had bottled rabbit blood. I felt it was very strange, so I took a bottle and turned to ask the staff. Unexpectedly, the staff panicked when I asked so casually, and hurriedly cleared all the rabbit blood off the shelves. Seeing the strange behavior of the staff, I felt something was off, so I immediately left the shop. Meanwhile, the other candidates also found the shop. But unlike me, they chose to follow rule 6. Not entering the shop but taking food from the vending machines. Although the vending machines also had rabbit blood. Most people chose to ignore it. Only Samit from India, who had been bitten by a rabbit before, fell into a frenzied state when he saw it. He actually picked up and drank the entire bottle of rabbit blood. The outcome was predictable. The cold system announced, candidate Samit from India has been devoured. A bizarre world is about to invade. The countdown begins. Back to me, at this time I was contemplating all the clues I had gathered throughout the day. Based on the tourists' paper and the rules, I guessed that the zoo would gradually weaken human willpower. The longer you stay in the zoo, the more easily your mind becomes disturbed, leading to assimilation by the bizarre animals. And that time could be three days. But today I've gone all around the zoo, yet still haven't found the exit. I also didn't see any signs of the aquarium or the paper mentioned. I realized the level of bizarreness in the zoo is gradually increasing. It has far exceeded the challenges of my mother's paper and the distant train. After half a day with no ideas, I decided to find a place to rest. But I didn't follow rule 5, choosing the long benches in the zoo. Instead, I went back to the shop, took some cardboard boxes and laid them out to lie on. I placed the doll beside me and prepared to sleep. But right then, the sound of footsteps startled me awake. I peeked out to see, and it turned out to be a staff member in black taking something off the shelf. This was the first time I encountered a black clothed staff today. According to rule 7, I should leave immediately upon seeing a black clothed staff. But according to my talent, I had to do the opposite. Seeing him take some goat meat and leave quickly, I immediately followed him. But as soon as I left the shop, not too far away, I saw that person suddenly turn into a small alley. I was stunned, because during the day there definitely wasn't a path like this. But now I didn't think too much about it. I regained my composure and continued the chase. But when I turned into the alley, I found it was a dead end. That person had disappeared, leaving only a piece of paper. To guard against surprise night attacks, I quickly returned to the shop with the piece of paper. But just as I was about to read its contents, the system announcement rang out. Candidates from six countries have been devoured. The bizarre world is about to invade. The countdown begins. It turned out rule 5 was correct. Those candidates, having chosen to rest on the stone benches but not being vigilant of their surroundings, were attacked by monsters. Apart from me, there was one person who chose to sleep in the shop, Thomas from America, because the American leader had used the valuable hint opportunity to inform Thomas. Therefore, he also received this important piece of paper from the shop staff. Back to me, I opened the paper, on which was written, I got lost while chasing a herd of rabbits. When I woke up, I couldn't find my friend anywhere. I had to ask the staff for help, but they didn't care about me at all. Rabbits are monkeys, elephants are rabbits, the four white-headed lions are monkeys, the fifth is a goat. During the day, the zoo protects normal people. At night the aquarium protects those mildly infected. Remember you are human.
I realized this was probably the friend of the tourist who wrote the previous paper, but if they were both tourists, why was he wearing a black staff uniform, or did he change clothes at the aquarium? That would mean the aquarium is truly a safe zone, even the exit of the zoo. The path that appeared last night most likely leads to the aquarium. Thinking that, the next day I stayed to watch for that path to appear. And sure enough, when it got dark, a herd of monsters charged at me. Behind them were staff shouting for me to stop them. But according to my talent, I had to do the opposite, so I just turned around and watched. Meanwhile, the other candidates also faced a similar decision. But most chose to help the staff, following the rules. They didn't know that a lurking monster rabbit had been watching them. When night fell, they were attacked by a herd of monster rabbits. The outcome was predictable. They were eliminated, their countries facing the threat of invasion. Meanwhile, I finally waited for that path to appear again. I quickly ran down that path. Apart from me, two others also discovered it. One was Thomas, who also had a piece of paper. The other was Nikolai, wandering around late at night. This guy was really lucky, coincidentally finding the way to the aquarium. When I arrived at the aquarium, I immediately saw a notice board at the gate that read, Aquarium Rule 1. The aquarium has a separate rest area for tourists. Food here is free. Just help yourself. Do not eat goat meat, even if you see it on the shelves. 2. There is only one entrance to the aquarium. Once inside, you can stay for a maximum of 3 days, and must stay at least 1 day. 3. This is an aquarium, with only marine life. If you see elephants swimming in the whale area, don't be alarmed, it's just a 3D effect. Imagine they are whales. 4. There is no one in the aquarium. You can take a black uniform at the gate to wear. That is the only rescue signal sent to the staff. 5. Aquarium staff wear red uniforms. They will clean up at midnight. You can chat with them but must not mention the zoo. 6. The aquarium exists independently. There is no zoo outside. 7. The staff leaves at 6 a.m. after finishing cleaning. During that time, you are not allowed to leave the aquarium. 8. If you violate the above rules, you are responsible for your own safety issues. Looking at the long list of rules, I realized I had entered a completely new space, but I didn't wear the black uniform beside it, because according to the previous black clothed staff member, rule 4 could potentially be correct. If I wanted continuous protection from my talent, I had to violate it, so I went straight into the aquarium. The entire space was empty, with no staff around. As soon as I reached the whale area, I saw an elephant's corpse floating behind the thick glass. According to rule 3, if you see elephants swimming here, don't be alarmed, it's just a 3D effect. But clearly this wasn't an effect, but a real elephant that had drowned. Seeing this, I realized the aquarium wasn't as safe as I imagined, but was also full of bizarre things like outside. I didn't wander around anymore but headed straight for the rest area. Indeed, this area had a room specifically for tourists to rest. Looking at the seahorses, my mood felt strangely at ease, the previous tension dissipating. Could these be what helps protect those mildly infected, as the paper mentioned? I felt my mind gradually relax while being around the seahorses, becoming increasingly sleepy. Not long after, I put down my doll and the black general, and fell asleep. I don't know how long I slept until the black general's roar woke me up. I looked at it, full of confusion, because I didn't know where it got two notebooks from. I took them to have a look. It turned out to be the diary of a zoo staff member, writing that ever since working here, I have a strange but extremely realistic dream every night. I was stunned, asking what zoo. This unusual reaction made the Long Nation viewer watching the live stream worried, thinking I had lost my memory. After reading the full content, I thought if I read it all, it would probably take over 40 seconds. You all would just turn off the video. So let me summarize, the staff member dreamed of becoming a drowned elephant. They also had to follow many bizarre rules, like telling tourists there is no aquarium. Anyone who didn't listen would disappear. But strangely, the number of animals kept increasing. Finally, a reminder to always remember you are human, not an animal. The last sentence seemed not written for anyone else but to remind themselves. But the repeated mentions of the zoo made it feel familiar yet I couldn't recall. I may have forgotten something without realizing it. I took a pen and wrote I am human, not an animal on my arm so I wouldn't forget. Then I opened the second notebook, which also had a lot of content, but I'll just mention a few useful pieces of information. The seahorses in the restroom can cure those mildly infected, but at the same time, they also erase some memories. The zoo actually exists, but the entrance to the aquarium only appears for a very short period of time. You may have forgotten your memories of the zoo. But it's okay, as long as you can enter the aquarium, the zoo is no longer important. The seahorses in the room will make you feel sleepy. But tonight, you must not sleep. You must stay awake at all costs. I turn to instruct the doll and the black general, if you see me showing signs of sleepiness, wake me up by any means necessary. 
Right after giving the instructions, I looked back at the diary and found there was one more page. Always remember, you are human, not an animal. Around midnight, the aquarium staff will enter the seahorse room, turn off the lights. At that time, you need to pretend to be asleep. At 5 a.m., the staff will return to the seahorse room. If you are still awake, chat with him, best to talk about the zoo. The exit is inside the aquarium, opening at 5.30 a.m. Then the staff will leave, congratulating you on finding your way home. The diary content ends here. I realized this is the only way to get through. To avoid having my memories erased by the seahorses, I quickly wrote down the important parts on my arm. Meanwhile, affected by the seahorses, Nikolai from Russia also completely forgot about the zoo. But luckily he found the diary. He may have used up all his lifetime's luck, but he thought having the notebook was enough, so he didn't write down the crucial details. But he put the diary away instead. But what he didn't know is that this would be his biggest mistake. As for Thomas from America, he also found two notebooks, but with different content from ours. One was from an aquarium staff member, the other from the zoo director. Opening the staff member's notebook, it wrote, I am an aquarium staff member, usually working the night shift. I start working at midnight and finish around 5.30 a.m. The actual working hours of the aquarium are from midnight to 6 a.m., but I come in late and leave early, because the aquarium strictly prohibits coming early or working overtime. As an aquarium staff member, I must follow the rules. Always remembering that the aquarium exists independently, with no zoo. I doubted this rule, but heard that staff who didn't comply completely disappeared inside the aquarium. At first I thought it was just a scary prank, but then I saw the drowned elephant's corpse in the whale area. No matter how the tourists ask, I denied any awareness of the zoo. I knew they would soon forget the zoo, because the seahorses made them lose their memories of it. Once, a tourist accidentally came here and asked me about the zoo. I adamantly denied it. Afterwards, he lost interest. I turned off the lights in the seahorse tank while he was sound asleep. But the next day when I came to work, he was nowhere to be seen. I don't know what happened to him, but I never saw him at the aquarium again after that. Reading up to here, I'm sure everyone now understands the operating mechanism of this world. All the clues have been connected. The diary writer in the zoo was actually a guest who escaped from the aquarium. But this shocked Thomas greatly, because the diary didn't contain the content he needed, only rambling about how to escape. Then Thomas hurriedly opened the director's diary. I am the zoo director, and I always regret coming here to apply for the job. Not long after working, I realized there was something abnormal about the zoo. First, guests disappeared without a trace, then employees started quitting without reason. I didn't understand why they quit, they seemed to be working happily before. Even if quitting, they should submit a resignation letter, but they left silently. As the director, I had to ensure the zoo and aquarium operated normally. My job was very busy. While supervising the staff, I often saw them chasing rabbits. Although I didn't know how the rabbits got out of their enclosure, the staff would chase them into the lion area, and then the lions would attack the rabbits. It was cruel, but according to the rules, this was normal. I often worked late into the night, but at night I could hear children's laughter coming from the rabbit area. It's possible I was hallucinating, since it was the rabbit area. I discovered the horrifying secret of the zoo. I couldn't escape, it restricted my freedom. No one can survive leaving this place, including me. If you unfortunately step in, remember, 1. It will always affect you. 2. Don't try to understand what it is. 3. Don't let it assimilate you. Remember, you are human, not an animal. The diary also ends here. Without recording the director's whereabouts or the way to escape, Thomas was very disappointed. The two notebooks answered all his questions about this ordeal, but didn't reveal how to escape. It was like being blocked right before scoring a goal. But Thomas quickly regained his spirit, because he still had an unused talent. The plagiarism talent allowed him to steal one useful piece of information from any candidate. Of course, the target was me. When the talent was activated, words gradually appeared. But when Thomas eagerly waited, a horrifying scene emerged. It wrote, What do you want? Keep dreaming, Thomas. Thomas completely collapsed, cried out loud, and crumpled the paper, throwing it to the ground. But I didn't know anything, only seeing the black general chuckling as he looked at me. In fact, after eating the goat meat, I felt very sleepy. When I was about to doze off, the doll and the black general followed my instructions. One pulled my hair, the other bit my arm waking me up instantly. Looking at my bitten arm, even the audience in Dragon Country felt sorry for me. But I didn't mind, even praising them for doing a good job. The seahorses made me feel relaxed but seemed to have a sleep-inducing effect, making people unaware that they have fallen asleep. If I fell asleep at this moment, it wouldn't be as simple as just waking up. The first half of the night passed in that tense state. At midnight, I pretended to sleep on the bed, because according to the notes, a staff member would arrive soon. 
Indeed, five minutes later, a staff member sneaked in, casually took the diary, turned off the seahorse lights, and left. Fortunately, I had written down important information on my arm, so this didn't affect me much. I confirmed the information, which stated that the staff member wouldn't return to the resting room until 5 a.m. My task now was to stay awake until 5.30 a.m. When the staff member returned, I would follow them and leave this place. Meanwhile, Nikolai from Russia didn't have it as easy. After the staff member left, he discovered that the diary on the table had disappeared. He realized the staff might have taken it, but it was too late to record the information. When he picked up a pen and paper, he couldn't remember what he was going to do. The effect of the seahorses grew stronger, and his memories faded quickly. After that, Nikolai couldn't remember anything, only feeling sleepy and unable to keep his eyes open. He decided to sleep first and figure it out in the morning. So, soon after, Nikolai fell into a deep sleep, completely forgetting the warning not to sleep. Meanwhile, since the diary Thomas from America found had different content from mine, he also didn't know how to escape, so he fell asleep under the influence of the seahorses. Only I, with the encouragement of the doll and the black general, persisted and stayed awake until 5.30 a.m. At that time, as predicted, a staff member came to clean the resting room and was very surprised to see me still awake. He even seemed a bit scared. Perhaps according to the staff rules, guests were only considered a nuisance. He didn't talk to me but tried to avoid me, but I didn't give him a chance. Thinking to myself, you won't talk? I stayed up all night waiting, it can't be in vain. I took the initiative and asked, is the zoo actually real? And after your shift ends, can you really go home? But he stared at me, not understanding what I was saying. Nevertheless, he sensed that I was different from the others. So after hurriedly cleaning up, he ran out in a panic. I realized this might be my only chance to successfully escape. I quickly led the doll and the black general and chased after him. Taking advantage of his panicked flight, I found the exit door out of the aquarium. So I pushed the door open and escaped. The system announced, congratulations, you have escaped from the zoo. This time's reward is a seahorse-shaped necklace that will soothe your mood and keep you from losing your way. Indeed, a shimmering seahorse necklace dropped down. I hurriedly put it on. This is really valuable. Combined with the talent to avoid physical pollution and this necklace to avoid mental impact. Along with my two bodyguards, the doll and the black general, my scenario was perfect. I had nothing to worry about. With my 5-star victory, Dragon Country was also greatly rewarded. Not only did it escape the invasion of the bizarre world, but the disease rate of its people also decreased by 20%. This allowed many elderly people who had been paralyzed year after year to now climb walls and jump from floors, and they had no problem bearing the weight of weightlifting. The leaders of Dragon Country saw me as a treasure when I successfully passed the ordeal again. Not only did they arrange top experts to treat me, but they also came to personally welcome me back. Meanwhile, the meetings in Russia and America were not as joyful. Nikolai from Russia regrettably failed due to a small detail. The leaders were also helpless as they had used up all the hint opportunities. Afterwards, they decided to establish friendly relations with Dragon Country at all costs, hoping to avoid a similar situation in the next bizarre world. As for the American meeting room, they were certainly blaming each other. That mustachioed guy never said anything good whenever he appeared. Three days later, I was brought into another bizarre world. This time, it was Mount Dirac. The publicly announced time was three days. There was still one hint opportunity available from the outside. The candidates from South Korea and Japan who were not selected last time also participated this time. As I was thinking of names for them, the rules of Mount Dirac appeared. This time, it was a guidebook for mountain climbers. After reading the rules, I planned to go up the mountain to find useful information. But after walking for a while, I only saw a signboard. It said, you have walked 100 meters. The total length of this path is 10,000 meters. I was immediately shocked. This must be a joke. After walking for so long, it's only been 100 meters? I realized something was wrong. So I decided to count my steps myself, while violating Rule 2's hint to increase the power of my talent. Before I could take two steps, I heard someone behind me calling loudly, Tohyu, Tohyu, as if calling my soul, which sent chills down my spine. According to Rule 1, if someone calls from behind, I must not turn around. But I wanted to turn around and see who was calling in such a creepy way. Not turning around would be rude. But as soon as I turned my head, the voice abruptly stopped, and there was no one behind me. Only then did I realize something was amiss. Why didn't I see any other travelers? I quickly summoned the black general and instructed him to bite anything that tried to approach me. After more than an hour of panting, I finally reached the 800 meter mark and saw a new signboard. But the destination was still far away. 
I was thirsty and hungry. Luckily, there was a vending machine ahead. I approached to see if there was any food still within its expiration date to eat temporarily. Unexpectedly, not only was there fresh food inside, but the souvenirs next to it also looked brand new. It was clear that someone had just placed them here not long ago. I suddenly realized something was amiss. But Mount Dirac has been closed to tourism for two years now. So how could someone come to restock the food regularly? Moreover, I clearly remembered that in the rules it stated, along the way up Mount Dirac, there are vending machines where you can buy souvenirs to take home. But you must absolutely not eat the food there. So this food could be harmful. But now I had to do the opposite. With the protection of my talent after defying the rules. Even if the food was poisonous, I wouldn't die. Moreover, I was really hungry. But after eating my fill, as I prepared to continue, that strange voice called out again, Tohu, Tohu, making me feel very uncomfortable. And this time, the sound was much closer. What surprised me more was that the Black General, an expert on monsters, couldn't hear this sound. Could this be what the hint was warning about? What is this thing? Full of doubts. Suddenly a severe dizziness struck, nearly causing me to faint. Fortunately, the seahorse-shaped necklace on my chest emitted a blinding light, timely repelling that strange call. Otherwise, my head might have split open. Only then did I realize this thing was not something pleasant. Even the ferocious black general couldn't hear its voice. It's very likely this is a monstrous force more terrifying than anything. I must not be careless. Afterwards, I continued climbing the mountain, finally reaching the 1500 meter mark and seeing a new signboard. This time, in addition to the distance, there was also a map of Mount Dirac. But strangely, the final destination was not marked. As I was pondering over the map, suddenly a few people appeared on the small path beside me. There were people coming to the mountain god's shrine. While I was considering my choice, Austin from South Korea and Ellen from Japan also made their decisions respectively. Ellen chose to continue to the destination, while Austin, like me, decided to go to the mountain god's shrine. Ten minutes later, Ellen quickly reached the 9,600 meter mark on Mount Dirac. Only 400 meters away from the destination, he was extremely excited. But he didn't know that 10,000 meters was not the destination. And there was no organizing committee there, only a signboard for the mountain god's shrine waiting for him. Seeing this scene, Ellen completely collapsed. The gap was too large for him to accept. If this was the mountain god's shrine, then what was the shrine on the signboard earlier? But Ellen didn't have time to find the answer, because he was eliminated. His live stream immediately went black. With his failure, the bizarre world descended once again. Back to me, by this time I had arrived in front of the mountain god's shrine. With the protection of the black general and my talent, I wasn't afraid of any strangeness inside, so I went straight in. Upon entering, I discovered that the mountain god the people mentioned was actually a human being. He looked very ordinary, with nothing special. But on the two stone pillars beside me, I found important information. He will lure innocent people into Mount Dirac and cause them to get lost. Those he lures will feel a sense of being watched, stalked, and unconsciously venture deeper into Mount Dirac along a specific route. Most of them will get lost and become his disciples. Only a few with strong willpower can overcome his bizarre influence and regain their senses. Many years ago, a mysterious person once visited Mount Dirac. He had the ability to resist the distortion of perception. Under the guidance of this mysterious person, Person. Mount Dirac finally defeated him, but the mysterious person also fell into a deep sleep. To commemorate this person, Mount Dirac revered him as the mountain god and built a shrine to worship him forever. Reading this, I gradually understood that the mysterious person was the true mountain god, and his sleep had allowed him to rise again. Perhaps only by awakening the mountain god could he be defeated. But how to awaken the mountain god? As I was stuck, I discovered a small piece of paper next to the statue. It seems I really have an affinity with small papers. The content of the paper roughly said, due to greed, Mount Dirac was exploited as a tourist attraction. The mountain god's shrine was moved to the top of the mountain, too far away, so the incense offerings gradually ceased. That allowed his power to gradually recover and completely pollute Mount Dirac. Finally, the paper left an important clue pointing to the Dirac Inn. Meanwhile, Austin from America also read the information on the paper and decided to return to the Dirac Inn once again. But as soon as Austin turned around to leave, he appeared again. Or perhaps the suggestion to go to the Dirac Inn was also wrong. When the people of Dragon Country were worried for me, thinking that I would also return to the inn, I threw away the piece of paper 
thinking that using a small paper to lure me to the Dirac Inn couldn't fool me. That place looked like it wasn't a good place. Moreover, the Black General had already warned me. Meanwhile, Claude didn't disappoint the viewers. He figured out the information and brought the paper slip running into the Mountain God's shrine. He respectfully placed the paper slip under the statue's feet, hoping the information would help him escape from Mount Dirac. Accompanied by a blinding light, the paper slip disappeared, and Claude's mission was accomplished. He began to be protected by the shrine. Back to me, as soon as I stepped out of the shrine, I was suddenly attacked by a golden lizard. I hurried back and discovered another piece of paper had appeared under the statue's feet. While the public in other countries guessed whether I would trust the paper or not, an interesting scene unfolded. The leader of Dragon Country promptly seized the only hint opportunity to tell me about the accuracy of the paper slip. Now looking at the paper slip from Claude, I understood. It turned out the employees of the Dirac Inn were his subordinates. Their lives were the source of his power. To eliminate him, not only did I need to awaken the mountain god, but also remove those employees. The paper slip hinted that a yellow robe and incense in the shrine could be used to summon the mountain god. I searched everywhere and finally found the robe under the table. Putting it on, I felt completely transformed. Indeed, the robe had tremendous power. As I held the incense burner, preparing to go to the Dirac Inn, the calling voice rang out again, this time right behind me. Sure enough, he appeared. He seemed afraid that I would summon the mountain god, so he had no other choice but to rush into the shrine and strike first. I turned back to see him enveloped by an evil aura, the calling voice continuously forming an invisible force compelling me to submit. Fortunately, at this moment, the thorn-shaped necklace took effect, otherwise I wouldn't even have a chance to resist. I seized the moment of clarity to summon the mountain god according to the paper's hint, but the mountain god still didn't appear. This only made him angrier. Well, I'll have to handle it myself then. I immediately ordered the Black General to engage. The Black General eagerly unleashed countless tentacles immediately surrounding him, but he showed no fear towards the Black General. And in the blink of an eye, he cut through each tentacle one by one. Seeing this, I broke out in a cold sweat, not expecting this monster to be so formidable. I quickly took out the doll and threw it at him. But even with the Black General and the doll attacking together, they still couldn't penetrate his defenses. Seeing the situation getting worse, I racked my brain worriedly, wondering if I had missed anything. The Black General was even punched out. I was stunned by that scene, never expecting this monster to be so powerful. I thought I had the script of a dashing male lead, but now I had to fight for my life on Mount Dirac. At this point, he became even more ferocious, knowing I was out of allies, and laughed maniacally as he charged at me. But I couldn't be a coward either, after all, there were still many viewers watching. Moreover, even if I begged for my life, he wouldn't spare me. So I decided to charge forward and confront him head on, hoping my talents would come into play. But at that moment, an intriguing scene unfolded. Golden chains appeared, tightly binding him. It turned out the mountain god of Mount Dirac had finally appeared. Afterwards, the mountain god and him engaged in a fierce battle. It was then that I realized I hadn't missed any details. The mountain god's revival needed time. But now I still couldn't relax, because currently the mountain god and him were evenly matched. Following Claude's hint, to completely defeat him, I had to eliminate his source of power from the Dirac Inn. Therefore, I didn't hesitate, immediately leading the Black General and the doll to run to the inn. But as soon as I stepped in, the employees seemed to have been summoned by him, preparing to charge out. I remembered the hint that only the employees wearing red and white were his main source of power, and had to be eliminated. As for the grey ones, they could be spared, no need to kill. So seeing they had gathered in full force, I locked the door and released the Black General. The Black General and the doll didn't hesitate at all. After being humiliated by him, they didn't give these subordinates a chance. In no time, all were eliminated. The Black General lay on the floor with a satisfied look, its belly full. At this moment, the system announcement rang out, congratulations on escaping Mount Dirac. Five star rating. The reward is the protection of the mountain god. The mountain god's ring is a symbol of the mountain god's indomitability, and also the source of the mountain god's power. It can temporarily imbue mystical beings with power from the mountain god. Trust me, you'll need it. Looking at the mountain god's ring, I was very excited. This is really good. Next time I'll imbue the doll and the black general with it for sure. Their combat power will definitely soar. Next, the system announced that both I and Claude had completed the Mount Dirac challenge, but I got 5 stars while Claude got 3 stars. 
It seems I'm still a bit better than him. The rewards were also vastly different. Dragon Country got a 10% increase in total mineral resources. France got a 10% reduction in the baldness rate. Hearing this, Claude looked delighted. He didn't seem to expect such a peculiar reward. After three days of enjoying the reality, I came to a new bizarre world. This time it was the Aquatic Academy. Aquatic is famous for its strict discipline and rigorous education. To become a student, you must have outstanding achievements. The teachers here hate lazy students the most. If you skip class, you'll be locked in a dark room. But you absolutely must not know what's inside the dark room. Don't let your classmates find out you're not one of them. Don't let him discover your true identity. The challenge time this time is three days. The hint opportunity from the outside world remains once. I'm used to this beginning, so I stretched and started looking for the specific rules. Soon after, I found a piece of paper on the desk. Opening it revealed information about the rules. Rule 1. As soon as you enter the classroom, ensure you're neatly dressed in uniform. Rule 2. During class, you must focus your gaze on the blackboard. No matter what the teacher writes on the board, don't show any surprise or unusual emotions. Stay calm. Rule 3. Don't stare at the teacher. They will feel offended and are more likely to call on you to answer. Rule 4. If you see your deskmate not paying attention, don't hesitate to report them to the teacher immediately. Rule 5. During recess, if a classmate invites you to chat, especially to go to the bathroom together, absolutely do not agree. There are many more rules. I'll mention them as they come up. After reading the rules, I tossed the paper to the black general. Unexpectedly, it swallowed the paper and hid itself under my feet. I didn't know it had this ability, but having a hidden bodyguard by my side also put me more at ease. Still, I had to rebel a little to get power boosts from my talents. So before anyone came in, I violated rule 1 by smearing myself with mud and dirt. When the bell rang, students streamed in, and I saw they were also very dirty. So rule 1 about keeping uniforms neat was wrong. With the classroom this dirty, how could one keep their uniform tidy? After the students sat down, a female teacher wearing thick glasses entered, and the class began. She wrote on the board in red chalk, New student, if you can read this line, come to my office after class. Remember, don't let anyone follow you. Don't worry, they can't see the writing in red chalk. Reading this line, I felt a bit serious, as I wasn't sure yet if the teacher was good or bad. But my expression immediately drew the attention of the students around me. They all turned to stare at me intently. Because rule 2 clearly stated, during class, you must focus your gaze on the board. No matter what the teacher writes, you must not show surprise or express any emotions. You must remain calm. I realized this could expose my identity. To avoid unnecessary trouble, I quickly adjusted my expression. Seeing this, the others turned their heads back to the board. Even though the teacher had now erased the red chalk writing and rewrote in white chalk, our class has a new intruder. Let's find it, shall we? Whoever finds it will be rewarded. Everyone around seemed excited, but I was not happy at all. I thought, she called the new student a delicacy, and then wrote a warning message. There must be a problem. But if all the students could see the red chalk writing, then this could be a trap. After thinking it over, I decided to lay low. Revealing myself now would be unwise. Still, I wanted to see how the teacher would react. According to rule 3, I stared intently at her. Sure enough, before long she called on me to answer a question. If you find your deskmate is the new student, what would you do? I replied that I would politely shake their hand and greet them. But as soon as I said that, I felt the temperature in the classroom drop suddenly. All the students turned towards me, their faces fierce, staring intently. But before they could make another move, I laughed maniacally and continued. After that, I'll tear them apart and bring them to the kitchen as a side dish for our lunch. Hearing my words, the class returned to normal, applauding enthusiastically. Only my deskmate seemed so terrified that they wanted to jump out the window to escape, hating to be next to me for another second. Meanwhile, most other candidates chose to follow the rules, except for the candidate from Myanmar. For some reason, he stared at the teacher for a while and was also called to stand up and answer a question. The teacher smiled strangely and asked, what will the kitchen cook for lunch today? Under intense pressure, he stammered before finally uttering the word meat. Seeing him panic, the teacher laughed even more bizarrely and said, you're right, but to be more precise, today we'll eat your meat. After saying that, the surrounding students laughed crazily and pounced on the Myanmar candidate. At this point, the system announced, candidate from Myanmar devoured by monsters. Bizarre world descends. Luckily, I had a strong mentality and acted well enough to fool them. Otherwise, I might have exposed my identity too. After this incident, things returned to normal. When recess came, the students took out a forbidden book from their desks and read it avidly. Although I didn't know the contents, I also wanted to have that book. According to Rule 5, 
I couldn't agree when a classmate invited me to chat, especially to go to the bathroom together, so I decided to take a risk and approach them to ask about the book. If they refused to share, I'd have to steal it by force. After that, I found it in the desk drawer and started reading it secretly, learning new poses, while also violating rule 8. But I hadn't been reading for long when my desk mate tapped me on the shoulder, saying they had a stomach ache and asking me to go to the bathroom with them. Moreover, I was engrossed in reading the book, but remembering the hint from rule 5, I still agreed to go with them to gain more power from violating the rule. I couldn't refuse verbally, but just as I was about to go, the bell rang for class. I immediately said we had to go to class. Hearing that, my desk mate could only scratch their head, looking dejected. But this made me realize an issue. From observing, I noticed my desk mate was different from the others. The others had dull eyes, but my desk mate's eyes still had a hint of clarity. Could they have discovered my identity and wanted to warn me about something? While I was suspicious, the second class period began. But as soon as class started, I saw my desk mate reading the forbidden book right in front of the teacher. However, according to rule 4, I had to report it immediately when I saw my desk mate violating the rules. Ratting out friends is a despicable act. Moreover, my talent didn't allow me to do that, so I pretended not to see anything, hoping class would end soon. But others didn't think the same way. The Great Wall of China from East Island Nation was one example. Seeing the desk mate reading the forbidden book, he immediately reported it to the teacher. The teacher's head spun 180 degrees, screaming loudly and ordering him to stay after class in the office. The desk mate next to him angrily glared at the Great Wall of China. Unexpectedly, he was shameless enough to sell out his own friend. At 11 a.m., after two class periods, we dragged ourselves into the cafeteria for lunch. According to Rule 6, we couldn't eat the food here but had to eat the principal sausages. Looking at the rotten, smelly sausages, I felt disgusted. At that moment, my desk mate secretly came over to me, saying that if I didn't want to eat that, I could have some vegetables instead, which were safe. I was a bit surprised. After getting enough food, I asked why they were helping me. It turned out they had realized I was the new student, so helping me was helping themselves. They also warned me to get used to everything here, or else the other students would notice me, because he's always lurking everywhere. Although he won't last much longer, my desk mate still hoped I could escape from this school. At this point, I was quite moved and decided to trust them. Even if they were wrong, I still had my talent to protect myself. Then I asked who this he they mentioned was, but they seemed too scared to say. They only said that from the moment I set foot in this school, all my actions were under his surveillance, and he would gradually influence my mind. After saying that, they left before I could stop them. But when I felt disappointed, I noticed they had left a piece of paper for me on the table. I must have a knack for small pieces of paper. The note said, fellow student, I know you're the new student. Don't worry, I won't tell anyone. Of course, this is only while I haven't completely lost my mind. I can see the teacher's red chalk writing on the blackboard, but the other students can't. But don't trust the teacher because of that. She's not trustworthy. I feel the teacher is about to fully control my brain. I can't control myself. If one day you see my eyes become like the other students, kill me immediately. Because I don't want to reveal your secret. After reading it, I became more certain my desk mate hadn't been completely corrupted yet so their warning about the untrustworthy teacher could be true. Moreover, I needed to investigate how he controls brains to guard against it. During the lunch break, I took the forbidden book to the bathroom. This book is really good, but according to rule 6, before entering the bathroom, I had to make sure no one else was there. If I saw other students inside who looked at me strangely, I had to run away immediately. But I ignored a few students who seemed weird and casually walked in to do my business. But right then, I felt a few people approaching me. How rude, don't they know it's impolite to interrupt someone? I zipped up my pants and turned to slap each of them. My slaps left them stunned, and the redness in their eyes disappeared. They shouted, asking why I hit them randomly. I laughed and replied that I didn't hit randomly, but with purpose. My mischievous answer made them furious, trembling as they pointed at my face but couldn't speak. After a while, perhaps feeling offended, they dropped the act and directly asked if I was the new student. Seeing they still didn't know enough, I slapped them two more times. After the beating, I walked out amid everyone's panic looks, with no one daring to stop me. My commanding presence while holding the forbidden book also attracted a beautiful girl. She chased after me and invited me to play basketball with her. Seeing her sincere invitation, I closed the book and agreed right away. At the basketball court, the girl eagerly introduced the game to me. I thought there was no need for an introduction. But then she told me to stand still, as she would demonstrate it for me first. Then I witnessed a shocking scene. While I was confused about what to do, the thorny necklace started glowing. Not only the necklace, but the forbidden book also emitted a faint glow. 
perhaps it also had a spiritual repelling effect, so I opened the book and continued reading. Indeed, it had a mild effect, similar to but weaker than the thorny necklace. Otherwise, how could my deskmate have read it throughout class? After her frenzied dance, the girl looked at me expectantly, but seeing that I paid her no attention and just kept reading the book, she felt embarrassed. She immediately went crazy, screaming that she had practiced for two and a half years but I didn't acknowledge her. She roared, charged at me and yelled that she would kill me. But I wasn't afraid at all. I told her to think it through carefully. Because if she killed me, she would also be locked in the dark room. Hearing about the dark room, the girl froze. And the evil aura around her disappeared. It seemed I had guessed correctly. The corrupted students couldn't kill each other. He was controlling all the rules. And according to the introduction, the dark room not only punished me but was also a nightmare for the other students. Meanwhile, the Great Wall of China couldn't hold it in any longer after holding it all day so he rushed to the bathroom, but he was still afraid there might be someone inside, violating the rules. He only dared to stand outside and shout, acting so cowardly. Luckily there was no response from inside, so he sneaked in, but as soon as he stepped in, a few other students chased after him, loudly asking if he was the new student. The Great Wall of China was so scared he trembled, hugging his head and shouting that he wasn't. If he were the new student, he wouldn't have reported his deskmate this morning. But that statement only made them angrier, thinking that reporting friends was a despicable act. So you're the one who reported your friend? We lost another teammate because of you. Lucky to find you here, we've been searching everywhere for you. Saying that, they cursed and beat up the Great Wall of China. The students the Great Wall of China encountered were different from the ones I met. They were good people not yet fully corrupted. As for the Great Wall of China reporting his friends like that, he deserved the beating. At 3 p.m., the second class began. As soon as the teacher entered, she wrote in red chalk new student, you may have noticed there are others who can see this line besides you, but I advise you not to trust them. Only I can protect you in this school. But with the warning from my deskmate, I would not trust the words on the board. However, when I turned around, I saw my friend had become dull, about to be fully corrupted. Still, I could not change him, as that would expose my identity. Apart from me, the other candidates also noticed the abnormality in my deskmate. But no one believed the teacher's written words, let alone acted on them. There was only one exception, the Great Wall of China from the Archipelago Nation. Originally only having B-grade talent, now he had lost all clues from his deskmate and been beaten up. So he completely collapsed. The Great Wall of China believed the teacher was his only lifeline, so he screamed for her help. This scene made the authorities of the Archipelago Nation watching the live feed go crazy cursing the Great Wall of China as stupid. But they had no other choice but to use the only available hint to warn him not to trust the teacher. Finally, after receiving the hint, the Great Wall of China came to his senses. He dared not act rashly anymore, or he would have been eliminated. So an afternoon passed without any candidate being eliminated. The final bell rang, and the students eagerly rushed out of the classroom. But surprisingly, the teacher kept lecturing, as if she didn't hear the bell. I didn't understand either, and was about to return to the dorm to rest, but as I left the door, a student stopped me, saying I had to stay and clean the restroom today. According to Rule 10, after class, we must return to the dorm immediately. Not listening to any student telling us to stay and clean. But I noticed this student still had a bit of reason in his eyes. Perhaps wanting to remind me of something. So I decided to trust the student and stay in the classroom. But at that moment, the teacher's strange voice rang out. I don't know when, but she had stopped lecturing and was staring at me. Saying she would inspect the restroom after I finished cleaning. I hope you'll make me satisfied. Then the dismissal bell rang again. The teacher gathered her things and left. But why were there two dismissal bells? And why did she only leave after the second bell? The more I thought about it, the more confusing it became. Anyway, first I searched for student belongings left in the classroom. After a while, I finally found a clue in a forbidden student book. These are additional rules specifically for you. Read them carefully, they may help you. Rule 11. The student on duty needs to clean the classroom restroom. Note that after cleaning, leave immediately. There is no teacher coming back to inspect. Rule 12. When cleaning the classroom, lock the doors and windows. If anything strange happens or the teacher comes to inspect, do not open them. If you cannot resist, flee from the classroom immediately. Rule 13. The forbidden book can block his influence but also draw his attention. Do not take the forbidden book out of the classroom. Rule 14. The school security guards are trustworthy. If you have any trouble, go to their restroom immediately. Rule 15. The dark room is dangerous but also contains a way to escape the school. Rule 16. He is everywhere. Most students have become his hands and feet. Do not trust those with hazy eyes. Rule 17. The teacher is trustworthy. She will protect and shelter you. 
Finally, a note said, some rules may have been changed by him. Do not absolutely trust all the rules. After reading, I pondered. Clearly the teacher was not trustworthy. So rule 17 was wrong. That meant most of the rules on this paper had also been changed. Anyway, whether right or wrong, the security guards were the key to passing this ordeal. But just as I was thinking, a strange bird smashed through the glass window and flew in, immediately affecting me. Fortunately, I was still wearing the thorn-shaped necklace, or I would have been affected. I was furious, almost did something terrible. Immediately, I ordered Black Marshall to kill this noisy bird. Black Marshall didn't hesitate, shooting tentacles from its mouth, wrapping the bird tightly and pulling it down. I was also surprised at how weak it was. Seeing nothing special, I told Black Marshall to eat it. But as soon as it swallowed it, Black Marshall writhed in pain. I panicked, could this bird be poisonous? While I was perplexed about what to do, Black Marshall stood up, its mouth making the birds cry. I was startled, could Black Marshall have been possessed by the bird? But seeing it waving its tail continuously, I realized it had absorbed the bird's ability. This astonishing scene also caused a great shock in the outside world. Black Marshall's transformation shattered the nation's perception of monsters. They decided to record this as a classified document. Meanwhile, the other candidates staying behind to clean were also attacked by the birds one by one. They were not as lucky as me. Although they had closed the doors according to Rule 12, the thin glass could not block the bird's fierce attacks. At this time, candidate Marcus from the Phi 2 nation was facing the bird's attack. Although he had closed the door according to the rule, but with the bird's rapid approach, the window glass was still shattered. Just as he was about to collapse, there was a knock on the door. It was the teacher coming to inspect the cleaning, while the bird outside also disappeared. Marcus felt confused. Could the teacher really be trustworthy as Rule 17 said? She came to protect and help him. At this point, Marcus had no other choice. He approached the door intending to open it. But as he got closer, he saw the strange smile on the teacher's face through the glass, which startled him. He suddenly remembered two other rules. Rule 11 The teacher does not inspect the cleaning. The student on duty should leave immediately after cleaning. Rule 12 Do not open the door if anything strange happens or the teacher comes to inspect. If you cannot resist, flee immediately. He realized the teacher might not have come to rescue him but was an accomplice with the bird to trick him into opening the door. Sure enough, not long after Marcus stopped opening the door, the bird reappeared, and the teacher went from knocking to violently banging on the door. Being attacked from two sides left Marcus in despair, not knowing what to do. Just as he was about to collapse, he suddenly came to his senses. Remembering Rule 14 the school security guards are trustworthy, he could ask them for help when in trouble. So Marcus saw them as his only lifeline. As soon as he opened the back door to run and find the security guards, the bird charged at him. Marcus was eliminated immediately. In fact, it was all just an illusion caused by his influence. The glass door remained intact, without any cracks. The bird and the teacher appeared only to scare him into running out of the classroom. But candidate Pedro from the Two Cow Nation also chose the same way and was eliminated immediately. Although it was the optimal solution derived from the rules, who would have thought it was a trap to lure them into a deep abyss? It must be said that the rules in the monster world are becoming more and more confusing. Meanwhile, Claude and Andre also encountered similar situations when staying behind to clean. But thanks to the authorities of the countries using the only hint opportunity, they avoided danger by hiding silently in the classroom. As for me, I handled it completely differently. Although no longer threatened by the bird, I still naturally opened the door for the teacher. As soon as she stepped in, she was about to say a few pleasantries, but I cut her off immediately. Because I knew the teacher had realized I was the new student. The first bell rings, the other students will leave while she continues lecturing. A new student, unaware of the situation, would easily expose a weakness for her to find out. The second bell is a warning signal for her to leave because the monster world also has its own rules. They cannot completely deprive me of the opportunity to survive. So she had to go out and come back under the pretext of inspecting the cleaning. Hearing my sharp analysis, the teacher stopped pretending and changed into her true form. Her body twisted and contorted, leaping up to the ceiling. Even I was shocked, wouldn't twisting her joints like that be painful? Seeing me still mocking, the monster angrily charged at me. But with Black Marshall by my side, I had no fear. After evolving, Black Marshall used the bird's spiritual power to directly attack the monster's mind. The tremendous attack force caused the teacher to twist in pain, clutching her head and collapsing to the ground. 
Next, Black Marshall stomped hard on its face and then used its tentacles to tightly wrap around the monster's body, about to swallow it whole. But at that moment, the strange bird reappeared, circling and screeching towards Black Marshall. I was surprised because I thought Black Marshall had destroyed it, never expecting it to revive. I took out my puppet, excitedly thinking there would be an intense battle. But with just one slap, the puppet shattered the bird. It turned out this was just an illusion created by the teacher, without any physical form. Not long after, Black Marshall, satisfied, disappeared. I also decided to return to the dormitory to rest. But before leaving, I still wanted to be a bit rebellious. So I deliberately violated Rule 13, taking the forbidden book out of the classroom. As soon as I stepped out the door, the system announcement sounded. He was once a crow in the school's tree. Until his nest was destroyed, his chick crushed. At that moment, the seed of hatred germinated in his heart. Under the influence of anger, he began to take revenge on the school. Congratulations, you have escaped from the classroom. Your current evaluation score is 3 stars. Note that Hanthui Academy is not just him. After escaping the school, there will be an overall evaluation score. I was quite surprised, never expecting Hanthui to be similar to the previous monster worlds. This world is completely different. The dormitory and teachers are evaluated separately. This means that after returning to the dormitory, I will enter a new monster world. Meanwhile, thanks to hiding in the classroom, Claude and Andre managed to escape after being harassed by the teacher and bird for a while. Then both decided to find the security guard to ask for help. There, the guard showed them his valuable collection of forbidden books to resist mental influence. Seeing this, the other countries immediately reminded their candidates, but they could not find the security guard, nor obtain the forbidden books, because only those who stayed behind to clean could meet him, while others would be denied at the gate. As for me, I safely returned to the dormitory. Sure enough, a new set of rules was hung in front of the door. Rule 1. Maintain complete silence when entering the six-person room. Do not answer any questions from your roommates. Rule 2. There are only six people in the room, including you. If you notice a different number, go out for five minutes then come back. Repeat if the number is still incorrect. Rule 3. If you hear your roommate saying nonsense, cover your head with a blanket and ignore them. Rule 4. If you see your roommate sleeping at the table, absolutely do not wake them up. Rule 5. There are no birds outside the window. Do not open the curtains. Rule 6. The dormitory cafeteria and school cafeteria are separate. If hungry, ask your roommates to take you to eat. Rule 7. If you see your roommates sleepwalking, wake them up immediately, otherwise something terrible will happen. Rule 8. Kill your deskmate because he knows all your secrets. Rule 9. The dark room does not exist. Do not try to find it by any means. Rule 10. Outside the dormitory is very dangerous at night. Stay in your room until morning. Rule 11. If in danger in the dormitory, go straight to the guard's restroom. After reading, I found something confusing. Rule 9 contradicts the previous rules. It's hard to determine which is correct. But the dark room is definitely the key. I must find out where it is. With many questions, I pushed open the door and entered. A few roommates had already returned early, including my deskmate. But now his eyes were dull and completely contaminated. Seeing me, he acted unfamiliar, smiling and greeting me as if it was our first meeting. But his sly smile showed ill intent. According to Rule 1, I judged him as not a good person, so I slapped him twice immediately. But later I realized he was just having a mouth spasm. Although the two slaps caused great harm to his immature soul. But why didn't you say so earlier, making me unable to control myself? It's not my fault. Seeing my deskmate dazed and confused, I felt a bit embarrassed too. I spoke loudly to the others, everyone, please don't mind the earlier incident, let's live in harmony with each other. Meanwhile, Parai's candidate Ali also went to the security guard's restroom, although he didn't stay behind to clean. Everyone thought he would be denied like the other candidates. But surprisingly, Ali clasped his hands together, activating his talent. This talent allowed him to supplement any missing rules in special cases. He could still pass the challenge and receive the normal reward, although the success rate was only 50%. But this time he was lucky, managing to open the room's door and obtain the item he wanted. Back to me, everything was peaceful until night. But as I lay on the bed, I saw the others gathering and whispering. In the middle of the night without sleeping, what were they up to? Although rule 3 said to cover my head with a blanket and ignore roommate's nonsense, I couldn't follow the rule, so I went and slapped them a few times. Thought I would get into trouble, but they didn't remember the incident, as if I had just woken them up. I realized they were being controlled. 
perhaps he was using this method to extract information from students. After that, everyone returned to their beds as if nothing had happened. But after a few hours, I was woken up again by noises. When I turned to scold them, I saw someone chewing on something. Seeing me looking, he grinned foolishly and invited me to eat together. Calling me to eat, not only disturbing my sleep, but also eating my deskmate. I approached to slap him some more, but rule 7 saved him, instructing to wake them up immediately if you find your roommate sleepwalking. Seeing a pile of feathers on the bed, I realized something was off. Then my deskmate came in from outside. It turned out he was just sleepwalking. But to be safe, I summoned the black general to guard these fools. As for Dai Tuong Hoon, he saw his roommate gnawing on bones late at night. He didn't dare wake him up according to the rules, and was also afraid to sleep alone. Then a bird flew in, staring at him before transforming into a shape resembling him, and charging towards him. Dai Tuong Hoon panicked, but it was all just his hallucination. He just needed to close the curtains, but he kept staring at the bird. It was this foolishness that led to his failure. As the bird charged, an announcement rang out, Dong Dao Nation's candidate has been devoured. The countdown for the monster world begins. The Dong Dao Nation authorities outside also panicked as they suffered four consecutive attacks from the rule worlds. The Dong Dao Nation was on the brink of extinction but it was a sin they brought upon themselves. Afterward, the Dong Dao nation hurriedly sought help from the American old man, but after using up their potential, they had been ignoring them for a long time. In the waterway world, up until this point, only four candidates remained with clear consciousness, including me, Claude, Andre, and Ali. After a night, the next morning when I woke up, I discovered there was an extra person in the room. According to Rule 2, the room only has six people. If you see a different number, you must run outside for five minutes and then return. Repeat if the number is still wrong. But I decided not to do that, and instead went straight to slap him. He was stunned, not expecting me to be so aggressive. He was about to transform to fight back, but I overpowered him immediately, kicking him out the door. Just then, another person approached, saying the dormitory has its own cafeteria and wanted to take me to eat. I recognized he was not a good person from his fake smile. Those in the room had been completely contaminated, but to rebel against rule 16 of the class and rule 6 of the dormitory, I decided to follow him, as long as I could find the cafeteria myself in the end, but when I stopped midway, he turned back, clearly wanting to fight me. I certainly didn't miss this good opportunity, immediately summoning the black general to devour him. With that, I no longer had to worry about anything. After judging the two rules, I had the black general conceal himself, and we went to the cafeteria together. Since I had been to the main school cafeteria before, if there really was another dormitory cafeteria that was so discreet, it could be where the dark room is hidden. But when I stepped inside, I noticed everything seemed normal, nothing out of the ordinary. However, while looking around, I discovered a forbidden book on the table. Its content clearly different from the previous ones, like a record from a beloved fellow student. Don't be surprised to see a forbidden book here. He can't see it, so I can leave it here. Don't believe anything you see here except the forbidden book. He can't leave this place. He can't touch the forbidden book. If you want to meet him, midnight is a better choice. However, I don't recommend you do that, it's very foolish. What am I even saying? If you don't see him, you can't leave. I'm completely trapped here. Maybe one of those passing shadows is me. Good luck. It was a note from an enthusiastic student. After reading it, I realized he might not be in the dormitory. Since according to the note, he only appears at night. But last night, I didn't see him. So if excluding the dormitory, he could be right here in this mysterious cafeteria. And just as I was pondering the note, the other candidates were also led into this secret cafeteria by their roommates. When lining up to get food, they suddenly realized something was off. But it was too late. As they were about to leave, they saw a few people in front had their heads turned 180 degrees, staring at them. Their way back was also blocked by other students. Next, a horrifying scene unfolded as those people's heads detached from their bodies, floating around and surrounding the candidates. The terrifying sight made them panic, not daring to step between the rolling heads. Then they were besieged by the bizarre students. Announcement. Three candidates from Israel, Nepal, and Philippines were devoured. The countdown for the monster world begins. As for me, I also had to face that scene, but as someone who had gone through five rule worlds, this trick was too trivial. I immediately threw out my puppet, and it gleefully smashed all the heads like playing with toys. As they shattered, the blood flowed together in one direction. At the same time, a heartbeat sound echoed from the darkness. Why would there be such a loud heartbeat in the cafeteria? Or could that be him? I sent my puppet and the black general to investigate, but they soon returned, as there was nothing there. 
I decided to follow the note's advice, but I would return at midnight to see. However, I didn't notice that the blood had gradually solidified into a human figure standing behind me. Just as I returned to the dormitory, I saw my roommate sleeping. According to rule 4, if you see your roommate sleeping, you must not wake them up. But how could I follow that? I rushed over and woke him up with a series of five punches. Surprisingly, after being woken up, he cursed at me and then jumped out the window. I was stunned. Young people these days are so fierce when woken up. After careful consideration, I concluded that at that moment, he was controlling my roommate. My waking him up made him think my roommate had broken free from his control, so he cruelly killed my roommate. After weighing it, I took that as the truth. Therefore, for the roommates who were gradually becoming bizarre, I decided to take them out first before they could act. Meanwhile, Claude, Andre and Ali used the forbidden book of the Guardian to awaken the consciousness of their tablemates. With the help of their friends, all three escaped outside. But the situation outside was also unfavorable due to Rule 10 stating that outside was more dangerous than inside at night. Driven into a corner, Andre finally used his secret sulfur monosulfide rank talent, Infinite Analysis. Infinite Analysis allowed him to simulate multiple possible outcomes from choices, thereby finding the optimal choice. Although its use was limited by the user's mental capacity, but currently, Andre was not greatly affected by him. Therefore, he accurately analyzed that he was the key to passing this trial, and he was hiding in the cafeteria. The forbidden book of the Guardian was the weapon to deal with him. The three then decided to go to the third floor cafeteria to investigate. Meanwhile, after escaping the dormitory, Claude and Ali also seemed to realize something, deciding to go to the third floor to search for useful clues. As for me, after dealing with my roommate, I also followed the daytime plan to go to the third floor cafeteria to confront him directly. But as soon as I entered, I saw the clean daytime cafeteria now filled with smoke and a terrible rotten smell. Blood was everywhere, the air reeked of putrid odors. Then I saw the blood start to solidify, soon forming a shape resembling me. Seeing that, I immediately became furious. How dare someone impersonate me like that? Impersonating me with that goofy grin? I don't grin like that. I was determined not to forgive anyone who ruined my image like that. I ordered my puppet to go kick it. The puppet didn't hesitate, kicking the figure in half. I thought it was over, but the two halves quickly reattached into two of me. Feeling even angrier, I ordered the black general to devour them. You can split, can you? Let me devour you and see how you split. But to my surprise, after the black general swallowed the two imposters, they turned into countless versions of me, filling my entire view. Although I'm very handsome, there's no need to admire me to that extent. If this continued, they would drain all my energy. At that moment, the system notified me that I could use the mountain god ring. Seeing that, I was delighted as this was an emergency hint from the Dragon Kingdom authorities. The Dragon Kingdom authorities are very trustworthy, always supporting candidates at the most critical moments. The mountain god ring has the ability to resist distorted perception. I immediately threw it towards the black general. After a blinding light, the black general also fully evolved. In addition to its two sharp fangs, it grew countless arms. It looked a bit ugly, but I didn't care about that now. Eliminating him was the priority. The black general no longer needed my commands, searching for its target to avenge the one who made me look ugly. After searching, the black general aimed at a corner with a mirror. Exposed, the mirror revealed its true form. Countless tainted students reaching out to grab me. But how could they touch me? When my talent exploded, the mirror shattered immediately. The trapped souls inside let out wails, dispersing in all directions. Looking at the shattered mirror on the ground, I ordered the Black General to search for any objects. With its evolved tendrils, the Black General pierced into the mirror. From inside came an angry roar, humans. No no, ah ah, you deserve to die. Then I saw the mirror shatter, the Black General pulling out a wildly beating heart. But I was puzzled because even though I had caught him, the system didn't notify me that I had completed the task. I realized that I might have missed something. After recalling all the rules, I decided to go to the guard's resting room. Because according to rule 11, the security staff is trustworthy, and I could ask them for help when in trouble. Indeed, it was only when I gave the heart to the guard that the system notified me of completing the three-star class. Two-star dormitory, one-star bonus point, totaling six stars. Not only did I receive the reward for passing the polluted world, but I was also rewarded with the cheat paper plane. The plane can only be used once but can convey a 100-word message in the bizarre world. It's truly a valuable item. If used well, it can help other candidates pass the trial. It lives up to its name, Cheat Paper Plane. Meanwhile, Claude, Andre, and Ali completed the trial after me. 
However, they didn't defeat him, only surviving until the end with the help of the guard's forbidden book. Therefore, their rewards couldn't match mine. However, their successful passage also helped their three countries escape the invasion of the rule world, granting them various buffs. Seeing this, the American officials were displeased, not expecting four countries to pass the trial successfully. They believed the other three countries had sided with the Dragon Kingdom allowing the Dragon Kingdom to trend towards surpassing the US. Meanwhile, I returned to the real world and sold the cheat paper plane to Australia through the mediation of the officials. Three days later, I was brought into the next bizarre world called Amusement Park. Since the Amusement Park opened, many tourists have brought their children here to play on weekends, but on the condition that you follow the park's rules. The park often has missing tourists. It's like a giant beast. Anyone who enters its territory cannot survive and get out. Note, you need to leave the park with your younger brother George within two days. During that time, protect George. If he gets swallowed, you will also be stuck here forever. There will be only one hint from the outside. After reading, I discovered an additional burden as my younger brother was pulling my shirt. Begging to go on the bumper car ride, it would clearly be very difficult to take care of him. So I gave him a puppet to hug and told him I would come back to take him for a ride after finding the park map. I told him to stay put and not run around. Shortly after, I received the map from a staff member. According to the rule, the rules are usually written on the back. Sure enough, welcome to the amusement park. To ensure our guests and their families have a pleasant weekend, please follow these rules. Rule 1. The bumper car ride is only for children. Rule 2. Guests can have free meals at the dining area if tired, but be careful not to eat burgers or similar items. Rule 3. The burgers at the dining area are extremely delicious. We highly encourage you to try the burgers here. Rule 4. You can go on the Ferris wheel, but if you encounter a blind woman there, ignore whatever she says. Rule 5. The super speed roller coaster is very exciting but not recommended for children. However, it's fine if there are safety harnesses. Rule 6. The merry-go-round is suitable for adults and children providing a joyful time for the whole family. Rule 7. There are no green frog balloons in the park. If you see someone selling green frog balloons, immediately stay out of the seller's sight. Rule 8. Don't trust the guards. Don't touch anything they leave behind. Rule 9. The mirror world in the park truly exists, but you must not enter it. Rule 10. Don't trust the park staff, especially those wearing black uniforms. After reading, I had a serious expression as it was the first time the rules were written in three different colored texts. But I didn't understand the specific meanings. I realized I needed to be more careful than usual this time, as I had the additional burden of my younger brother without the protection of my talent. I wondered why the rules didn't include content about protecting George. If they did, I could have used my talent of defiance to eliminate it, getting rid of the burden, while also getting protection from my talent. But now there was no other way. I had to go back and find him. But when I returned, he had disappeared. I had to search everywhere before finding him sitting by the bumper cars, crying. What had happened? Was he hit by someone? Upon asking, I learned that the puppet had hit him. I understood, surely the puppet did that to protect George from danger. So I used my mind control skill on the little boy. How could such a cute puppet hit you? You must have tripped and fell yourself. The puppet is just a toy. How could it hit someone? No mistake, children are easily deceived. After my smokescreen, George completely forgot about the earlier incident. I must admit, he's lucky to have me as an older brother. Not only did I help him forget his troubles, but I also found a way for him to live happily. Then I took him to play on the bumper cars. Although rule 1 said only children could play, I still deliberately tried it, to gain additional protection from my initial talent by violating the rule. But as soon as I got George into a safe position, a guard secretly slipped me a piece of paper and hurriedly left. I was also puzzled by this unexpected paper. Upon opening it, it was an explanation of the rules from the guard. Green text can be trusted. Yellow text should only be half trusted. Red text was given by him. I then understood the meaning of the colored texts and the rules. But according to rule 8, anything said or left by the guards is untrustworthy. However, I felt he wasn't a bad person, as he did not attack me and George when we passed by, so I could not simply judge the rules based on colors. After thinking it through, George and I happily played on the bumper cars, wanting to leave him with beautiful childhood memories. 20 minutes later, the bumper cars stopped. The strong collisions almost made George vomit, and he said he would never play bumper cars again. Seeing this, I was satisfied that my accompaniment was truly effective. I asked him what he wanted to play next to reinforce my influence on him. But his answer put me in a difficult position, the super speed roller coaster. Although rule 5 said the roller coaster is very exciting but not recommended for children, however, 
it's fine if there are safety harnesses. But this rule was in yellow text, meaning it's only half true. So I didn't dare violate it directly. Moreover, I also really wanted to ride it. So I refused, saying the roller coaster was too dangerous. Not a ride for children. I said I would go buy him a balloon from the green frog balloon stall near the bumper cars. According to rule 7 in green text, the park does not sell green frog balloons. If you see them being sold, stay away immediately. So I decided to violate this rule. As soon as I saw the frogs, I shouted loudly, forbidding the sale of balloons. He was startled, not knowing who I was. Before he could react, I snatched all the balloons, saying I was confiscating them and demanded he sell other merchandise. Then I just left. The frog seller looked at me bewildered, completely bewildered by my sudden appearance. But since its purpose was to sell balloons, it didn't demand them back. However, I felt I hadn't violated enough rules, so I went back and asked if it had any more balloons, while releasing all the balloons I had taken. The frog seller broke out in a cold sweat. It lifelessly replied that there were no more balloons left, as I had taken them all. But before it could finish speaking, I rushed and punched it. How dare you, a mere frog puppet, say there are no more balloons. You're clearly underestimating me for having little money. Meanwhile, the Korean candidate Han Su and also encountered the frog but ran away, fearing violating Rule 7. But he forgot his younger brother was still standing there dazed. In fact, after running away, Han Su in remembered George was still there. He hurried back to find George holding a green frog balloon. According to Rule 7, the park does not sell green frog balloons, and you must stay away immediately if you see them being sold. But strangely, George was holding the balloon but didn't seem contaminated. Han Su in wondered if Rule 7 was wrong. Nonetheless, he snatched the balloon and released it to be safe. What he didn't know was that after they left, the frog seller suddenly reappeared, looking at them with an evil gaze. Its frightening expression made everyone worry for me, since I had also held that balloon. They didn't know if the frog was targeting me as well. Meanwhile, after beating up the frog, I took George to the dining area. As soon as we arrived, George pointed at the menu, shouting that he wanted to eat a burger and fries. But according to Rule 2, you must absolutely not eat burgers. However, Rule 3 stated that the burgers here are extremely delicious and worth trying. I realized these two rules contradicted each other. Violating either one would cause me to lose the protection of my talent by following the other. But this was not difficult for me, as I had encountered similar situations in previous worlds. So I told the staff to bring two portions of french fries and two burger buns. But just the buns without the patties. That way, I was eating a burger but not completely violating the rule. My talent remained in effect. This deception even made me admire myself. George wondered why the burger had no patty, but as long as there was food, he was fine. While eating, I overheard a mother and child behind us saying they would go to the bear world after finishing their meal. But there was no such area on the park map. Earlier, I had taken George around the entire park and didn't see any bear world. Could it be that this park is like a zoo, with two completely separate areas? With that question in mind, we finished eating and per George's request, went to the carousel ride. According to Rule 4, you can ride it, but if you encounter a blind woman there, do not believe what she says. And I did encounter that blind woman. She was even muttering to herself, such lovely children. It would be such a pity if you fell off the carousel, she said, leaving a piece of paper on the seat. Although Rule 4 said not to believe her, judging from her recent actions, she didn't seem to have any ill intentions. She might have just been waiting here to leave a hint for the candidates. When I opened the paper to read it, a staff member suddenly appeared, asking if I had picked up something from the blind woman. He said she came to the park to cause trouble, and if I had anything from her, I must hand it over immediately. Although he wasn't wearing a black uniform, I still felt something was off. So I hid the paper and said I didn't have anything. Staff didn't say anything, but seeing George alone on the carousel, he asked why I wasn't riding with him to enjoy the view. I lied that I was afraid of heights. Unexpectedly, he believed me and happily said to ensure the guest's safety. He would ride with George. Then he started the carousel. As it gradually rose higher, his uniform slowly turned black. Meanwhile, most of the other candidates also encountered similar situations when choosing to ride with staff. To everyone's horror, the staff's uniform completely turned black, but the carousel had risen too high for anyone to escape. Soon after, the staff shed their disguise and pushed the candidates off the carousel. At the same time, an announcement stated that six countries were about to face a bizarre world. As for me, another figure also flew out from the carousel, but it didn't look like George. It was the staff member who had transformed. But since George had a protective puppet, how could that staff member be a match for him? Seeing him eliminated, felt relieved and opened the blind woman's paper to read it. Rule 11. 
As you read this line, he may have already set his sights on you. Leave the park following the staff's directions. Rule 12. The new slide is the correct exit. The park has no exit. Rule 13. The bear world does not exist, but you can search for a place with that name. Rule 14. If you accidentally step into his territory, do not panic, stay calm. Any emotion from you will be seen as a challenge. Rule 15. No one can escape. Everyone will become his plaything to vent his anger on. After reading it, I felt something was off. The staff were completely untrustworthy. Even those not wearing black had been contaminated. But Rule 11 was in green. This could only mean he had changed the colors of the rules. So distinguishing rules by color was completely impossible. As I pondered the paper, I saw the carousel return. George frantically hugged me, recounting the terrifying events on the carousel. Seeing that, I chuckled to myself. After all, he's still a child, just a little scare and he becomes obedient. While patting his head to comfort him, I said I would take him to the mirror world to play. Although according to the green rule 9, the mirror world exists, but we're not supposed to enter it. Green no longer represents what's right. I realized to find the world inside the park, I had to check each area. But as soon as we reached the mirror world gate, we saw a sign. Welcome to the mirror maze. To enhance your experience, before entering the maze, we advise you to turn left three times, turn right three times, then enter through the middle path. If you get lost in the maze, do not panic. To exit, stand in front of the regular mirrors with surveillance cameras. Staff will rescue you immediately. That was the content on the sign, but there was also a paper note stuck beside it, which I quickly took to read. The content made me shudder. I am the park's last remaining security guard. As you read this line, I may already be dead. The maze used to be his territory. If you accidentally enter, do not turn back, as you don't know where the exit behind leads now. Follow the instructions on the sign before entering the maze, it may save your life. Do not stand in front of regular mirrors if you don't want to see him inside. Listen to me, we tried to fight him, but his power exceeded our imagination. This is the last note I leave behind. If you meet me again, I may be in a different form. No one can escape this park. After reading it, I felt there was a contradiction. On one hand, it said to trust the sign's instructions, but on the other hand, it warned not to stand in front of regular mirrors. The scarce information was very eerie. Perhaps the note had also been tampered with by him. After thinking it over, I decided not to follow the sign's instructions but chose to enter through the path on the right instead. Meanwhile, the remaining candidates also arrived at the mirror world gate one by one and made different decisions regarding the sign and the note. Han Su In chose to follow the sign's instructions. He spun around humorously before entering through the middle path. Claude hesitated for a while then decided to go through the left path with George. Only Andre, after analyzing, chose the same as me, the right path. Meanwhile, George and I had been wandering inside the maze for a while. Every path seemed to be divided by mirrors, never reaching the end. As I was about to break through, I was interrupted by George's crying. He accused his puppet of hitting him again, forbidding him from looking into the mirrors. Hearing that, I realized the puppet might have discovered an issue with the mirrors, so I asked George to lead me there. But when we arrived, it was just a regular mirror, nothing out of the ordinary. But if the puppet forbade George from looking into this mirror, there must be an issue. So I stood in front of the mirror and looked inside. Sure enough, a bizarre image appeared within. Seeing this childish trick, I wanted to laugh. Daring to scare me with just this level? Let's see how I handle this. I summoned the black general, and it not only shattered the mirror but also devoured the bizarre creature inside. I have to admit, physical force is the conqueror of all elaborate tricks. But I also realized that, just as the security guard's note warned, staring intently into regular mirrors does easily attract his lurking presence. But this also showed that the entrance to the inner world is nearby. Meanwhile, Han Su In was also wandering with George in the mirror world. The reflections of the mirrors completely disoriented them. As Han Su In was pondering, his younger brother, who was with him, was drawn to a mirror, silently approaching it. George then began to transform before his eyes. By the time he noticed, it was too late. George was transforming at a terrifying speed. Soon after, the boy was completely contaminated, staring intently at him. Han Su In was scared but didn't know what to do trapped in the maze, and now his brother had transformed. He panicked, standing still. This deadlock was only broken by a sudden warning sound. It was the authority of his country using the only hint, telling him to run away quickly. Seeing this, Han Su In snapped out of it, turning around and running away without thinking. But both of them had forgotten the warning on the note. Do not turn back once inside the maze. It must be said, this authority was also too reckless. This move had completely blocked Han Su In's way back. How foolish. Now Han Su In could only run around the mirrors. Han 
Su In was already lost before, and now not only could he not find the exit, but he also couldn't escape the room. Soon after, George blocked his way, telling him to play a horrifying game of hide and seek. If George caught him, Han Su In would be eaten. Of course, Han Su In refused, trembling as he backed away. But after just a few steps back, he bumped into something. Turning around in horror, Han Su In saw it was the frog, which had appeared behind him at some point. Before he could react, the frog opened its mouth wide and swallowed Han Su In whole. At the same time, the system announced, Candidate Han Su In of South Korea has been swallowed. The world of rules is about to descend. Meanwhile, on my side, after the black general shattered the mirror, the spilled black blood formed a new path. Seeing this, I was also surprised. Could this be the way out of the mirror maze? Without hesitation, George and I ran frantically into that path. The short path led to a red door. All the black blood eventually poured into it. Could what lay behind that door be his territory? Or the so-called inner world? Although this place was full of eerie and dangerous things. To find a way out, I decided to open the door and see. Meanwhile, Bart from Australia was still wandering with his brother in the mirror maze. But now, from the mirrors, malicious laughter echoed out. The horrifying laughter resonated throughout the confined space, making Bart unable to bear it, forcing him to cover his ears. As he was nearly exhausted, a paper airplane flew in front of him. It was the Australian authority using the cheating paper airplane providing Bart with an important clue about my actions. After reading the hint, Bart didn't hesitate. He also shattered a nearby mirror, creating a path similar to mine. He followed that path, passing through that red door. However, his hand seemed to have an issue after shattering the mirror. After Bart entered the door, Andre and the remaining candidates gradually found their way here as well. But even after using his infinite analysis skill in front of the door, Andre still couldn't find the right choice. Despite analyzing countless plans, he still couldn't get out. He felt utterly hopeless. He panicked, shouting to the sky, hoping the outside authorities would see and provide a hint. But he didn't know his signal was being disrupted, leaving only a blurred image. Meanwhile, in the French authorities' meeting room, someone suddenly stood up, saying they understood Andre's lip movements. Andre wanted to say the exit was behind the door, since Tohu and Bart had both entered. Adding Andre's words, they assumed the exit was behind the door and sent a notification to the candidate. But they didn't consider that if Andre was certain about the exit, why didn't he go in himself? Moreover, when he shouted earlier, Andre's eyes were bloodshot, clearly resembling someone else. So the image of him just now wasn't simply disrupted, but rather controlled by him. Staged to lure the other candidates into a trap. Only when the people in Long Nation analyzed and worried for me did my image reappear. At this point, I had arrived at a place called the Teddy Bear World. According to Rule 14, if you accidentally enter his territory, don't panic, stay calm. But I felt like the toy bears here seemed real, staring intently at me. The eerie atmosphere made me tremble a bit in fear. I took out the anti-pollution mirror to dispel the illusions, to see what the real situation here was. But as soon as I looked, I was horrified. Inside those teddy bears were real people, those who had given me hints before. I realized he had truly been watching us. Based on this situation, his manifestation in the park was truly the most terrifying so far. As I was about to try to rescue these people, George's scream suddenly pulled me back to reality. New rules for the teddy bear world appeared before me. This is his territory, an endless world. Anyone who enters must willingly follow the rules below. Although I can't save your friends, at least I can prolong their time. Rule 1. After entering the teddy bear world, automatically board the sightseeing vehicle to extend your lifespan. Rule 2. Learn to control your emotions. They bring no benefit and only anger him. Rule 3. He is always watching you in the darkness. He takes delight in your fear. Rule 4. Don't try to find him, you will regret that decision. Rule 5. There is no escape or survival. The teddy bears are your fate. Rule 6. In fact, all the rules are deceptions, for no one can escape alive. Such absurd rules. So I will break each rule one by one, turning this place into rubble. Then I burst into maniacal laughter under the gaze of the bears. Even the black general couldn't stand my deranged expression, closing his eyes in disgust. My provocative actions angered him. Under his control, the bear's eyes turned bloodshot, looking even more terrifying. A giant bear gradually stood up, advancing towards me with a malicious grin. But I remained calm, for I was about to take action. I ordered the black general to attack him. Without hesitation, it unleashed its tentacles, surrounding the bear. But after retaliating, the bear proved to be a formidable opponent for the black general. Seeing this, 
I was about to use the mountain god ring, but George interrupted, saying the bear came to find you and wanted to talk. The bear was very dangerous, so I refused immediately, only needing to protect George, so I ordered the black general to use the mountain god ring. The power from the ring, the black general grew stronger, continuing its fierce battle against the bear. But the doll inside George suddenly became strange. Unexpectedly, the doll charged towards me. I thought it had been completely corrupted, but instead it flew straight at the bear opening a mouth that had been sealed shut. Then it forcefully inhaled the dark atmosphere surrounding the bear, similar to how the black general devours demonic beasts. Gradually, the bear returned to its white color as it was drained by the doll. At the same time, the system announced, originally, it was just a pure, kind teddy bear. But unfortunately, negative emotions turned it into this. It is not at fault. Perhaps the fault lies with this world, with those who vented their anger upon it. Congratulations on completing the park perfectly. This unique way of completion earns you a bonus. Completion rating, 6 stars. Bonus reward, the source of the white bear's negative emotional pollution, increases abnormality resistance by 2. This was an unexpected ending, but I was still pleased to study the reward. The pollution source I just received is the darkness within the white bear, causing anything infected to become a negative emotion puppet for 3 minutes. Although only effective for 3 minutes, it can directly confront abnormalities. Truly a valuable item. Meanwhile, George also began to change. It turned out he was a little teddy bear too. George had been disguising himself as a human to guide the candidates to save the white bear. Then I saw George transform into a teddy bear cub, holding the white bear's hand, bidding me farewell before gradually disappearing. This scene also moved me. Sometimes those abnormalities are also forced to become like that. Who knows when this abnormal world will completely disappear. Meanwhile, after Bart and Claude entered the teddy bear world with George, Claude always followed the rules, sitting on the sightseeing vehicle without getting off. But he didn't expect the vehicle to just loop around the teddy bear world endlessly. Unable to bear the endless loop, Claude decided to get off the vehicle himself and end it all. Immediately, he was also swallowed up. How regrettable. Apart from Claude, Ali from Australia did something similar. Truly, this world of rules is difficult to overcome, as Rule 6 stated. Not long after, the system announced that France and Australia would soon face the world of rules. But apart from me, there was one other person who succeeded, and that was Andre. After careful analysis, he realized George was the key. So as soon as he entered the teddy bear world, Andre pushed George out. The black atmosphere around them was absorbed by George, turning the white bear back to normal. But due to absorbing the darkness in place of the bear, George had to remain in the park forever. Although it was pitiful for George, having him substitute for a candidate may have been the only way to pass this trial. Andre also received a success notification, along with a unique reward, the green frog balloon. With our success, both the dragon country and the hunkering country received different overall rewards for the entire nation. After three days of enjoying the fruits in the real world, I entered the world of rules again. But this time was different. I didn't enter a regular trial but due to my excessively high completion rate, I was targeted, activating the special world of rules called the family of six. Some families are safe havens, sources of happiness, but some are full of danger and mystery. Perhaps fire cannot extinguish fear, but sincerity can. This is the family of six. As a family member, you have the right and responsibility to care for everyone. Perhaps they are very frightening, but if you are patient, politely communicate, you will find a way to harmonize with them. Note, use any means to survive for five days. Warning, your family consists of a grandmother, parents, a younger brother, and a younger sister. It's very dangerous, with three of them wanting to kill you. Be careful to distinguish them. After reading, I thought to myself, out of six people, three already want to kill me. How unpleasant. Fitting for a special world of rules. Just thinking about it makes me anxious. Then I picked up the paper on the table and studied the rules carefully. This is the world of rules. If you don't read the rules, you can't play. Rule 1. Do not leave the room except during safe times. Rule 2 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. are safe times. You can leave the room to have meals prepared by the family. Rule 3. Do not trust the grandmother. She moves very quietly. If you hear her approaching, do not make a sound or she will kill by following the noise. Rule 4. Your younger brother sometimes knocks on the door, usually three times. Before he knocks the third time, remember to cover your ears. Otherwise, you will suffer mental disturbance. Rule 5. The mother has psychological issues. She kills people randomly without reason. Of course, sometimes the target is not you. Rule 6. The father walks very heavily. He loves you the most in the family and will protect you in critical moments. Rule 7. 
The younger sister is trustworthy. Protect her. If she dies, everyone will completely lose control. Rule 8. In an uncontrollable situation, the closet in the room might be a good hiding spot. Rule 9. There is a phone in the room for use, but no matter who messages, do not reply. Otherwise, the consequences will be severe. After reading, I had a headache because three people wanted to kill me, yet I had to protect one more person, and only one person would protect me. What a strange family. This time there was even a phone. As I was thinking, the phone rang with a message from my younger sister. While reading the rules, I suddenly heard loud knocking outside the door. It was my younger sister saying she would break down the door if I didn't open it. According to rule 7, the younger sister is trustworthy, I must protect her. If she dies, everyone will completely lose control. I quickly went to the door, opening it wide. My younger sister outside was stunned, not expecting me to dare open the door. But she quickly regained her composure, smiling wickedly. However, I had been through many battles, not afraid of this little demon. I punched her squarely in the face twice, causing my younger sister to tremble, severely shocked and speechless. Then suddenly, my sister lunged at me, her eyes bulging with a ferocious look. But I was prepared, I would teach her a lesson. I summoned a puppet, causing my sister to lose her initial enthusiasm. Soon after, she was beaten so brutally that she had no strength left to resist, fleeing at the first opportunity. Meanwhile, candidate Nakamura from the eastern island country also received a message from his sister. At that time, he was holding his phone, drooling with unhealthy thoughts. And suddenly, he was startled by loud knocking on the door. Reading the new message, he saw that his sister had completely changed, threatening to break down the door and barge in. Hearing the noise outside, Nakamura became terrified, no longer having indecent thoughts. He desperately sought a way to survive. Luckily, remembering the hint from Rule 8, he quickly hid in the closet. Soon after, the door could not withstand it and was slashed open by his sister. His sister laughed derisively, saying Nakamura wanted to see short skirts, so he had to be brave instead of hiding all the time if he wanted to see. But faced with this horrific scene, Nakamura no longer had the mind to think about such things. He was lucky if he didn't wet his pants. This scene enraged the Eastern Island country authorities, scolding Nakamura for being a pervert, embarrassing them before the world. They thought they would be eliminated right from the start, prepared to welcome the world of rules when the situation unexpectedly turned. Outside the door, the younger brother's voice rang out, telling the sister that their father called her over for something. The sister obeyed, taking the hatchet and leaving immediately. Nakamura also breathed a sigh of relief. Not long after, he became alarmed again when remembering Rule 4. The younger brother knocks on the door three times. You must cover your ears before the third knock, or you will suffer mental disturbance. If Rule 4 was correct, and the younger brother knocked on the door now, what should he do? Waiting another 10 minutes, luckily the younger brother didn't knock according to the rule, so he escaped death. Therefore, Nakamura thought Rule 4 was wrong. The younger brother and father were both good, but was it really that simple? And the broken door had automatically repaired itself, what did this mean? Meanwhile, I had just finished beating up my younger sister and was lying on the bed, thinking about the correctness of the rules. Based on the previous situation, I believed the current rules were clearly wrong, and the time to pass this copy was 5 days, while also requiring the chosen one not to die within those 5 days. This meant the chosen one could only complete the task when time was up. But if that was truly the case, there would surely be new rules appearing afterwards. As I was thinking, the phone rang again. When I opened it, it was a message from my younger brother, informing me that our father had psychological issues. But Rule 5 didn't mention psychological issues. Could Rule 5 also be wrong? And at this moment, I received another message from my father, saying that only my younger brother had psychological issues. These messages left me completely confused. This was a strange family. I had no idea who to trust. Not only me. Other chosen ones also received these two messages. After Tsubao, a chosen one from South Africa, saw the messages, he became bewildered and didn't understand what was happening. He immediately recalled Rule 9 and quickly retrieved the messages. Due to his intelligence, he felt lucky and delighted. But before he could breathe a sigh of relief, he heard a loud banging on the door from outside. Based on the hint from Rule 6, the father is the protector. This sound at the living room door clearly wasn't the father. It seemed he was also terrified by this sudden door banging, and he roared that he wouldn't open the door. And this action further angered the father. He kicked the room door forcefully, then went to Tsubao with an angry look on his face, and slapped Tsubao hard on the head. 
And immediately the system also announced that Tsubao, a chosen one from South Africa, had been swallowed by a strange object. The world was counting down before a bizarre catastrophe was about to occur. This horrific scene sent chills down the spines of people all over the world. Before they could comprehend it, consecutive elimination warning sounds echoed across the global sky. The main culprit was the father, who had lost his mind. Yes, it was he who randomly targeted the chosen ones and carried out an insane, unconditional killing spree. Only those hiding in closets could escape death, as hinted by the rule. Of course, except for me, I had many other choices. However, I chose the boldest approach. Right before the father broke down the door, I had already ordered General Black to remove the door. This bold move caught the one called father by surprise. He became enraged and prepared to attack me, but I stepped forward and punched him twice in the face. Since he came of his own accord, I showed no mercy. After a satisfying beating, I ordered General Black to advance and deal with him. With General Black's assistance, the ferocious and terrifying father figure lost his ability to resist and was swallowed up. At the same time, Nakamura, who had just breathed a sigh of relief, suddenly heard a strange knocking sound. He hid trembling under the blanket, mistaking it for the sound of the younger brother from before, but then changed his mind. However, the voice outside the door belonged to the younger sister. This voice was particularly gentle, not at all like the first time the younger sister entered. However, he didn't know that it was all an illusion he had created. Under the influence of the third knock, he completely lost his mind and could no longer endure. After becoming enraged and vomiting blood, he was taken away. Then the knocking sound also came to the other players, eliminating them consecutively. Even I couldn't escape it. The strange knocking sound also rang outside my room. I was furious at being woken up, thinking that since the door had been broken down, how could there be a knocking sound? But when I woke up and looked, the room door had automatically repaired itself. At first, I didn't want to pay attention to the knocking, but the incessant sound made me feel very uncomfortable. It seemed that if I didn't open the door, this strange noise wouldn't stop. So I approached the door to see who dared to do this. But when I opened the door, I didn't see anyone. It was 12 noon, according to the hint from rule 2. The other players had all left their rooms and gone to the living room for lunch. But I deliberately defied the rule, so I waited until 2 p.m. After everyone had finished eating and returned to their rooms, before I leisurely went out to find food. Looking at the house structure, I saw that only my room was on the first floor, while the other rooms were all on the second floor. Could there be a secret on the second floor? Although I could go and check, I felt it wasn't necessary at the moment. After all, I just had to stay here for five days to pass this level. It's best not to do anything too extreme. On my way, I received another message, this time from my grandmother, saying she had prepared food and drinks for me. Looking at the table full of dishes, I was quite surprised. My grandmother must be a kind person. So I comfortably enjoyed the sumptuous lunch in the living room. Meanwhile, the other members of the house seemed to deliberately avoid me, not appearing within my sight. After eating, I returned to my room and sent messages to each of them. My proactive approach surprised them greatly. Their responses were all very suspicious. They might have been calling me a fool in their heads. But at that moment, my tightly closed room door was suddenly pushed open. That father figure appeared again. Wasn't he in General Black's stomach earlier? How did he reappear? Or could there be two fathers in this house? But I suddenly realized something was off. The previously broken door had automatically repaired itself, and now my father had been fully revived. Could everything in this virtual world be recreated? As soon as he appeared, the father figure saw me lying leisurely on the bed and immediately took off his belt to hit me, completely forgetting the severe beating I had given him. Faced with his arrogant attitude, I would show no mercy. Since he was so stubborn, I would teach him another lesson. I immediately took out my puppet, and with a kick, sent the father figure flying into the wall stuck and unable to move. But when I was about to see how he would revive, he suddenly disappeared. Not only that, the shattered wall also restored itself to its original state. At this point, I was completely certain my initial guess was correct. Everything here could indeed be recreated. Meanwhile, Andre was also barged into by the father figure. But luckily, thanks to his analytical talent, he had predicted this situation and hid in the closet early to avoid being hunted down. But just as Andre was silently rejoicing, an unexpected scene unfolded. Folded. Not only the father, but the younger sister and the knocking sound also appeared simultaneously. This meant Andre had to face three major threats at once. With no choice, he could only use the green frog reward from the previous world. When Andre used the green frog balloon, his entire body emitted a green light, forming a shield that could block the perception of the supernatural for a short time, avoiding detection. Fortunately, he had made the quick decision, 
because right after he used it, the younger sister charged in, looking into the closet. Thanks to the green frog balloon, Andre successfully escaped. After the father and sister left in anger, Andre used his infinite analysis talent again. The analysis result left him astonished, completely unable to believe that the one who had been knocking earlier was himself. At exactly 7 p.m., it was dinner time again. Although the dining room was not lit, I could vaguely see a sumptuous dinner on the table. Feeling very hungry, I was about to turn on the light to eat my fill. But just as I was about to turn on the light, I noticed a note reminding me not to turn on the lights. I nodded in understanding but still turned on the light. How could I eat in the dark? I need proper lighting for meals. Seeing that dinner was a hot pot, my mood became even more joyful. I didn't expect my random message to my grandmother that she would actually follow through. Could my grandmother be the one always protecting me? But I felt it couldn't be that simple. Unable to think it through clearly, I didn't dwell on it anymore. After eating, I returned to my room and slept soundly. The next morning, I woke up, yawned, and checked my phone for any new messages. Sure enough, there was a message from my younger brother, but when I opened it, he had retracted it, saying it was a mistake. Seeing his response, I became angry because it was clear my younger brother was messing with me. Has he gone crazy or does he think I won't dare to confront him? Just as I was about to go find my younger brother to settle the score, I suddenly noticed some new rules on the table. Rule 10. Killing the younger sister allows you to pass the level directly. Rule 11. Killing the younger brother also allows you to pass the level directly. Rule 12. Trust your mother, she will always protect you. Rule 13. Trust your grandmother, she is the one you need to protect. After reading them, I felt confused. Could killing the younger sister or brother really allow me to pass the level immediately? But I had already proven that this world could be infinitely recreated, and that I was required to pass after 5 days. So these rules were definitely wrong. But the world of rules couldn't present rules that were so easily distinguishable as right or wrong without some hidden meaning. Thinking carefully, I suddenly had an idea. Perhaps the rules were suggesting that either the younger sister or the younger brother, one of them could not be revived. The more I thought about it, the more it made sense. One of them must be the key to passing the level. Meanwhile, the other players also found the new rules. Although most did not choose to follow rule 11, there were still a few who felt they didn't have the strength to survive until the fifth day, so they decided to take the risk and follow the rule, killing their younger sister or younger brother. The outcome was predictable. Those who chose to kill their younger sister were counterattacked by her, as if she had been prepared to eliminate them. As for those who successfully killed their younger brother, they were immediately swallowed by a supernatural power from the brother's corpse. This scene made the outside viewers silently feel terrified. Fortunately, I did not choose to follow those rules. Otherwise, no matter how many weapons I had, I would have died by now. But even those inside who did not follow the rules faced unprecedented danger. Kim Zai Kun from Kim Kai Nation was one example. He had just finished reading the rules when he received a message from his mother. The content was cut off midway, as if something had forced it to stop sending. Kim Zai Kun panicked upon seeing that message. Rule 13 said we could trust grandmother, didn't it? So what was this message about? He thought hard but couldn't come up with a good solution so he decided to try using his parrot mimicry talent. But this strange talent only angered the grandmother outside, with no other effect. Before he could react, there were those special knocking sounds from outside again. It was only then that Kim Zai Kun realized the danger, but it was too late. No matter how hard he covered his ears, it was no use. Soon after, he passed out with blood flowing from the seven holes in his head. The door was forced open, and grandmother appeared with a threatening look, cursing him as a fool turning towards me. At this time I was still lying on the bed, texting grandmother to prepare today's meal. Although she didn't reply, shortly after she came to my room door, saying she had cooked the dishes I requested and told me to open the door to take them. I was a bit surprised that she had finished preparing so quickly after I sent the text. Her speed was like lightning, but with delicious food ready, I didn't hesitate and got up to open the door. Just as I reached the door, that sudden knocking sound rang out again. What was going on? I had already gone to open the door. This strange sound didn't stop. With the third sound, I collapsed to the ground. Right as I fell in front of the mysterious door knocker, grandmother also came in, cursing me as a fool while shaking her head. But just as she stepped in, I stood up, joking that she must be cursing herself, as this fool was definitely the best way to address her. Seeing me stand up unharmed, grandmother was both shocked and angry, 
shouting that no one could survive her continuous door knocking. In fact, a few minutes ago, I had received a hint from the Long Nation authorities that grandmother was the one knocking on the door and had revealed herself. But I realized it couldn't be that simple, because before that, she had always played the role of a good person. Even if she was the villain, she couldn't reveal herself so easily, otherwise her previous actions would be meaningless. She could have stayed hidden, without needing to show her face. Why would she reveal herself after killing someone? There was only one possibility, that she was being impersonated by someone else to frame her. And among everyone, only my mother had not appeared yet. Surely only my mother could play this role. Faced with my sharp analysis, she was immediately stunned. She didn't expect me to see through her like that, but she thought that no matter what, I couldn't escape, so being exposed didn't matter. Then she started laughing loudly, revealing her true nature as her body began to deform. Soon after, the one impersonating my mother fully revealed her true form. But instead of being afraid, I was excited, because I had been talking so much to her just to pretend to be brave. Whether she was my mother or grandmother didn't matter to me. Want to fight me? Then I'll beat you until you have no life left first. After that, I took out the white bear and said I'd let it play. But because of the rule of infinite revival, I had to go easy, not kill her outright. Against the white bear's attack, that strange demon was completely helpless. In no time, it was sitting on the ground, begging for its life. Seeing it had collapsed, I withdrew the white bear. Realizing I had no intention to kill, it immediately crawled away, not daring to stay another second. From this, I could somewhat confirm that grandmother and younger brother were good people, while my parents and younger sister wanted to harm me. Still, I couldn't let my guard down with grandmother and younger brother. The world of rules was too dangerous, I needed further verification. Waking up on the third day, I realized no one had messaged me today. It seemed they had become more cautious, so it was time to go to the second floor and see. Heading up to the second floor, the first room was my younger sister's. Looking at the photo on the door, I saw my sister was very cute before being possessed by that demon. Inside the room, I found a note saying on her birthday, our parents took her out for a walk. I wonder if something happened during that walk? Finding no clues, I decided to check another room. The room with the double bed confirmed it was my parents' room. Looking at the bookshelf, I didn't expect that chubby father was once an avid reader. At this moment, a book unexpectedly caught my attention. Lousy's Defiance of Heaven. The title sounded so familiar. Opening it, half a photo fell out. What clue could this be? Why was the original family photo of six people now only half remaining? Had something bad happened? But the evidence was still not enough to confirm my suspicions. So I decided to check my younger brother's room. When I opened his room door, I was startled to see him tied tightly to a chair. His mouth stuffed with a cloth, unable to speak. Seeing me, he struggled, his expression pleading for me to save him. But I stood still. I told him to stay calm. I would ask a few questions, he could just nod or shake his head. After questioning him, I confirmed everyone's roles matched my thoughts. My younger brother was the one protecting me. While grandmother needed protection but could also harm me and my brother, like the ropes tying him were tied by her. Understanding everything, I untied my brother and gave him a doll to protect himself. With the doll's support, he would be safe. Then I went out alone. To find the remaining answers, I stepped outside. But as soon as I exited, I discovered new rules on the table. Rule 1. Grandmother is the one who loves you most. Always trust her. Rule 2. Do not set foot on the second floor, that is not a place you should appear. Rule 3. Do not believe your younger brother. Rule 4. Do not investigate her, you cannot go against her. Rule 5. The ultimate goal is to survive 5 days. You need not harbor any other hopes. Rule 6. Absolutely forbidden to enter any rooms on the second floor. Do not be curious about those rooms. Rule 7. Try to integrate with the family sincerely. After reading the rules, I thought, since I had already been to the second floor, rules 2 and 6 were clearly wrong. It was likely a ploy by the demon to prevent us from finding clues on the second floor. Emphasizing to fully trust grandmother from the start was clearly siding with her. As for my younger brother's words, it's possible the demon had controlled grandmother, who was originally good but would do bad things under its control. So my thoughts were clear. But with two days left in this world, I decided to keep quiet to avoid stirring up trouble. Meanwhile, the American candidate Grayson also happened to receive the new rules. He realized the second floor must have important clues to pass the level. So he decided to use his talent to explore it tonight. His talent was Night Shadow allowing him to control his shadow to go anywhere from 12 a.m. to 12 10 a.m. and bring back whatever he wanted. During his talent's activation, he was protected. At exactly 12 a.m., he controlled his shadow to go to the second floor and found half of the family photo. But as he was about to bring the half photo back, his parents suddenly appeared and discovered him. The result was predictable. 
The shadow was instantly swallowed, and Grayson's talent shield was completely shattered. So on the fourth day, it was an unusual day when parents and younger sister joined forces to attack. Most people couldn't withstand it and were eliminated, except for Andre who used the green frog balloon to attract attention, then snuck up to the second floor, entered the room and obtained the remaining half of the photo. On the fifth day, only four of us survived. Although it was the last day, while everyone was preparing to pass the level, I was typing messages continuously on my phone. Because my younger brother reported that he had stolen the other remaining half of the photo from grandmother's room, and that was the key to passing the level. He only hoped I wouldn't harm grandmother while dealing with her. This surprising message left me utterly astonished. I immediately promised not to harm her, as the rules emphasized that sincerity was the most important thing. I guessed that as long as I ensured grandmother's survival, it would be the perfect way to pass the level. With the principle of needing to get 5 stars, not 4, I had to protect her. I told my younger brother not to run around and went upstairs to find him and get the photo. Soon after, we met in his room. But when he gave me the remaining half of the photo, I was quite surprised to see my own picture on it too. Why was the family photo torn in half? Had something bad happened before? Seeing that I had forgotten everything, my younger brother patiently explained all that had occurred. A few years ago, this family was still happy. Grandmother was kind, parents loved life, younger brother was cared for by older brother and sister, living happily. But everything changed on sister's birthday. That day, parents took her out for a drive by car but had an accident. All three of them fell into the river and unfortunately passed away. That's why now the three of them have become demonic, like corpses soaked in water for a long time. As for grandmother, after hearing the news, unable to bear the mental shock, she became delusional. My older brother also became depressed, not speaking all day. Although grandmother eventually recovered, she still often mentioned our parents. Until one night, the three of them suddenly returned. But by then they had become very frightening. After they came back, grandmother tore the family photo in half. Though my younger brother didn't know the reason, he sensed that she did it perhaps to keep her parents around. Hearing the story, I realized how difficult the days my younger brother had gone through. I patted his head to comfort him, leaving the rest to me. Then I went back outside, determined to bring grandmother back safely. Meanwhile, Raj from Zambia went up to the second floor unprepared, without even finding half of the photo. Who knows what gave him such courage? The result was predictable. As soon as he opened grandmother's room door, his head immediately flew out. As for Grayson, he also failed to find all the pieces of the family photo. However, Grayson and my younger brother went to grandmother's room, hoping through the hints and the rules, using sincere words to make her let go of her obsession. But grandmother had completely lost control now, immediately transforming into a monster to attack them. Facing grandmother's assault, Grayson had no ability to fight back. When he thought he could hardly escape death, unexpectedly my younger brother rushed over, taking the fatal blow from grandmother meant for him. Seeing that, grandmother suddenly regained clarity, trembling and struggling to regain some consciousness, pointing at the mirror scolding herself for losing rationality and demanding her grandson back. But an even more horrifying thing happened. In the mirror appeared another grandmother looking exactly the same, smiling wickedly saying I am you, you are me. Facing the out-of-control grandmother, Grayson was too scared to move, unsure if he should try to escape now. But thinking that escaping would fail, he could only try to continue persuading grandmother. But as soon as she heard Grayson's voice, grandmother seemed to find an outlet for her anger, turning back with an eerie smile saying she could beat him too, so the whole family could still be together. Then she charged at Grayson with bloodshot eyes. Grayson closed his eyes in fear, thinking he was about to die when suddenly the level clear announcement sounded. Congratulations on clearing the family of 6 level, rating 2 stars. Special reward is support from the monster. Watching grandmother gradually disappear, Grayson joyfully realized he not only avoided being killed but also successfully cleared the level. It was truly beyond imagination. The audience outside was also dumbfounded, not understanding what had happened. Everyone analyzed that Grayson must have triggered the necessary conditions to clear the level, and his younger brother's sacrifice on the final day could have been one of those conditions. While Grayson cleared the level in an unimaginable way, Andre also brought his younger brother to meet grandmother. Similar to Grayson, after saying some meaningless words, grandmother also charged at Andre. But this time, his younger brother couldn't shield him, as Andre had already taken out the completed family photo and continued persuading grandmother to stop her obsession. He said he understood her efforts to keep the family together, 
but the deceased cannot be revived. His younger brother also pleaded with her, not wanting to lose her too. The photo and their sincere words finally awoke grandmother. She hugged the photo and cried uncontrollably, fully regaining her senses. She looked at her two grandchildren with satisfaction, saying with them, the family wouldn't fall apart. But she had to leave, unable to take care of them anymore. She hoped the two brothers would take care of each other. After patting her grandson's head, she began to bid farewell. Then she slapped herself, her body gradually disappearing. She was grandmother's obsession, born from the obsession and would also vanish when the obsession dissipated. At the same time grandmother disappeared completely. Andre also cleared the family of 6 level. For protecting his younger brother, his completion rating was higher at 4 stars. In addition to the basic reward of monster support, he also received 2 free passes. At the same time he cleared the level. Now I was the only one left in the challenge. At this point, I was leaving my parents and younger sister running around and shouting hurry up, hurry up. If you catch me, I'll do something bad. This humorous scene was completely opposite to Andre's touching atmosphere. After running two laps, I led my parents into grandmother's room under her bewildered gaze. This bizarre action left everyone completely confused. Seeing the opportune moment, I quickly threw out the negative emotional pollution source and hurriedly ran out of the room, locking the door. I planned to trap all of them inside to drive them insane. Although my younger brother worriedly asked if grandmother was in danger, I told him not to worry. After half an hour of silence, I knew it was time for me to take action. I told my younger brother to wait outside the door, then summoned the polar bear and dark general into the room with me. As expected, by now my parents had been defeated by grandmother. Though she defeated could not be revived. Although cruel for her to continue living, she had to face the pain of losing her loved ones again. After that, I continued persuading her to let go of her obsession. All of us have lost our dear ones, but it's the living that truly need you now. Please let go of the obsession, this family needs you, your grandson and younger brother need you too. But before I could finish, the demonic side regained control of grandmother, grabbing my neck. But I didn't react, because this small obsession couldn't harm me. My gift is not for decoration. But I didn't say that, only asking her if she had ever heard of sincerity. It indeed fell into the trap, thinking that grandmother's physical body restricted it, so it finally broke free. Shouting loudly now I've escaped this old body, no longer bound. Let's see how you deal with sincerity. But this time, it was caught off guard, as I rushed and slapped it twice. You've escaped grandmother's body yet still act ferociously, looking down on us as weak candidates? After hitting it, I coldly left it and went to hug grandmother up. Seeing grandmother, it harbored ill intentions again, wanting to attack her to make me fail. But before it could do anything, the dark general had pinned it against the wall. Now it was no longer ferocious, trembling and begging for its life as it and grandmother were one. Without it, she would struggle to live, but it forgot that it willingly left her. Without it, she would be better off. The reason I didn't resist when it grabbed my neck was to lure it out. Then seeing grandmother had completely let go of the obsession, she began bidding farewell to it. In her calm words, it could only vanish. Everything ended. I helped grandmother out the door. When the door opened, the familiar warm sunlight shone in. The familiar warm sunlight also illuminated the gloomy house. My younger brother cried loudly, running to hug grandmother tightly. In her hands, the family photo also miraculously changed, from six people to three people. Right after that, the sound of level clear notification rang out, when hurt, family is where you heal. When lost, family is the guiding light. Perhaps you haven't valued every family member, but it's their presence that makes a family warm and healing. Sincerity is always the precious medicine for families. Remember, family is irreplaceable, and no one can replace family. Congratulations on excellently completing the Family of Six Challenge. You have found the essence of family and helped everyone reunite. Special World Rating 5 Stars. Optional Rewards. Sincerity Instant Kill Skill or Demonic Source and 3 Free Passes. Sincerity Instant Kill Skill. When using sincerity to influence demons, they may be moved and confess sincerely. Demonic source, perhaps its special storage form. Be careful when using it if you don't want to stay in the demonic world forever. Three free passes, can use one pass to be exempted from being chosen for the demonic world next time. Hearing the notification, I immediately chose the sincerity instant kill skill. Then, a global notification sounded, exempting all three of our countries from the rule this time. 
After finishing, Andre and the leaders came to visit Dragon Country. At the same time, Andre and I also met for the first time. Although he was rewarded with monster support, I still advised him not to use it unless mentally prepared for the worst. Three days later, while Andre was enjoying his tour in Dragon Country, he entered the next challenge. On the full moon night of the mid-autumn festival, people usually like to eat mooncakes and admire the moon. But I advise you not to do that. Restrain your strong curiosity. No matter what you hear or see, you must remember not to look directly at the moon tonight. This is a level challenge for two people. There will be one hint from the outside world. Note, within one day, make sure you do not look directly at the moon. Avoid facing the moon by all means. Survive. My partner this time is Angola, the candidate from Africa. Not only was it his first time in the demonic world, but he only drew an S rank gift. So when he saw me, he clung tightly without letting go. I was about to slap him when the phone rang. Emergency alert. Tonight's moon viewing event is cancelled. Please stay indoors, close all doors and windows. No matter what you hear, do not open windows. Especially do not look at the moon. The moon viewing event is cancelled. We are cleaning up. Do not open doors. Your friends and loved ones may no longer be your friends and loved ones. Its infection rate is too fast. Before I could react, the third message with the rules appeared. To ensure safety. Please read the rules carefully. Rule 1. If you are home alone, cover the moon with black cloth. You must do this. Otherwise, I cannot guarantee your safety. Rule 2. No matter who invites you to view the moon, refuse immediately. Rule 3. If you hear strange scratching noises outside the door, do not curiously open the door to look. Do not leave home no matter what cries for help you hear. Rule 4. There is no moon tonight. Do not believe anyone describing the beauty of the moon. Rule 5. Friends and family will not text loving words to lure you outside. Refuse if they try to entice you like that. Rule 6. Do not reveal if there are people inside. If someone knocks on the door, stay silent, do not make any noise. Rule 7. If the door is not secure, gets broken. Prepare sunglasses immediately. Your home may no longer be safe. Rule 8. Inside the house is not safe. Rule 9. When going out, wear glasses, do not look up at the sky. Do not trust friends coming to pick you up. After reading the nine rules, I had a serious expression. Clearly something bizarre had happened outside. I told Angola to find glasses. He obeyed, quickly finding some in the drawer. I already had a protective gift and amber necklace, so glasses were useless. Just for looks. Then I pulled open the curtains, violating rule 1 and looked up at the strange moon in the sky. But as I was pondering, a few sudden messages interrupted. There were a few rules reminding to refuse moon viewing. I realized friends might have encountered issues. Since they harmed me first, don't blame me for being rude anymore. Then I composed a silly rhyming message and sent it. At this point, Angola carefully held the phone asking me how to respond. I took back the phone and started spewing out a rant like if you have the guts, don't text. Just come here directly. Seeing the sent message, Angola's eyes widened but I told him not to worry. I've got this. Meanwhile, Grayson from America and Kim Hu Tian from Kimchi Country also faced similar situations. But for messages from friends, Kim Hu Tian responded randomly like an idiot, completely disregarding the rules. Seeing this, Grayson angrily snatched the phone, scolding him not to drag others into his death wish. Perhaps used to being arrogant, Kim Hu Tian still wanted to retaliate but was no match for Grayson, getting punched and falling to the ground. Only then did Kim Hu Tian realize the situation, immediately changing his attitude, obediently going to find glasses as ordered by Grayson. Not long after, they received messages from loved ones, previously friends, now loved ones, clearly trying to lure them to respond. Grayson immediately switched to vibrate mode to ignore them. But at that moment, raspy moaning sounds came from outside the door. Unbelievably, Kim Hu Tian really lacked brains, yelling loudly wanting to go check out the loud noise. He surely wanted those outside to hear him a lot. This made Grayson extremely angry, kicking him down to the ground. But now it was too late, the doorknob was shaking, clearly something was trying to open the door. While they were in danger with the door, Angola and I also heard noises from outside. Seeing me still calm, Angola worried, thinking I was paralyzed with fear kept pulling me to pray to God. I glared at him through the glasses. Don't you know? We from Dragon Country are all steadfast atheist warriors. Then, ignoring Angola's obstruction, I stood up and approached the door. Angola tried to stop me but was scared into a corner by my gaze. When I opened the door, a twisted, bizarre head suddenly thrust in from outside. Angola panicked, falling flat on the floor. I knew it was time to show my real skills, so I turned and slapped that head, expecting a fierce battle. 
but unexpectedly something unplanned happened. The monster covered its face and cried. Then I continued slapping it a few more times to reinforce the impression, making it kneel and cry. The other vaguely faced monsters didn't understand what happened to it. They squeezed past it, rushing towards me. Since I had violated the rules, I was protected, so I wasn't afraid of these puny monsters. As I was about to roll up my sleeves and fight, suddenly that crying one stopped crying, stood up and shielded me. It charged at those other monsters, yelling loudly to never underestimate the bond of friendship. You scoundrels. Hearing that, I was dumbfounded, not knowing what was happening. Then it yelled loudly, don't underestimate the power of friendship. Then it charged into the vaguely visible group of monsters, fighting with them. Although its words were a bit cliche, it couldn't be denied that it was a kind-hearted monster. Since I didn't need to take action anymore, it was more convenient. So I closed the door. Looking at the horrified Angola beside me, I just said this is the power of emotion. Angola realized my power, collapsed to the ground apologizing for doubting my abilities. From now on, he will wholeheartedly follow me. At this time, the phone received a message. The Red Moon Purge plan failed. Reverting back to the initial state, the moon will soon return to normal. Then a dizzy spell hit. And when I woke up, Angola and I were sitting back on the sofa. Although earlier we were standing far from the sofa, now we were sitting here, checking the phone. The time had reverted to 001, while it was initially 0 hundred, meaning time didn't fully revert. What's the meaning of this one minute difference? But my thoughts were interrupted by a barrage of messages on the phone. Looking at them, I had a serious expression, realizing something had happened outside. At this point, supplementary rules were also sent. Rule 10. Normally no one knocks on the door. If you hear knocking, do not observe through the peephole. Rule 11. If someone outside claims to be your friend, do not open the door. They are not your friends. Rule 12. Absolutely do not go outside. Stay indoors no matter the situation. Rule 13. The moon is very scary. Avoid contact with the moon. Even moonlight is deadly. Rule 14. If home is no longer safe, go to the nearest shelter. The shelter lies within my heart. The five new rules clearly contradicted the previous ones. But as I was wondering if it was caused by the time reversal, knocking on the door sounded again. I stood up again and approached the door. To defy the rule, I peeked through the peephole instead of directly opening. But it was pitch black outside. Finding the peephole unusual. I didn't rush to open but yelled loudly asking who's there. Hearing the voice of Bullet Gang, the one who messaged inviting me to view the moon, I opened the door. Ah, oh, it's you, the one who invited me to watch the moon pole dance. I enthusiastically hugged Bullet Gang's shoulders, demanding he take me out to see the pole dance now. At this, Bullet Gang was stunned. Why is the script so unusual? But when he came to his senses, he saw I was ready to fight. He angrily charged at me. But I wasn't afraid, using the Uncle Six trick on me? I'll beat you into an egg. I fiercely punched and kicked Bullet Gang, living up to his name. My hands turned red but he still didn't surrender. Perhaps only slaps could reform him. Indeed, after a few slaps, he hugged my thighs, crying and apologizing. Seeing him cry bitterly, I said I would forgive him if he just danced a bit. My bizarre request made him surprised, not expecting me to have such a special interest. Minutes later, he began that twisting dance. This extraordinary scene made Angola break out in a cold sweat, completely puzzled about what was happening. Moreover where did the pole come from? While Angola and I were leisurely watching the pole dance, Hunter from England and Miguel from Portugal were arguing about the rights and wrongs of the rules. They heard noises from outside, one wanted to go check but the other thought according to the rules, staying indoors was safest. Then knocking sounded at the door, their bullet gang was about to show up. Hunter also dared to look outside like me, but was almost shocked to see a bloody eye staring into the door. Seeing Hunter's reaction, Miguel was also very startled, but didn't dare make a sound, hurriedly texting to ask Hunter what he saw. Hunter replied it might be a monster outside. The two stayed silent, it would leave soon. But not long after, the messages were pushed up by Bullet Gang who started sending threats to them. Hunter quickly warned Miguel the monster was very dangerous and the door could hardly stop it. As they were pondering how to deal with it, a suggestion from the outside world suddenly sounded. The two hurriedly turned back to see, in fact, at this point the monster had climbed to the third floor, about to break down the door and rush in. They panicked, not understanding how it climbed up to the floor. The two hurriedly searched for weapons to fight back with all their might. Seeing Hunter found two knives in the kitchen, they charged to slash at the monster. But hearing the commotion inside, Bullet Gang also started banging on the door. 
Facing the mysterious enemy, they didn't dare be careless. Hunter quickly used a chair to barricade the door. In the emergency, he also utilized his talented weapon, finding a baseball bat under the chair. When the door was broken down, Hunter immediately swung the bat straight at Bullet Gang's head, wanting to knock him away. But the surprise attack was easily blocked by Bullet Gang. After a few rounds, Hunter was struck down, about to have Bullet Gang's saliva drip into his mouth. Hunter desperately screamed for help from Miguel. At this point, Miguel had finished slashing the monster horde with a small knife. Hearing Hunter, he was startled to realize the Bullet Gang remained undealt with. Miguel bravely grabbed the bat and charged, striking Bullet Gang's head hard. This one collapsed to the ground. Even the audience outside was surprised by the two's coordination. Meanwhile, after enjoying the pole dance, I dragged Bullet Gang to the window and threw him thousands of miles away. Bullet Gang disappeared with a wretched scream. Hearing him fall, I turned back to find a few other monster creeps climbing in through the window. They didn't look like good folks. Since they sneak attacked, don't blame me. Then don't blame me for being cruel. After that, I took a clothes peg from the balcony and began a fun game of whacking mole with them. Just a few hits and they were screaming, jumping down below. Disappointed by the unprofessional rascals, I took my phone to pester other friends, saying there were monsters at home and I needed help. Only one person named Great Wisdom responded that he would come rescue me right away. This surprised me. Looking at the normal message content, it wasn't monsters but ordinary people. Then the suggestion from the outside world came. The Red Moon Purge failed. Time would rewind for the third time and we returned to the initial state of the game, but this time it was 12.02, the time increasing by one minute. The constant rewinds left Angola very confused. He asked me puzzled, but with so few clues in the house, I couldn't determine the situation clearly either. I decided to go out and check, then hurried knocking sounded at the door again. According to Rule 11, if anyone outside claims to be a friend, don't believe it, as they are not friends. But being rebellious, I still opened the door. Outside was great wisdom, looking very ordinary. He wore sunglasses with a worried expression, telling me to put on glasses and follow him immediately. The red moon was approaching, the celestial dog devouring the moon. But Angola kept reminding me, Angola kept reminding me that many rules said not to go outside. This person seemed suspicious, definitely had ill intentions. I originally planned to go out to find clues, so I ignored his words. Seeing my determination to leave, Angola didn't dare stay home alone, panicking and running after me. At this time, under the influence of the red moon, people on the street had lost control. Some were eating each other, some were worshipping the moon. The bizarre scene made the timid Angola break out in a cold sweat. He unconsciously clung close to me, asking where we were going. Hearing great wisdom explain we were going to the funeral home, Angola's legs went weak, saying there was still a chance to be saved, no need to cremate right away. His timid attitude annoyed me. Fortunately, great wisdom explained the funeral home was a shelter, just to rescue us, so he felt reassured. As soon as we arrived, great wisdom handed me a paper with the rules of the funeral home written on it. By entering, we automatically became employees. So we needed to follow the rules for employees. 1. The main task of employees is to push corpses into the crematorium. During that process, don't ask too many questions. 2. If the corpse doesn't burn, talks, or twists and turns, report it to security immediately. Don't handle it alone. 3. Don't use the telescope in the lab unless necessary. 4. Don't bow towards any particular direction or discuss any strange phenomena that may cause them to appear. 5. Prohibited from entering the funeral home director's office. 5. If needing to enter the office for work, ensure there are others inside. 6. Throughout the work process, always wear specialized glasses. If your body shows abnormal signs, go to the evolution room immediately. 7. Keep work matters confidential. Don't tell friends or family about work content to avoid consequences. 8. All employees have lost the chance to enjoy the mid-autumn festival. Your dedication will be remembered by everyone. There were only 8 rules for employees. As soon as I finished reading, Great Wisdom's voice rang out from the front. It's here. Hurry and leave this place. We looked up to see the moon blazing red. Soon after, a black shadow swallowed the moon whole. Is this the celestial dog devouring the moon? Angola only looked at the moon for a moment before starting to twitch strangely. Seeing that, I slapped him hard on the head to break the spell. But suddenly I felt my mind go hazy for a moment. Looking back, the moon had returned to normal. Perhaps the celestial dog devouring the moon caused the time rewind. But this time after rewinding, we didn't return to the starting point. 
I realized the funeral home might be where the time rewind is executed, so we weren't affected. As I was analyzing with Angola, an employee resembling great wisdom pushed a corpse over to us, requesting we push it to be cremated. To protect my talent, I couldn't follow the rule, so I pushed this dangerous task onto the faraway hiding Angola, saying that I would supervise from the side, in case the corpse ran away then he'd have to chase after it. My words left Angola completely confused. Angola only knew how to work seriously. Bored, I took out my phone to message Bullet Gang to see if he had gone cold yet. Seeing Bullet Gang didn't reply, I sighed, it seems he had really passed away. Being a zombie but unable to endure, how pathetic. But suddenly Angola screamed in horror, the corpse is moving. The horrifying moon face game. Bullet Gang has been revived. Actually, after entering the funeral home, I decided not to follow rule 1, pushing all the dangerous work onto Angola, but unexpectedly the corpse moved. According to rule 2, in this case, security must be reported immediately, handling it alone is prohibited. But I didn't do that. Making a fuss over such a small thing? It's just a twitching corpse. Let me handle it. But as I approached to slap it, the corpse suddenly sat up. It turned out to be Bullet Gang who I had thrown down from the previous floor. I hurriedly supported him, reassuring that jumping from the third floor like that, Look, his arms were all broken. Seeing me, Bullet Gang became even more excited, even tearing up, shouting loudly, Why is it you again? It seems he wasn't happy to see me. Then I had to explain our relationship clearly. Now I'm an employee of the funeral home, specializing in cremation. Since we're friends, I'll waive the fee for you this time. Hearing that, Bullet Gang screamed and struggled, but I pinned him down saying I had just invented a natural rotating cremation method. As a friend, you have to let me try it first. Joking with a zombie to this extent is really tasteless, but Bullet Gang couldn't do anything to me either. Even Angola watching this scene broke out in a cold sweat, not knowing who was more terrifying. Next, I tied up Bullet Gang like a roast pig on the bed, then happily sprinkled all sorts of seasonings on him. I didn't know where these things came from, but that's how comics are drawn. Meanwhile, Grayson and Rich Kim were also brought to the funeral home by great wisdom, but his sudden disappearance made Rich Kim feel this place was very strange, thinking it was a trap and wanting to flee. But Grayson immediately stopped him, because he had used his talent to investigate and confirm the funeral home was normal. To be precise, this place was like a secret base, with everyone inside participating in the Red Moon plan to ensure the normal moon. As long as the moon was stable, the candidates could pass the round safely. But for some reason, Rich Kim, he read aloud the strange incantation people on the street were chanting, rotten flesh swallow greedily, revere the soul, in the dark night I believe in you. This action left Grayson stunned. Coming to his senses, he slapped Rich Kim, scolding him for almost dying due to his foolish indoor actions, and now doing these crazy things. Although the incantation was cut off, it might have been too late. Under their horrified gaze, the corpses in front of them began to move and stand up. Grayson immediately abandoned the troublemaker Rich Kim, turning to run for his life. Rich Kim's slow wits made him react slower, so he was caught by the newly revived zombies. The predictable outcome, he was torn apart by them immediately. At the same time, the system announced, candidate Rich Kim devoured by monsters. The bizarre world is about to descend, the countdown begins. Back to me, at this point I was ordering polar bear and tangled to roast the meat into a big feast. The bizarre scene left the newly arrived funeral home employees stunned, not understanding who I was to come up with such an outrageous act. A bright smile looked terrifying to them. They shouted some filthy thing had snuck in here and turned to flee. Seeing them bring more corpses, I also wondered, these undead bodies had clearly died stiff. Why were they still being taken for cremation? Could they be revived, related to the incantation people were chanting outside? To find the answer, I had to investigate, so I read the incantation aloud. Sure enough, the undead bodies in front immediately revived. This made Angola scared, hesitantly asking me what to do now but I told him not to worry. I would summon General Blackie to protect him, then I ran off. The Red Moon devouring was becoming increasingly severe. The method of rewinding time was gradually becoming useless. Actually, after reading that incantation, all the corpses revived. I had General Blackie protect Angola, then ran straight to the research room to observe this strange moon through the telescope. According to Rule 3, no one was allowed to use the telescope arbitrarily. 
Angola was about to stop me according to the rules, but then slapped himself. It seems he had completely trusted my abilities now. The research room was on the second floor of the funeral home. I quickly arrived and found the observation diary on the desk. From these notes, it could be seen that time had been rewound many times. And the three words devour, revere, and red appeared frequently. I realized this could be the cause of the large number of undead. And this funeral home was likely a secret organization, continuously using the time rewind method to prevent, or at least prolong, the impending disaster with the moon. Observing the moon through the telescope, I saw it had turned red again. The devoured part seemed like a living creature. Only the funeral home director would know the actual situation. So I went straight to the director's office. But before I could go far, I saw the moon starting the deep red devouring phenomenon again. The interval getting shorter and shorter. It seemed the time rewind method could no longer be maintained. I quickly increased my speed. Along the way, I ordered Tangle and Polar Bear to take down the undead blocking the path. The two accomplished this excellently, clearing the obstacles for me to proceed towards the director's office. Seeing me appear, everyone in the room was surprised. But the director calmly said he had been observing me for a long time. I must be very curious about their work. But to know, I would have to join, and the condition was to be ready to sacrifice at any time. Finally, he asked if I had enough courage. Initially, I didn't want to join, but his words made me want to try. I wondered what danger this bizarre world could pose to take my life. After I confirmed my choice, the director led me inside. The interior was completely different from the funeral home exterior. This was the real research room. The director explained everything. Every mid-autumn festival, the moon is devoured by a strange creature. Every mid-autumn, the moon also appears round like in the real world. But this time, the moon suddenly exhibited a strange phenomenon. A creature appearing from nothingness affected the moon. This creature is called the devourer. That's what I saw through the telescope. And it was the devourer that caused the phenomenon of people turning into zombies. To stop the monster, they must eliminate the devourer. The director pointed to a universe simulation chamber and explained the solution. Inside, it simulated the moon and everything on it. If they could destroy that creature in there, they had the ability to transfer all the data to the real moon. It sounded simple, so I immediately wanted to try it. But the director warned that they had failed many times, and if you died in the simulation chamber, it was real death. Instead of being afraid, I became even more interested. It had been a long time since I played such an exciting game. I eagerly pulled Polar Bear and Tangle into the simulation chamber. The director was touched, thanking me regardless of the outcome. Then he pressed the activation button. Actually, right after the director pressed the button, I was immediately transported to the simulated moon's surface. The space was identical to the real moon, except there was no loss of gravity. Not long after, a red sandstorm rushed towards me. As the storm approached, I realized it wasn't sand but a strange creature. These creatures with dog-like heads and human bodies were the devourers. They did look quite bizarre, but now was not the time to pay much attention. I immediately summoned Polar Bear to attack. Meanwhile, the other candidates also came to the director's office. But unlike me, although the director actively invited them into the simulation chamber, most considered it too dangerous and refused. Faced with the choice of potentially sacrificing themselves at any time, they preferred to strive for survival rather than take the challenge. Only Grayson didn't intend to wait for death, agreeing to the director's request and bravely entering the simulation chamber. Through the director's hints, Grayson understood that to restore the moon to normal, he must find the devourer's origin. But when he asked what the origin was, the director hesitantly replied that they didn't know either, and could only rely on Grayson's intuition. This made Grayson angry. Clearly, he had been tricked onto the ship. But now it was too late to turn back, and as soon as he protested, the director pressed the transfer button. When the machine started up, Grayson opened his eyes on the simulated moon's surface. The director's tactics infuriated him. He thought there was a detailed plan, but instead was told to search on his own. But before he could complain, the dog-headed creatures rushed at him. Grayson had no ability to resist, only running in panic. But how could he escape? Quickly being caught and falling miserably. What a pity to die in battle without cleansing himself first. The outside spectators unanimously sympathized with Grayson. But the system didn't give the usual elimination notification. Could he really have been eliminated? But when returning to the funeral home, under the director's lead, all the funeral home staff were armed as if Grayson's failure had shattered their hopes. Moreover, the ability to rewind time was now almost useless. 
they only had one last desperate attempt at fighting. Next, under the gaze of countless spectators, the director led all the funeral home staff into the simulation chamber. Quickly, they faced off against the devourers. As the fierce battle unfolded, the funeral home staff were quickly overwhelmed, surrounded. Knowing the funeral home couldn't hold out, the director decided to press the destruction button. After a massive explosion, the simulated moon's surface became peaceful again. It's unclear how long after, the sound of a ringing phone echoed. Grayson woke up, his face bewildered. He had died earlier, how was he alive again? As he became more lucid, Grayson hurriedly checked his phone. The current time was even later than when he entered the bizarre world. Reading messages from friends, Grayson gradually understood. Perhaps time had been completely rewound, everyone was alive again, and the moon threat had been successfully resolved. At this point, the system also notified Grayson that he had completed the level. Not only that, for voluntarily going to the simulated moon, his rating increased by two stars, up to three stars. However, since wealthy Kim had failed, Grayson had to complete it himself, so he only got three stars. At the same time, the other candidates also luckily completed this first double level. Everyone was surprised at such a high completion rate. Meanwhile, I was still unaware that they had passed the level. While I was still battling the devourers, seeing Polar Bear nearly exhausted, I was about to send Tangled to support when the phone rang. It was the director calling to urgently warn that only by eliminating the origin could we stop the devourers, otherwise they would keep appearing endlessly. When I asked how to find the origin, the director gave the same answer as Grayson, to rely on intuition. I was disappointed again, the story was exactly the same, but I couldn't foolishly rely on intuition. I turned to ask Tangle, and unsurprisingly, Tangle could sense the source of the devourer's emergence. I immediately called Polar Bear, and under Tangle's guidance, we rushed towards the origin. Thanks to Tangle and Polar Bear clearing the way, we soon arrived at an even stranger place, shrouded in a mysterious red. Before me was a huge, bizarre tree. Sure enough, this tree was creating the devourers, at an astonishingly rapid pace. It was truly an unintentional production machine. As I was about to move in and destroy it, the tree suddenly spewed black smoke engulfing me. But the seawater necklace didn't react, so I thought this wasn't a spiritual influence or pollution. Perhaps it was an illusion, and to approach the tree, I had to dispel it first. I took out the pollution mirror and dispelled all obstacles. But just as I was about to order Polar Bear and Tangle to attack, the tree began rotting away on its own. The devourers also plucked out their own eyes. Before I could react, the fallen eyes gradually merged into one giant eye, staring intently at me. The devourers then knelt down, bowing their heads. Rotten flesh devourer, worshipping soul, in the dark night I trust in you. I watched this strange scene with astonishment, never expecting this to be the true form of the devourers. In fact, after finding the devourers' origin but before I could do anything, they had already transformed, merging into one giant, ferocious eye charging at me. Whatever it was, I still threw Polar Bear to attack, but unexpectedly, Polar Bear was no match at all, immediately getting caught by the giant eye upon attacking. The last time I faced such a powerful monster was when using the Godly Mountain Realm to boost Tangle's attributes. And after receiving the Godly Mountain's power for the first time, Tangle also began transforming. Tangle's short legs gradually lengthened, changing from a small creature into a giant. But even the Godly Mountain enhanced Tangle couldn't do anything against that terrifying eye. I realized the power was definitely being continuously supplied by the worshipping of the undead bowing before it. Meanwhile at the funeral home, the director observed observing the situation also realized this. He analyzed that those undead were reflections of the worshipping crowd outside. As long as the worshipping act outside was eliminated, its power could be weakened. So the director ordered the staff to go back in time at any cost. Before the worshipping began, with the staff's desperate efforts, time was finally rewound. When the power of faith disappeared, the kneeling, praying devourers began to rot away. Realizing the funeral home staff had taken action, I ordered Polar Bear and Tangle to launch their final desperate attacks. After the giant eye was completely destroyed, I was transported back to the start of the level. The message from the funeral home on my phone also reassured me that the moon crisis had been completely resolved. As I opened the curtains to see the bright full moon outside, the system also notified me that I had completed the six-star red moon. The reward for this completion was the red eye and the silent employee medal. The red eye can only be used on monsters. Combining it with a monster will allow them to create faith. The silent employee medal allows a one-time five-second time rewind and can only be kept for one level. 
truly, two rewards worthy of six stars. I gave the red eyed to Tangle and let my companion share it. Tangle and Dark General had already evolved, so they voluntarily let Polar Bear have it. After swallowing the eye, Polar Bear's power was enhanced. Thus, all three of my bodyguards had upgraded twice. The seven participating countries also escaped the anomaly rules. After returning to the real world, I lost my previous enthusiasm, as I had to prepare for the next anomaly level. Three days later, I was again transported into the anomaly world on time. This time it was the psychiatric hospital. It was still a duo challenge with someone from the same country, but unlike before, we had to find our partner this time. The partner would be a random character. Reading the level description, I realized this wouldn't be simple. The process of finding a partner would definitely face obstacles. If we could just ask anyone, it would be too easy. But as I was thinking, a hand suddenly patted my shoulder from behind. You must be the new doctor, right? Turning around, it was a giant wearing a pig mask and a white lab coat. I figured it was to increase the difficulty of finding a partner. Though I couldn't see others' faces, I wasn't wearing a mask. My partner could still come find me. But I knew the anomaly world wouldn't be that simple, there must be more traps. With no other clues, I had to cooperate with him for now, observing carefully before deciding. He introduced himself as Wong Depart, and after a brief introduction, handed me the doctor's rules and led me to the office. Could he be the partner I needed to find? But I didn't rush to conclusions, instead following and carefully observing the hospital's rules. As a doctor, fulfill your responsibilities despite the difficulties. Always treat patients with patience. 2. It is strictly forbidden to leave the workplace during working hours. If caught by the director, you will be severely punished. 3. Take your medication on time and give patients their medication on time to stabilize both parties' moods. 4. If a patient makes an excessively strange request, the doctor may ignore or leave them. 5. It is forbidden to enter patients' rooms at night while on duty. If you hear screaming, call a nurse. Do not enter alone. 6. Most nurses in the hospital are female. If you see a male nurse, remain calm. 7. Do not talk to temporary workers. They are untrustworthy. They may lure you into making wrong decisions. 8. No matter what threats patients make, do not panic, as that will make them more dangerous. 9. If you see a patient or nurse enter the restroom after 12 midnight, lock the door and hide from their sight. 10. Absolutely do not use the elevator. The hospital only has three floors, no basement. 11. If you see a patient room named severe patient, immediately run away. Do not open the door or listen to any sounds from inside. After reading, I saw the last line printed in blood red. Don't trust the female nurses. Only the male nurses are trustworthy. Don't take their medication. They're trying to control your thoughts and actions. Clearly this was written in a hurry. Someone wanted to help me, but who? After leading me into the office, the doctor told me to familiarize myself with the workplace, saying my tasks would be notified later, then left. I summoned Dark General and inspected the office, looking for clues about the hospital's secrets, but I found nothing unusual except for the strangely placed mirror on the desk. Out of curiosity, I picked it up and looked into it. Instead of seeing my handsome face, the reflection showed a raccoon-faced figure. I suddenly realized others would only see a mask when looking at me, so my partner couldn't find me on their own. Moreover, this strange mask seemed permanently attached to my face. This hospital level was definitely not simple. It seemed finding my partner could only happen gradually. Meanwhile, Zhou Ming, another candidate from my country, was also troubled by this mask. Although he knew I was his partner from the same country, he couldn't identify me, so he could only worry and study the rules, hoping to find useful clues. Back to me, Wang Depart had returned to the office with two bottles of pills. He said the blue pills were for me, and the red ones were for the patients. I had to go to the first floor to give the patients their medication at 9 p.m. But I asked him back what the effects of the two types of pills were and the consequences if taken incorrectly. Wong Depart seemed surprised, looking at me strangely, then said they were both sedatives. If I wanted to take the red ones, he wouldn't stop me. But he insisted I take the blue ones in front of him. I was perfectly normal. I didn't need sedatives but he kept insisting, saying anyone entering the hospital would be affected, so I must take it in front of him, so I would make him take it first to see if it was poisonous. I shoved the blue pill into his mouth. After being forced to swallow it, he cursed me for trying to kill my partner. Hearing that, I laughed strangely. So taking the blue pill would drive one insane. I patted his shoulder to reassure him it was just candy, but immediately Dark General swallowed him from behind. I looked at Dark General with satisfaction. Truly a wonderful harmonious partner for me. But the familiar voice rang out again 
and I turned to see another pig-headed man holding pills of Pierre. I asked if he had a twin brother, but he blankly didn't understand what I meant. Looking at his name tag, this was Lou Depart, not Wong Depart from earlier. I understood. These pig heads didn't have infinite respawns like the six mouths, but when one was defeated, another would replace him. So I slapped this new one. The sudden action startled him, covering his face and screaming. Seeing no effect, I kept slapping him until he knelt begging for his life before stopping. But seeing that, I was also puzzled. His reaction was clearly fear, not insanity. Meaning my demon slaying slaps had no effect. He probably wasn't a monster, but a human. But he had the ability to respawn, so he definitely wasn't my partner. So besides monsters and candidates, there were other people in this hospital. After thinking it over, I threatened to keep him in the office. This one is useless, no need to waste time. I locked him up and went to find my partner and the hospital's secret. According to Rule 3, I went down to the first floor to give the patients their medication, looking for any clues. I didn't take the medicine myself, not violating the rules. As soon as I entered the first floor patient room, I saw a patient grab a broom and charge at me, swinging it at my head, but I remained calm, took out the pill bottle and told him to take it. He obediently stopped upon hearing medicine. But the falling broom accurately hit a sensitive area of the person next to me, nearly ruining everything. When he screamed demanding the medicine, I said there was none left today. Seeing me provoking him, the patient became completely unreasonable, yelling that he would break my neck. According to Rule 4, I should have ignored and left immediately. But I didn't do that, instead summoning Dark General to swallow him. But as I stepped out of the room, I saw the guy the first had hit earlier waiting outside the door. Seeing me, he approached and secretly handed me a piece of paper. Then he silently left with a strange gate. Opening it, there were a few small lines reminding me. I remembered under the rules someone had also written secret hints. So besides me and my partner, there were others helping us in the hospital. But who? Could it be the patient from earlier? If patients can help, then this level is too simple. It would only take half a day to complete. Moreover, as soon as I started looking for clues about my partner, a patient jumped out to help. Too coincidental. I feel the strangeness of this level seems to understand the human mind. So I had Dark General swallow the note, then went on to the next patient room. But as soon as I opened the door, I saw a shocking sight. In front of me was someone identical to me, from the face to the fake Dark General, exactly the same. This was unacceptable, daring to impersonate me. Let's see what you're capable of. I ordered Dark General to tear them apart immediately. Dark General didn't hesitate, charging to bite and kill the fake teddy dog. Seeing that, the fake panda faced me immediately fled. I couldn't let it escape, so I had White Bear tie it up. Meanwhile, Dark General had mercilessly torn apart the fake dog. But White Bear reported back that the impersonator of me had disappeared. I realized the monsters were becoming more dangerous. Not only impersonating me but also Dark General. If my partner suddenly encountered Dark General, they wouldn't suspect anything since Dark General was so familiar. I had to find my partner as soon as possible to avoid this danger. I used Lou Depart's ID to go incognito and escape. But as I left the room, I encountered a monkey-headed guy wearing a director's badge in the hallway. Seeing his shiny bald head, I couldn't resist and slapped the back of his neck hard. Before he could react, I put my arm around his shoulder and said, Baldy, I've been looking for you for so long. Has the bald head treatment been successful? But he pushed me away, pointed at his badge and yelled that he was the director, not any baldy. I apologized, saying I had the wrong person. Seeing my sincerity, Director Monkey didn't say anything more. Seeing no one paying attention, he turned and continued his patrol. But after just a few steps, I charged and slapped the back of his neck again. Director Monkey turned around, and seeing it was me again, he completely lost his composure, ready to retaliate. But what could he do to me? I was used to slapping people. I quickly rushed at him before he could react, then ran for my life as he angrily yelled and chased me downstairs. When we reached the lobby, he saw a panda-faced guy who looked like me, the same impersonator from before. But the director didn't know, so he drew a scalpel and charged, yelling he would operate on me today. Meanwhile, I had returned to the room, switching to Lou Depart's ID to go incognito. At this time, Revolver, the water candidate, also came to the patient room according to the rules. But before he could enter, a crazy patient suddenly rushed out and used the monkey steals peach technique on him. Revolver was completely caught off guard, 
so he was hit by the technique and collapsed in pain. But thinking that everyone was watching the live stream, he still tried to raise his head and ordered the patient to return to the room. But the patient completely ignored him, even kicking revolver away and playing around as if riding a horse. This scene infuriated the water authorities, scolding that every time they drew lots, they got these weirdos, ordering to raise public awareness to avoid such foolish actions. Not only did Revolver encounter the monkey steals Peach, but Angola from the Fire Nation was also similarly attacked. But since he followed me, he easily avoided it and even slapped the patient in return. At first, Angola thought after being hit, the patient would be scared and obedient, but he didn't know his slap had no exercising effect. Next, a group of patients rolled up their sleeves, yelling they would teach him a lesson. Seeing the crowd, Angola could only yield. But instead of being beaten, the following scene shocked him. All the patients took off their pants, revealing their colorful underwear in front of him. So that's what they meant by teaching a lesson. It was then that Angola took out the medicine to distribute. After taking it, they gradually became lethargic. This reaction made Angola ponder. If the red pill had that effect, then the green one must be similar. But as he was worrying, he suddenly felt his spirit resonate. When he came to, he saw the patients were sound asleep. He realized the red pill had a sedative effect. But Angola clearly felt he had forgotten something he was thinking about. Meanwhile, in another patient room, Grayson, now a patient, was also forced to take the red pill. But after the doctor left, he immediately stuck his finger in his mouth and vomited the medicine out. This action was witnessed by the other patients in the room. One of them even chuckled and approached Grayson closely. Grayson understood he couldn't reveal his identity, so he struck first, kicking the guy away in front of everyone. Grayson pretended to be crazy, yelling how dare you mock me, you're not insane, no one in your family is insane. Seeing this, the others weren't scared but applauded Grayson's words, proudly embracing their mental conditions. At this point, Grayson didn't dare object, only sweating and continuously agreeing. The guy who was kicked down slowly got up, thinking Grayson was truly insane, so he also let his guard down. He mocked Grayson in front of everyone, saying his illness was severe, unlike him, completely normal. Just a spy stain here. Hearing this, Grayson was also surprised, but he realized it could be true, because the hospital couldn't solely rely on medicine to control all patients. It's very possible this guy was a doctor planted by the hospital to monitor them. Around midnight, when everyone was asleep, Grayson noticed him sneaking out. Not long after, there was a knock on the door, and a chicken-headed doctor appeared, requesting Grayson to come out and answer some questions. At this point, Grayson was also worried. He might have reported Grayson to the doctor. Although very reluctant, he had no other choice. According to the patient rules he received, he had to immediately comply with whatever the doctor requested. Otherwise he would witness their true terrifying nature. So he didn't dare violate them, only pretending to be insane as he went out. But instead of interrogating him, the doctor pulled him aside to a secluded corner, saying he knew Grayson was Lucas, his American teammate. Grayson shook hands with him but remained cautious. However, Grayson still didn't fully trust him, so he pretended to ask how the doctor knew his identity. The answer made him startled. It was indeed revealed by that guy. But the doctor said he was the first one to find Grayson, which was completely illogical. If that guy was truly a spy, when reporting, he wouldn't find a strange doctor. The more Grayson thought about it, the more suspicious it seemed. He immediately withdrew his hand and continued pretending to be insane. Grayson's acting skills were truly excellent. He yelled incoherently and ran back to the room under the doctor's angry gaze. Back in the room, Grayson finally breathed a sigh of relief. Whether the doctor believed him or not, he had temporarily escaped danger. Back to me, I was looking at the dead body of the panda-faced guy with a smug smile. My plan to kill using the surprise knife attack was truly perfect. Not only did the director help me eliminate the impersonator, but I also kept my identity intact. After that, I continued to inspect the rooms. But after just a few steps, a crazy patient suddenly rushed out to block my path. According to Rule 8, I should not panic in the face of a patient's threatening behavior. For me, this was just a minor incident. Not only did I not panic, but I even turned around and slapped him. Unfortunately, he was struck by my exercising slap, crying and apologizing to me. Seeing him cry until exhausted, I was about to summon the black general for eternal rest, but he screamed in terror, 
refusing to be dissected, and then suddenly exploded. I was utterly surprised by this. A monster here? Not just me. Even the black general was completely baffled looking at the pile of bones on the ground, not understanding what had happened. In previous levels, monsters had never self-destructed like this before. Could it be that patient was eliminated right after saying he couldn't be dissected because he had unintentionally revealed something? Moreover, the other patients in the room seemed to have witnessed nothing. The dissection part really seems to be an important clue. Meanwhile, Zhou Ming also followed the doctor's instructions, going to inject sedatives into the patients, but as soon as he entered the room, a patient suddenly approached him, said something, and slyly handed him a piece of paper. Zhou Ming was startled and quickly made an excuse to go outside and look. The two words doctor on the paper made him extremely excited. It turned out that patient had said there was a doctor who told them they didn't need to take the medicine anymore and deliberately emphasized the two words doctor. The act of disobeying orders and not allowing patients to take medicine, Zhou Ming believed could only be me. So he swallowed the paper and ran to look for me in the patient rooms ahead. Sure enough, after a few rooms, he found me with the black general. Being an admirer of mine, Zhou Ming couldn't contain his excitement and ran over. But my reaction made him doubtful. In his impression, I was very cautious and wouldn't confirm an identity with just a few words. Zhou Ming was very smart. He looked down at the black general and began casual conversation. Then he even knelt down and called the black general. Hearing the call, the black general happily ran over to him. This further reinforced Zhou Ming's view. He immediately kicked away that fake teddy dog, then pointed at the panda-faced guy scolding that the black general wasn't a dog who would wag his tail ingratiatingly to anyone. How dare you impersonate my brother? But the panda-faced guy seemed not the slightest bit worried about being recognized by Zhou Ming, because he had also identified Zhou Ming's identity. Next, a hand slowly emerged from his chest. Zhou Ming knew he couldn't escape, so he screamed and struggled. But this was his first time participating in the level. No match for the monster. He was quickly grabbed by the panda-faced guy's third hand around his neck, lifted up. At this moment, the real black general appeared, countless tentacles rushing to strike the panda-faced guy away and rescue Zhou Ming. He also appeared at this moment, shouting loudly this Lu Dukat hates the most those with three hands oppressing the two-handed people. Hearing that, the panda-faced guy also looked puzzled, thinking I was supposed to be inspecting other rooms. I explained that I had anticipated the impersonator knocked away by the director would reappear, just like Wang Dukat became Lu Dukat. So I deliberately set up this situation to lure him out, and also have him verify my teammate's identity. Hearing this, the panda-faced guy became enraged, thrusting out his third hand to threaten to eliminate both of us. But I was not like Zhou Ming, for such a weakling who couldn't even fight back against the black general to dare look down on me. In less than a round, the black general had completely overwhelmed him. I also took the opportunity to slap him two more times. Under the effect of the exercising slaps, the panda-faced guy knelt on the floor, sincerely repenting I should not have personally sent them to the dissecting table, should not have taken over other people's bodies. I realized what he said could be related to the hospital's secret. I told Zhou Ming to protect himself, leaving everything here to me, seeing he was no longer useful. I ordered the black general to take action, swallowing him whole. Witnessing me easily defeat the monster, Zhou Ming became even more admiring. He began a stream of praises towards me like flowing water, but I immediately cut him off. Although I really enjoyed hearing it, the current situation was urgent. Zhou Ming had just violated the rule of abandoning his job, and I was worried he would run into trouble. So I exchanged my ID card with him so he could investigate anonymously, saying I would contact him if needed. I reminded him again not to violate any more rules since he currently lacked the strength to deal with monsters. But still not feeling at ease, I summoned the white bear to protect Zhou Ming. This action moved him deeply. Having a high-level monster as a bodyguard was unimaginable. Meanwhile, the French hunter, playing the role of a nurse, had confirmed her identity with a doctor from her homeland. But the doctor suggested that the hunter and she eliminate the patients, believing they had overheard their conversation. Although the hunter hesitated due to the rules, she couldn't resist the doctor's persuasion, and finally agreed to that decision. Then the initial incident occurred. The foolish hunter followed the setup, going alone into the patient room and eliminating all the patients. But when she had finished killing and was about to ask for the next step, the doctor removed her mask, revealing the true form of a monster. 
It turned out the hunter's teammate had been eliminated in a similar way, luring the remaining one to violate the rules under the guise of a teammate, so the monster could completely eliminate them. Only then did the hunter realize she had been deceived, but it was too late. She was quickly impaled through the chest by the monster's third protruding hand. Along with the system's notification, in less than half a day, two powerful nations had been eliminated in succession. Back on my side, Director Monkey was looking for Zhou Ming who had violated the rules in the canteen. After a while, he saw me wearing Zhou Ming's ID card, but I was no longer the panda-faced guy, but had suddenly become the Great Eagle. No matter how frantically that person explained, the director remained adamant in his disbelief, dragging him to see something valuable. Although Zhou Ming temporarily escaped danger, I was curious about the treasure the director mentioned. At 7 p.m., it was time for the hospital's regular inspection. Nurse Shui Fen hurriedly came and asked me to join in inspecting the patients. But according to Rule 2, employees cannot leave their work positions without permission, or they will be severely punished if caught by the director. I directly refused Shui Fen's request. Not only that, when I heard her planning to report to the director, I chased her away, threatening consequences if she disturbed my rest again. But she kept blabbering threats to report to the director. Angered, I walked up and slapped her twice. Being hit, Shui Fen didn't expect me to dare use force. Crying and running off to accuse me to the director, calling for my dismissal for being inhumane. I secretly rejoiced as everything went according to plan. A few minutes later, Shui Fen reached the director's office to accuse me, hearing I was so defiant. Director Monkey became furious, immediately leading Shui Fen to find me. But at this time, my office was empty. The director was already very angry, and seeing I was absent made him even more enraged, shouting why I was abandoning my job. He said he would immediately inspect the patient room, and if he found me there, Shui Fen would be dead for sure. And the result was that they saw me carefully inspecting the patients there. Director Monkey felt his intelligence was insulted, angrily asking Shui Fen why. Shui Fen also had a puzzled look, as she didn't understand why. Earlier I had said I wouldn't inspect the room, and even hit her when she advised against it, yet here I was now. She really couldn't comprehend me. Seeing them arrive, I added fuel to the fire, saying I had been looking for the director everywhere, as there were many tasks needing his help. Hearing this, Director Monkey completely lost it, thinking Shui Fen was provoking him. He dragged Shui Fen out, shouting that he would punish her. Seeing this, I immediately summoned a puppet to monitor where the director would take those who made mistakes. After arranging everything, I pondered the director's actions, finding him not very intelligent. A director like that couldn't possibly manage the hospital. There must be some secret. Right then, agonizing screams rang out from the entrance. I went to check and found they came from room 106. According to rule 5, no one could enter patient rooms at night. Upon hearing screams, one must call a nurse, not go alone. But to receive protection, I had to violate the rule. So I went in alone. When a patient saw me, he suddenly rushed over asking if I had any red pills left, then secretly handed me a piece of paper. I thought he wasn't affected by the pills yet, so I told him to go to sleep, and left the room. After checking that no one was around, I opened the paper to read it. The handwriting was identical to the warning below the doctor's rules, do not take the pills. So this patient was trustworthy, meaning the director's storage on the second floor must contain something important. Right then, the puppet returned, looking excited. It had clearly discovered something terrifying. So, I quickly took out a medical record book and told the puppet to write in it, along with the puppet's notes. Another crucial clue emerged. The hospital has a secret room that can only be accessed by elevator. The monster in the secret room had eaten the nurses who made mistakes, but since it was pitch black inside, the puppet couldn't see the monster clearly. The monster's final words showed that foolish director was just a substitute puppet. I realized I had to find the real director to unravel the hospital's mystery. Meanwhile, Gunding also heard the screams from room 106 during his night inspection per the rules. But he decided to follow protocol, calling a nurse to check first. The seemingly insane patients here had left Gunding traumatized. Only after the nurse confirmed it was safe did he cautiously enter. But the motionless patient from before suddenly charged at him. Startled, Gunding quickly ordered the nurse to restrain him. Even when the patient said he wanted to hand over a paper, he ignored it. What a pity, Gunding missed another crucial clue. Despite the risk of being discovered, the patient still wanted to pass information to him. But he had the same moral code as Big Bro when betraying his deskmate. After the nurse gave the patient a red pill, he fell into a deep sleep. Meanwhile, Oliver from Thailand was also on night duty with a doctor. But when the doctor handed him a green pill and told him to take it, Oliver wanted to refuse. 
Although the doctor explained it was just a sedative, Oliver still hesitated, unwilling to take it. This angered the doctor. To Oliver's horror, the doctor forced the pill into his mouth. After swallowing it, Oliver became silent, as if nothing had happened. Then, they began inspecting the rooms. Seeing a shivering patient on bed number two, the doctor ordered Oliver to inject a sedative and push him onto the operating table, saying surgery would be performed. By now, Oliver had completely become a puppet, offering no resistance. But he didn't know that patient wasn't a real one, but actually his own teammate from the same country. In fact, after being forced to take the green pill, Oliver had again lost consciousness. He grabbed the patient in front of him, about to inject the sedative, but the patient's screams and struggles made Oliver snap out of it. It was his teammate. Now lucid, Oliver immediately stopped, but both their identities had been exposed, with no more cover-ups. Only the doctor behind was seen laughing maniacally, suddenly rushing forward to choke Oliver's teammate before lifting him up. Despite Oliver's horror, his teammate died right after that. Witnessing the scene, Oliver became enraged, determined to avenge his teammate. But then the doctor's chest abruptly cracked open, revealing a bizarre third hand. The third hand seemed capable of creating illusions. After grabbing Oliver, it continuously attacked his mind. Soon, Oliver returned to a silent state, mumbling I am Oliver. I am an obedient nurse. Simultaneously, the system announced the Thailand candidate was eliminated, and the strange world was approaching, beginning a countdown. Meanwhile, as Grayson lay on the hospital bed, he suddenly heard the doctor order nurse Lucas to inject him with something. Grayson recognized Lucas as his own teammate, but seeing Lucas's blank expression, he was clearly being mentally influenced, possibly by the green pill's control. Still, as Lucas approached, Grayson whispered to him, hoping he could regain his senses and resist the doctor together. But Lucas seemed completely unresponsive, only repeating the doctor's orders. Seeing his state, Grayson had no choice but to try eliminating the doctor first. So Grayson shoved Lucas aside, shouting as he charged at the doctor that the nurse was trying to kill him, asking for help. But this trick couldn't fool the doctor. Before Grayson could reach him, two more hands emerged from the doctor's back, ready to trap him. As expected, Grayson was no match, pinned against the wall, immobilized. Seeing Grayson still defiant, the doctor became furious. He decided to make Grayson experience the feeling of betrayal by his own teammate. The doctor turned and ordered Lucas to continue injecting Grayson. Seeing Lucas still blank, Grayson felt utterly hopeless, planning to use the monster's aid obtained in the previous round as his last resort. But then a shocking scene unfolded. Lucas's syringe wasn't aimed at Grayson, but stabbed straight into the doctor's neck. Now the doctor panicked, unable to understand why Lucas remained lucid after taking the green pills. But Lucas was completely normal, because he had never actually taken those green pills. Lucas was an illusionist, specializing in deception. As for why his gaze could feign obedience so well, it was entirely thanks to the talent he acquired at the start of the game. Wasting no time, Lucas took the prepared scalpel and swiftly eliminated the doctor. When Grayson asked in astonishment how he did it, Lucas only showed a disdainful attitude. He said he wouldn't be as weak as Grayson, being oppressed by a lung country. He had always longed for a choice, and now finally his wish was granted. From now on, in this strange world, the home turf belonged to him. Meanwhile, I was suddenly grabbed tightly by a bloody hand reaching out from the emergency room. Would I face life and death again this time? Actually, apart from Gundy not receiving clues from the patient, the remaining candidates, including me, all received hints from the note of the patient in room 106. So following the hint, I decided to check the basement storage. Although the rules warned against using the elevator, the hospital only had three floors, no basement. But to violate the rules and receive protection, I still chose to take the elevator. As soon as I stepped in, I felt very strange. The elevator walls were full of scratch marks from people dragged in by the director. That was understandable. But those bloody handprints clearly belonged to children. I didn't know who left them. As I pondered, planning to check the other floors, I was suddenly interrupted by a voice emerging from nowhere. Can you help me find my red scarf? It got lost in the hospital, a memento from my mother. If you help me find it, I'll protect you when you go up to the third floor. I looked at this strange child, not feeling afraid at all. After encountering so many bizarre monsters, it didn't seem scary. But with that tiny body, how could it protect me? Seeing my doubt, the boy insisted stubbornly. I didn't say more, after all, it was just a small favor. I said I would help look for it, but he was afraid I might not keep my word, so I had to swear I would. After the boy left satisfied, I noticed a few more bloody handprints on the wall. It turned out they were all left by the little kid. Although he looked like a monster, 
he clearly didn't belong to the director's group, he could be the key to solving the case. Anyway, I still decided to check the storage on the second floor first. After going up, everything proceeded normally. Even the storage door was unlocked. In the messy storage, I found a safe. Why would there be a safe here? To be cautious, I summoned General Black and told him to carefully open the safe. But what happened next surprised me. Inside, there was nothing dangerous. Just a mirror and a rusted scalpel. I didn't understand why these discarded items needed to be locked in a safe. But just in case, I still pocketed them. However, as soon as I stepped out of the storage, we discovered, an emergency room had suddenly appeared out of nowhere next to us. This door clearly didn't exist before. According to Doctor's Rule 11, if a critically ill patient's room appears, immediately leave the area. Do not open the door or listen to any sounds from inside. But I didn't care. I had to listen. Every second of not respecting talent is disrespectful. But this time I messed up. As soon as I put my ear to the door, it opened by itself, and I was pulled in by the bloody hand from inside. Meanwhile, Grayson and Lucas also found the mirror and scalpel in the storage room. But as Lucas was about to leave, Grayson called him back. He said last night he used his guarding talent to check, and the room next to the storage might have a strange room appear. Very difficult to escape if pulled in. But Lucas didn't care at all, turning to leave right away. His arrogant attitude was as if he had learned my tricks. As Grayson said, he had only taken a few steps when a hand from the room pulled him in. Seeing this, Grayson broke out in a cold sweat, but wanting to save his teammate, he took out the scalpel, determined to fight to the death. Grayson was truly a man, willing to sacrifice himself for the more talented Lucas, for America. But when he rushed in, the room was full of corpses. Grayson stared in disbelief. Lucas had red eyes as he savagely dissected the bodies. Only when he saw Grayson did he gradually calm down. But how did he do that? Could those abnormal eyes be from his talent? Before Grayson could recover, Lucas approached and ordered him to reveal how he used the head's foresight ability to. Grayson fully acknowledged Lucas's ability, saying he would cooperate fully. On the other side, after leaving the storage, Angola and his Latin teammate from the Nameless Empire also saw the mysterious emergency room appear. But instead of fleeing according to the rules, these two stood in front of the door, pretending to analyze how I would handle it. Before they could reach a conclusion, they were also pulled in by the hand from the room. Seeing the monster approach, the two were drenched in sweat. Angola, who had played with me before, remained calm first. He said he would learn from me, step forward and slap the monster so Latin could open the door for both to escape. But things didn't go as planned. After Angola slapped the monster, Latin couldn't open the door. By then, the door had been locked tight. Angola's slap didn't have the same effect as mine. Seeing the monster approach, the two were about to be destroyed. At that moment, the room door was kicked open. A bloody hand pulled Angola and Latin out and slammed the door shut. The two finally came to their senses. Realizing it was the boy's voice, they knew he had saved them. Luckily they had made a deal with him earlier. Otherwise they would have been destroyed by now. Meanwhile, due to betraying the patient in room 106, Gundine didn't have any clues, so he went up to the second floor by elevator. But while still on the first floor, he also encountered the suddenly appearing emergency room. And the result was predictable. Unarmed, Gundine couldn't resist the monster. The system's announcement rang out. When I was pulled into the room, I said something that left the monsters dumbfounded. You're all so polite, intentionally inviting us in for a meal? Polar Bear happened to find the red scarf, helping the boy regain his original form. But who are the uncles you mentioned? Actually, I was just pulled into the emergency room by the protruding hand, but these weaklings are insignificant to me. I summoned General Black to let him feast. With countless tentacles sticking out, they were completely helpless, quickly swallowed whole. After dealing with everything, I returned to the first floor office but found a new bracelet on the desk. With five rules. 1. To know the truth about the mental hospital, go straight to the basement. 2. The third floor of the hospital is strictly forbidden. 3. Do not trust the director, no matter what he says. Killing the director is the only way to survive. 4. After the director dies, go to the exit floor on the third floor. 5. Absolutely follow the above rules, or you'll meet disaster. After reading it, I pondered. Previously, the doctor's rules didn't mention harming the director. He was still the supervisor. Punishing staff who violated rules. But these rules are completely different, constantly urging to eliminate the director. It's possible the director wrote these himself. But this version was perhaps written by the director's opposition. So there was another force in the hospital, possibly. The true director of the hospital. Meanwhile, Zhou Ming also came to my office, saying he had searched the first floor as instructed but found no useful clues. However, Polar Bear did find a red scarf. 
I was surprised because this was the scarf the boy mentioned. Although Polar Bear really liked this scarf, due to our next mission, I still clearly explained and took it back from him. I felt it was time to end everything, so I led Zhou Ming up to the floor. The rules repeatedly warned not to go to the third floor, so the final mission must be there. When we opened the elevator door, the boy was already waiting inside, startling Zhou Ming as it was his first time seeing him. As I was about to give him the scarf, Polar Bear couldn't contain his anguish and rushed to snatch it. It turned out giving me the scarf was his limit, giving it to someone else was impossible. Only after I promised to prioritize him for similar items did he let go. He was truly obsessed with this red scarf. After receiving the scarf, the boy also kept his word to protect me up to the floor. And when he put on the scarf, he gradually returned to normal. As soon as we reached the third floor, he warned us not to wander, as he was very familiar with this place. Just follow him and we wouldn't get lost. I wondered if the path had changed at all. How did you become so familiar with this place? But as I was thinking, he turned back and reminded that everyone on the third floor really hated surgical knives. And the boy said to get rid of any surgical knives we had. I realized something was off. I hid the fact that I had a knife in my pocket. Hearing that, he cheerfully called out loud for the uncles to come out and play. But despite his knocking on the doors, the rooms remained dead silent, with no one there as he claimed. Along the hallway, he knocked on each room, but the unusual silence made it seem like no one was inside. From his mumbling, I realized the uncles would normally come out to meet him, but today's eerie silence was frightening. It had something to do with my knife. Seeing me take it out, he panicked and yelled for me to throw it away. But I didn't listen, ordering him to step aside before slashing at the door. But at that moment, the door opened by itself. And not just that, all the room doors in the hallway flung open too. What was going on? Cass gave me the red robe and disappeared. It turned out all the truth was in the basement. Just now, I used the old knife to slash at the room door. Instantly, all the room doors seemed to react and swung wide open. The uncles the kid mentioned also appeared. They were completely wrapped in bandages, not looking like normal people. The boy was stunned by this sight. In his memory, the uncles weren't like this before. The boy blamed me for bringing the knife, causing the uncles to change. But I didn't have time to explain much to him. I immediately ordered Polar Bear and Zhou Ming to lead the boy back, while I advanced forward. Hearing their mumbled words completely fitting for surgery, I realized they must have undergone some operation to become like this. Against these beings no longer human, I would show no mercy. I summoned General Black to eliminate them. Although General Black handled them smoothly, after being swallowed, the patients reappeared. I guessed they were born from resentment, needing to eradicate the root to truly exterminate them. Thinking that, I didn't hesitate further, leading Zhou Ming down to the basement. Meanwhile, Lucas and Grayson from America also followed the boy up to the floor. Lucas also carried a surgical knife, and under Grayson's horrified gaze, he made the same motion as me. Immediately, the patients burst out of their rooms as if stimulated. Seeing so many monsters, Grayson trembled in fear. But as he was about to scold Lucas, he saw Lucas laughing maniacally, shouting that he had guessed correctly. Against the many monsters, Lucas paid no heed to Grayson. He pulled out a red robe from nothingness, donned it, his eyes turned fiery red, and he vanished. This scene not only left Grayson stunned, but also left the audience outside dumbfounded, guessing wildly about Lucas's talent. Meanwhile, although Paul and Jean from France lacked the boy's assistance, they still decided to go down to the basement to find the truth as hinted by the rules. They believed all the clues pointed here, and not long after, they were drawn by a faint dripping sound, like flowing water. But when they arrived, they realized it wasn't water but dripping blood. Numerous bodies were hanging limply on pillars, missing parts. Before Jean could react, a dark figure rushed and struck him down. By the time Paul realized something was wrong, Jean had already been dragged away. Panicked, forgetting Jean, Paul only thought of escaping via the elevator. But just as he reached the elevator door, about to breathe a sigh of relief, he saw the director blocking his way. At this point, the director had begun transforming. Knowing he couldn't escape, Paul stopped struggling and lamented his misfortune. He thought he had found the truth, that the director was the culprit. But the director only scoffed, saying he was still far from the truth. Without another word, a third arm burst out, piercing through Paul's chest. The system announced the French candidate had been eliminated, the strange world drawing nearer. Meanwhile, I led Joe Ming down to the basement. Although the boy was left behind, the patients didn't attack him but charged towards us instead. Joe Ming seemed to have gotten used to my pace. Even in such an urgent situation, he remained calm, even joking with me. 
He said it didn't feel like playing a game at all like this, wanting to do something. Hearing that, I cheerfully replied, then let's go and eliminate all of them. Seeing me get angry, Zhou Ming shook his head repeatedly, not daring to say more, just lowering his head and running after me. Down in the basement, we encountered a similar scene here. The director had been waiting for a long time. Seeing him standing with his back turned, looking imposing, I angrily rushed and slapped him. Caught off guard, the director knelt on the ground and began cursing. Realizing it was me, he grew even angrier, no longer cursing but charging straight at me. I advised him not to be rash, ordered General Black to stop him, then said I would put on a show. Right then, the patients chasing us also arrived. Under my command, instead of attacking me, they charged straight at the director, leaving Zhou Ming bewildered about what was happening. I calmly explained that they didn't listen to me, but hated the surgical knife. Earlier, I had secretly attached the knife to the director's back. I guessed they were likely victims of that old knife. So wherever the knife was, they attacked. In the fierce tearing apart, the director was completely exhausted. The patient's resentment was more terrifying than I imagined, but if I wasn't mistaken, there must be something on this floor that could deal with them. But now, after dealing with the director, the patients had turned their sights on us. What should we do now? The truth was about to be revealed, the director's diary unveiling everything. After dealing with the director, the patients stared intently at us. But I remained completely calm telling the panicking Zhou Ming beside me to stay calm. Because the best part was about to begin, we just needed to sit still and eat popcorn. Just as I finished speaking, a loud explosion sounded nearby. The secret room's door was blasted open, and as the smoke cleared, a terrifying, distorted creature emerged. But seeing that dreadful figure, I wasn't surprised at all. Its appearance completely proved my speculation. On this basement floor, the secret room must have been holding the real director although now he had transformed into the ugly monster before us. But surprisingly, his consciousness remained. Seeing this, he didn't attack immediately but approached me, praising my thinking and tactics that led all the patients here. But he still wondered why I was so sure I could control everything. I just smiled disdainfully and slapped him, as if unafraid he could tear me apart at any moment. Seeing my smug look, he grew even more astonished. Without another word, he silently stepped aside, clearing the way into the secret room. He said to find the real secret, we had to go in there. All the answers were inside, whether I had the courage or not, but I was curious why he was doing this. He could have easily broken down the door, proving he didn't want to harm anyone. He willingly stayed in the secret room, but why did he perform surgeries to transform those patients? Hearing that, the director fell into reminiscence, but before he could explain, the patients charged at him, recognizing him. They merged into a terrifying mass, wrestling with each other as if trying to tear the director apart. Seeing them burying each other, I realized I couldn't hear the director's explanation. So I pulled Zhou Ming into the secret room to find the ultimate truth. As soon as we entered, the smell of blood and medicine almost made us faint. I knew we couldn't stay long, so I ordered Zhou Ming to split up and search. Finally, under a protruding brick, I found the director's diary. I opened it, and the words recounting his life appeared before my eyes. Initially, he was a dedicated, conscientious director, but he discovered something strange in the first month of his tenure. It rained heavily every day. The situation grew increasingly bizarre, as he found many patients. Nurses, even doctors suddenly disappeared. He was determined to investigate, but whenever he was about to find a clue, it seemed something cut him off. He was completely powerless. During two years of continuous heavy rain, his spirit deteriorated. Finally, he began experimenting with human transformation. But due to the extreme difficulty, the first surgery claimed the lives of the doctors, nurses. With no other choice, he decided to use his own body. When he thought he was about to die, he discovered the experiment was making progress, that he himself had the power to resist the monster. But he was still too weak. Even at the cost of his life, he couldn't fight against it. Actually, after reading the diary in the secret room, I gradually understood everything. It seemed that after the experiment, the director had gained the power to confront the monster, but in reality he was still too weak. And as more and more people joined the experiment, the director not only transformed himself but also transformed them into test subjects. But even at the price of their lives, he still couldn't fight against. It was those who were bewitched by the monster. Although the director knew they were innocent, he had no other choice. According to the diary, the heavy rain eventually stopped. The director thought they had defeated the monster with their own power. But the surprise was, the resentment of the patients had silently enveloped the entire hospital, 
greatly amplifying the monster's power as never before. The heavy rain poured down again. Although the director continued improving the experiment, it had little effect. Soon after, all the doctors and nurses disappeared. With no other choice, the director had to use the monster's power to revive them. The two differently colored pills were to control them, prevent them from remembering they had died. Although both had side effects, he considered it the only way. But in the end, the director still failed. During the experiment process, he completely lost control, becoming a monster himself. Not wanting to harm anyone, he asked others to lock him in the secret basement room, never to see the sunlight again. After reading it, Joe Ming and I took a long time to calm down. We thought we had guessed part of it, but the story was more complicated than expected. Although the director did some extreme things to fight the monster, he was still a good person. Unable to find any other useful information, we hurriedly left the secret room. But as soon as we went out, we saw the director couldn't resist the patients. He was now exhausted. Seeing that, I quickly summoned General Black to help, but the director refused, saying he had learned the truth. He had no more regrets. He considered himself the culprit, and was tired of hiding like a monster in the secret room. So he decided to commit suicide with the monster, to be completely free. As the director made up his mind, his body continued transforming betting his life to completely eliminate the monster. At this point, the monster was still trying to control the patients, saying they were innocent. But the director didn't listen. He charged straight in. Because he had been deceived once, if he let the monster exploit the patient's resentment to be reborn, it would continue to spread disaster. Clearly, the monster didn't expect this situation. It only saw the dark side of humanity, overlooking love. The director fought fiercely. Finally the monster was shattered, and he collapsed to the ground. The only thing he regretted was not being able to save the lost doctors. Witnessing everything, we were deeply impressed by his willpower. From the beginning, he resisted the monster's influence. And even after becoming a monster himself, he still kept his heart. The director truly deserves respect. But now his strength was exhausted after the battle. I was a bit scared too. Fortunately I didn't choose the monster's help as a reward in the previous level. Otherwise I might have ended up like the director. But why haven't I heard the level clear notification yet? That's not right. The monster has been reborn again. I ordered Joe Ming to choose to exit the game early. It turned out that although the director sacrificed his life earlier, he still couldn't completely destroy the monster. Facing the newly reborn monster, I felt immense pressure. This must be the strongest entity so far. When I was at a loss of what to do, the system suddenly notified that I could exit the game early and receive a 3-star reward if I chose this option. If I continued, the notification would sound when I reached 4 stars. This was the first time I heard such a notification after playing this strange world for so long. That proved the danger from the new monster far exceeded my imagination. At this point, Joe Ming also saw the notification but still decided to stay with me, saying if I wanted to stay, he wouldn't back down, but I thought he couldn't help much here, and would even face great danger, so I told him to choose to exit the game early, and leave the rest to me. Joe Ming didn't hesitate after hearing that, he thanked me and chose to exit, receiving 3 stars. Meanwhile, Grayson and Lucas also reached this stage. As for the choice to exit the game, Grayson hesitated but Lucas mocked him, so he chose quickly, saying Grayson would only hold him back if he stayed. Grayson knew he wasn't strong enough to deal with it, so before leaving, he reminded Lucas to rein in his arrogance to avoid trouble. This well-intentioned reminder only angered Lucas, who thought Grayson was being rude to him. As soon as Grayson chose to exit the game, Lucas used his power to throw him towards the monster. Fortunately, Grayson managed to complete his choice in the blink of an eye and flew out. Lucas is truly a madman, daring to attack his own teammate. Turning back to face the powerful monster, I understood everything. I identified the monster as the patient from room 106, who suggested I don't take the medicine, and told me to find the scalpel and mirror in the storage room. His goal was to lure me into inciting the third floor patients to attack the director, then take advantage when both sides were exhausted to possess, absorb their power and become the monster as he is now. But the monster didn't care about my analysis, because now he had successfully merged. Seeing his arrogant attitude, I didn't say more and summoned all three guards. But the monster wasn't afraid, using a strange move that immobilized all three. 
Seeing that, I knew it was time to go all out. I ordered them to enter the evolution state. With General Black's mental attack, the monster's consciousness was disrupted. White Bear and the guards regained control of their bodies, unleashing their strongest moves together to attack the monster. But surprisingly, even so, they were no match. With one roar from the monster, they were all blown away. At this point, I was tense and hurriedly took out the War God Ring to boost their attributes. But before I could use it, my body was immobilized with a wave of the monster's hand. He could control me instantly. Was I going to die here? In this strange world, I had once again achieved a 6 star rating. But this time, I had to pay a heavy price. Just now, facing the powerful merged monster, even in their evolved state too, White Bear and the guards were no match. And I was controlled by the monster, just waiting for death as it approached. But at that moment, the boy suddenly rushed in, loudly stopping the monster after merging, which contained not only the patients but also his dearest mother. Seeing the boy appear, the patients inside the monster were also moved, gradually regaining their senses, breaking free from its control. Realizing this, the monster intensified its mental disruption, saying that it was thanks to it that the patients were still alive, so they had to obey. Then it intended to harm the boy, to cut off the patient's only connection, but the sacred mother-child bond could not be shaken. Seeing the boy in danger, the mother raged against it. The internal conflict caused the monster's power to diminish. Soon after, I regained control of my body and used the Divine Mountain Sword. White Bear also regained his strength, but surprisingly, instead of attacking the monster, he snatched the boy's red scarf. At this point, White Bear seemed to evolve to a higher level. The red scarf held special meaning for White Bear. Now completely transformed, it grabbed the monster tearing itself apart and absorbed their power. But just when I thought it was settled, my heart sank, as it was clear White Bear's body couldn't withstand that much energy. In just a few more seconds, the surging power would make it explode. Seeing White Bear lose control, I had to use the nameless metal I got from the previous level, using its ability to rewind time by 5 seconds, restoring White Bear to its initial state. But strangely, even though I used the metal, the monster's power had vanished, and White Bear had turned black. As I worried about finding a solution, it suddenly split into two bears. Looking closely, the newly appeared black bear seemed to be White Bear's friend. Perhaps the red scarf had summoned its friend. But before I could think it through, the war god ring on my hand suddenly shattered. Losing such a precious treasure almost made me faint. At this point, the system notified me of achieving six stars, along with a series of rewards. The red scarf not only enhanced White Bear but also summoned Black Bear, somewhat making up for the loss of the War God Ring. Especially, the monster director's diary was truly groundbreaking. Able to foresee the future of a level, although it only lasts for one level, it still greatly reduced the pressure on me. Afterwards, we were all brought back to the real world as instructed by the system. At the same time, Lucas's ability was also fully exposed. It turned out he also possessed an S-rank ability like me. Now Lucas was clawing at his own arm, screaming for even more power. He had gone insane again and passed the level, but at the cost of his arm. Just now, facing such a horrifying monster, Lucas showed no fear but rather excitement. He kept clawing at his arm, using it as the price to activate his strange S-rank ability. He was completely mad, willing to sacrifice himself to gain power against the monster. The more he sacrificed, the greater monstrous power he received. Seeing Lucas like this, the boy also felt pity and intended to stop him and help fight the monster. But Lucas wouldn't listen. He even threatened to hit the boy if he said anything more. The boy was very angry at Lucas's insane attitude. Moreover, the scarf was found by Grayson, not Lucas. So the boy left immediately. After the boy left, there was no chance for reconciliation between the two sides. The final battle erupted. Initially, the monster didn't think much of Lucas. Although surprised by Lucas's ability to control power, at full strength, it wasn't afraid. Its power could easily defeat all three of my guards. But soon it realized something was off. With the support of the surgical knife, Lucas could fully confront it. The old knife seemed able to control the patients possessed by the monster. As the wounds from the knife increased, the monster's power gradually diminished. Now the monster had lost its initial arrogance. But seeing this, Lucas became even more excited. He didn't intend to finish off the monster immediately. Instead, he took out a deck of cards, saying he would perform a magic show for the monster. The magic show was called Elegant Surgical Knives. Lucas threw the cards into the air 
and they turned into countless knives raining down on the monster. Against that dense barrage of attacks, the monster couldn't retaliate and was quickly dispersed by the relentless knives. At this point, the notification of Lucas passing the level also sounded. But what he couldn't accept was that despite defeating the boss single-handedly, because he wasn't acknowledged by the boy, he still received fewer stars than me. Instead of receiving a special reward like me, Lucas only received the old surgical knife. At this point, he couldn't accept being inferior to me. His already wavering mind completely shattered, cursing and shouting at the system. Meanwhile, the incompetent Angola and Latin also finished. They decided to try their luck in the basement but found no information. The two were immediately swallowed by the monster. The strange world also came to them. All candidates, whether successful or not, completed this challenge. The successful American and Chinese teams will be exempted from the strange rules and receive basic rewards. The people of these two countries will certainly be very happy, but most countries will have to endure the invasion of the strange world. As for Lucas, after returning to reality, he was immediately taken to America's top mental hospital. Doctors concluded as expected that he did suffer from a severe mental illness. But right after that, the strange rules opened up again, this time to the museum world. Just after facing the diagnosis of America's top doctors, Lucas's condition remained incurable. Currently, the price he paid to summon the monstrous power seemed to have followed him back to reality, not only unable to be erased but also spreading and developing. If this continues, eventually it will swallow him completely, turning him into a part of the strange world. After the previous strange incident, the world rankings were also updated. Although Lucas's abilities were concealed, many still paid attention believing his S-rank ability could be on par with mine. Meanwhile, with the exemption opportunity used up, Andre from the Bear Country also had to face the risk of being randomly selected in this strange incident. Everyone looked forward to a showdown between us in the upcoming strange incident. Three days later, I and the other candidates arrived in the strange world again. The random selection didn't necessarily include those who had passed the previous level. This time it was the museum world. We needed to find the lost exhibits and put them back in their original positions. Within three days, we had to connect the space with other candidates to escape the museum. After reading the introduction, I suddenly remembered a similar level in the Great Maze. But this time it mentioned connecting with other candidates, meaning we might need to connect with many people, harder than the Great Maze. As soon as I entered the museum, the staff handed me a handbook. Opening it, it recorded the museum's history, introduced the exhibits and rules to follow. Rule 1. When entering this city's largest museum, you will be able to admire unique exhibits. When viewing the exhibits, photography and filming are strictly prohibited. Rule 2. The museum houses many famous paintings by renowned artists. The common feature of these paintings is seascape and abstract scenes. There are no portraits. Rule 3. Please do not make noise in the museum. No matter what happens, even if the museum collapses, remain silent. Rule 4. Museum staff all wear black uniforms. If you encounter staff in other colors, do not trust what they say. Rule 5. The museum does not house any animals. If you encounter a talking fish or a blind cat, go to the director's office on the third floor immediately. Rule 6. The director's office is a safe place. Rule 7. Do not run away from the director's office. That is not the real director. The real director has turned into a monster. Rule 8. The second floor has a restroom, with over 900 mirrors installed to enhance attractiveness. This is normal. Rule 9. After leaving the restroom, if the second floor path changes, take the leftmost hallway to go down to the first floor. Rule 10. The museum does not have a wax room. If a staff member introduces you there, do not trust them. Rule 11. If you follow the above rules, you will safely escape the museum. Exiting the gate is the way out. After reading it, I intended to violate rule 1 immediately to gain talent points. But when I reached into my pocket, I found I didn't have my phone. This made me angry. But I saw the surrounding tourists still holding their phones and talking. Making such noise in the museum yet blaming others. I snatched a phone from someone, ignoring his angry look, and randomly took photos of the exhibits. After that, I returned the phone to him giving him no chance to react. But before I could do anything else, a group of security guards in black uniforms rushed over, saying he violated the rules and immediately restrained him. The tourist struggled and shouted that I took the photos, but I immediately played the victim, saying he forced me to use his phone to take photos. Then the guy was dragged away by the guards amid his loud protests. In the chaos, I took his phone again. Successfully breaking the rules, I felt great. I went to check out the exhibits. At this point, I saw some empty display cases. Clearly the things we needed to find. 
but there was no information on the cases to help me locate them. As I was thinking, I continued deeper inside and was startled by the paintings on both sides. According to the rules, the museum did not collect portraits, but here they were all portraits. When I got closer to examine them, something strange happened. The paintings suddenly came to life, the people in them screaming in horror. But the surrounding tourists showed no reaction. Why was that? Actually, after reading the rules, I went to check. According to Rule 2, the museum did not collect portraits. But to my surprise, I found they were all portraits. When I leaned in to examine closely, the people in the paintings suddenly came to life, their arms reaching out, startling me. But hearing the discussions of tourists behind me, I immediately calmed down. Because in their eyes, the painting in front of me was not a portrait. But in reality, it was a landscape painting. I realized I might be experiencing an illusion caused by the monster. So I immediately used pollution reverence to break the illusion. But after using reverence, an even stranger scene appeared. Though the painting had reverted to a landscape, it suddenly caught fire. With screams of horror ringing out from within. Since I had used reverence, this was definitely not an illusion. Perhaps there was a monster inside the painting. But looking around, the tourists still showed no reaction. I realized all these phenomena were only happening to me. Perhaps because I was the chosen one. If I revealed my identity, I would be monitored by the monster on the first floor. Meanwhile, the candidate Molly also saw the empty display cases. But he directly asked the guard. With no clues, he continued deeper inside. At this point, he also witnessed a scene similar to mine, with the people in the paintings suddenly coming to life and rushing out. Being his first time in the strange world, he screamed in fright. But when he looked back, the painting was empty again. But the incident didn't end there, as his scream had violated Rule 3. Immediately, the guards rushed over, restrained him, and dragged him to the third floor despite his fierce resistance. Not long after, the system announced that candidate Molly was eliminated, and the strange world was about to appear. After Molly's elimination, the public outside discussed the painting incident heatedly. In this strange world, among all the candidates, only the two of us witnessed the abnormal phenomenon of the paintings. The others and the surrounding tourists showed no reaction. During the heated discussion, they also speculated, like me, that revealing one's identity might lead to being monitored by the monster. After analysis, they became more convinced of this, as the other candidates received instructions from the government not to reveal their identities. As for me, I was standing in the corner, using a tourist's phone to review the photos, hoping to find useful clues. Indeed, in one photo, I saw the boy who had been following me on the invisible to the naked eye floor, but the camera could capture him. At that moment, strange things happened again. First, a vase of flowers spilled and broke, then a female tourist was pushed down, her face and hair torn as if attacked by something. Seeing this, the tourists panicked, but I remained calm, taking out the phone to photograph the girl. Sure enough, the photo showed the boy manipulating everything. My bold action caught the boy's attention. If you see me, come play with me. The ultimate beauty faces an unprecedented challenge. Who would have thought Joe Ming? always wearing a dog mask, is actually a handsome guy. Earlier, I had discovered that the monster hiding on the first floor was the boy, thanks to taking photos with a phone. My provocative action also caught the boy's attention. He laughed loudly and charged at me, but his stupid stance was too easy to deal with. I just needed to kick him back, and he flew back, crashing into some display cabinets behind. This bizarre scene terrified the tourists as they couldn't see the boy, only seeing the cabinets breaking without understanding why. Panicked, they could only scream and run away. Meanwhile, the trembling boy stood up, knowing he couldn't win, so he cursed and fled. Currently, I can only see him through the phone camera, so I couldn't stop him from running away. I could only bid him farewell with a friendly gesture for now. But the guards' words that followed made me realize things were not so simple. While reassuring the tourists, they also mentioned the boy, meaning they're not like the tourists, completely unaware of him. So I decided to follow them into the rest area, hoping to find more clues. Meanwhile, the other candidates were also attacked by the boy. The panic of the tourists left Zhou Ming standing in the lobby, unsure of what to do. Although scared, being Chinese, he had to stand his ground even if it meant death, not letting other countries mock him. So Zhou Ming decided to stay and fight back. After using fake probe to obtain a phone, Zhou Ming didn't hesitate to snatch it, saying borrow but grabbing it outright. Truly a perfect combination of politeness and rudeness. As soon as he got the phone, 
he saw it was in camera mode. This made Zhou Ming realize the issue. He started taking random photos of the panicked crowd on the ground. Sure enough, next to a fallen tourist, Zhou Ming captured the boy's image. The boy sensed this and left the tourist, heading towards Zhou Ming. Though Zhou Ming was whimpering in fear, the boy's movements caught his attention. His hand gestures clearly showed a fear of light, so Zhou Ming decided to take a risk. When the flash went off, the boy screamed, covered his eyes and ran away. Zhou Ming also breathed a sigh of relief, saying he didn't disgrace his country. Right after, a group of guards rushed in, taking Zhou Ming and the tourists to the rest area. Meanwhile, the Korean candidate was panicking and fleeing with the tourists. But strangely, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't get closer to the main entrance. At that moment, the boy charged at him again. Recalling the warning in the monster director's diary, a dark future was coming for Zhou Ming due to his ability. Earlier, despite trying to run, the Korean candidate couldn't get close to the entrance. Facing the charging boy, he was completely helpless. Fortunately, the guards appeared then, seemingly scaring the boy away, who hurriedly let go and ran off. But the terrifying feeling made him collapse. His pants soaked in sweat. Back to me, I entered the rest area with some tourists but sensed something was off. The hanging lamps on the ceiling were very strange. Moreover, they emitted an indescribable scent, smelling like burnt oil. Initially, the tourists were scared, but after entering, they calmed down shortly. Perhaps this strange scent, like the power of the sea creature in the Oceanography Museum stage, had a calming effect on the mind. But overhearing the guards' conversation outside, I broke out in a cold sweat. They knew this museum was repeating endlessly. The ceiling lamps in the rest area not only erased memories of the strange events but also erased their conversation from our memories. So they weren't afraid of us eavesdropping on their dialogue. But when I was about to teach them a lesson with a flying kick, an old lady suddenly stood in front of me, scolding me for being disrespectful to the elderly. Angered, I stood up, ready to deliver the kick intended for the guards to her face. But my legs were numb from sitting too long, causing me to stumble and nearly fall. Seeing this, two young men nearby, thinking I was disabled, rushed and kicked the old lady twice. I was very surprised by their action. But then I had to explain embarrassingly that I wasn't disabled, just had numb legs. Under my imposing shadow, the two young men were completely flustered. This comical scene. This scene also made the audience outside laugh out loud, mocking that lonely old lady. No matter how she scolded me, I remained silent, ignoring her. I left the rest area and returned to the lobby floor. Now the exhibition area had returned to normal, with no trace of the chaos caused by the boy. If not for the sea creature bracelet taking effect, I might have forgotten everything. In this situation with no clues, I immediately used the newly obtained monster director's diary from the previous stage to predict the upcoming situation. The content in it horrified me. It turned out Zhou Ming was also chosen for this strange world and was about to face a life or death decision. Although I couldn't warn him, I came up with the idea of projecting the diary's content into the sky, hoping the Chinese government would see it and warn Zhou Ming through the hint opportunity. After that, I put away the diary and checked the first floor again but found nothing unusual. Even the boy had disappeared from the photos. With no clues on the first floor, I had no choice but to go to the second floor. When the guard stopped and asked, I said according to the hint, the second floor had a restroom, so I was going to visit the restroom. My bizarre answer left the guard dumbfounded, perhaps thinking I was speaking nonsense. When I entered the restroom, I saw over 900 mirrors plastered everywhere. Breathtaking beauty faced an unprecedented challenge. I realized they were not simple, possibly containing important clues, so I approached to observe. Suddenly, Andre appeared in the mirror, seeing his surprised expression. I was certain this was not an illusion but the real person. I guessed these mirrors allowed us, the chosen ones, to communicate with each other. Through this, we could achieve the connection between candidates as the hint mentioned. Indeed, as I was talking to Andre, Zhou Ming appeared in the mirror next to him. Although he's handsome, he's not as famous as me. Because when the Korean candidate appeared, he only recognized me and Andre, not noticing the wide-eyed Zhou Ming. Seeing me, he immediately begged me for help, being of the same blood. He wanted me to tell him which rules were correct. This parasitic approach from the start left Zhou Ming and Andre stunned. Of course, I couldn't reveal such information. Even if I wanted to, this strange world wouldn't allow such a loophole. It's foolish to think the monsters would fall for that easily. Seeing the silly guy, I couldn't help but laugh. But I still discussed the rules with him. This scene angered the Korean authorities outside, scolding him for being as stupid as a pig to fall for such a childish trap. They immediately used the hint opportunity to warn him. 
But after reading the hint, he wasn't afraid but rather delighted. This made the Korean authorities lose all hope, realizing. At the same time, the Chinese government also noticed the strange behavior of the Korean candidate. But before that, when everyone was still on the first floor, the messages they sent were all normal. So they guessed that something on the second floor had changed the content of the hint. The design of this restroom was probably caused by those mirrors. To unite against the strange world and demonstrate their superpower status, the Chinese government shared this information with other countries via encrypted messages. Meanwhile, after hearing my analysis, the Korean candidate's attitude did a 180-degree turn. He said he would surpass us to pass the stage, then disappeared into the mirror. Although his action was somewhat despicable, I didn't care because I was just talking nonsense. My mischievous act also made Andre next to me laugh out loud, criticizing that Korea always produces idiots. At that moment, Grayson and Lucas also appeared in the mirrors. Meeting for the first time, Lucas was not friendly at all mocking that my time had passed, and he would become the leader of the strange world. Seeing Lucas's arrogant demeanor, I immediately congratulated him, saying I would withdraw, and he was the new leader. My indifferent attitude only made Lucas angrier, shouting that he would defeat me. This manic state of mind indeed matched the doctor's assessment of him. In the strange world, the candidates should unite to fight against it together. Although also an American, Grayson understood that, so we discussed plans together. But seeing this, Lucas completely went mad. He shouted that we were a lousy group, then smashed the mirror. It's unknown what would happen with a broken mirror. Actually, after finishing the conversation through the mirrors, I left the restroom. But as soon as I stepped out, I saw that the normal second floor hallway had completely changed. The hallway now had a fork. I realized that if the entire second floor path had changed, finding useful information would certainly be very difficult. At this point, returning to the first floor was the most sensible choice. According to the hint from Rule 9, Upon leaving the restroom if the second floor has changed, go through the left hallway to go downstairs. But now the sea creature bracelet wasn't signaling, meaning it wasn't an illusion. Nevertheless, to violate the rules and receive the protective talent, I still intended to go right. But before I could go far, I encountered a staff member in a red uniform. He coldly said that if I wanted to go to the first floor, I had to take the left path. I didn't care much about what he said. Anyway, he couldn't force me. But his appearance made Rule 4 and Rule 9 contradict each other. Whether I went left or right, I would lose the protective talent by following one of the two rules. The outside world deliberately created this contradiction to target my abilities. Feeling annoyed, I decided to rebel. I raised both hands, who says I had to go downstairs, I'm not going anymore. Then I took out my phone, playing some trendy music for everyone. As the catchy melody played, I also danced along. Although I had practiced for two and a half years, I had to show the outside audience the results. The sudden music startled him, hastily rushing to snatch my phone. But I didn't give him a chance, it was reckless to dare confront me. I immediately delivered a flying kick, kicking him face down on the ground. But a horrifying thing happened. A blind black cat crawled out of his mouth. After glaring at me, it ran away. But before it could go far, it was controlled by an invisible force, repeatedly smashed against the wall. I guess the boy from the first floor had arrived. I took my phone and snapped some close-up shots. Indeed, he was kicking the cat up into the air. The last time he appeared was due to the noise from the tourists. This time it was because I played music. I realized that just making loud noises in the museum would attract the monsters. But more surprisingly, they seemed not to be allies, but enemies of each other. As I was thinking, the boy finished eliminating the cat, then gleefully approached me. Seeing his defiant look, I got angry, preparing to throw a few more kicks. Seeing my left hand raised, he panicked and ran away, but I couldn't let him escape so easily. I immediately gave chase, but I didn't know that after I left, a black shadow appeared at the end of that hallway. A strange black fish came out, looking at the cat's corpse with regret, saying it would continue to complete the cat's mission. Meanwhile, after ending the conversation, Joe Ming also encountered a similar situation. Standing before two hallways and the red clothed staff at the right fork, he was also very hesitant. But why did that guy tell me to go left while telling Zhou Ming to go right? Zhou Ming was in a difficult position facing the two contradictory rules. He didn't know which rule was correct now. Because the black clothed staff on the first floor had saved him, he guessed rule 4 was more correct. Finally, he decided to go left. When that guy tried to stop him, Zhou Ming became more convinced of his thinking. But suddenly his phone rang with a message. White Bear knows the way. 
we have an important clue from the museum. He didn't know who sent it, but the content clearly prevented him from going left. As he was thinking, he was startled to see another path appear in the hallway. Faced with the guidance of the red-clothed guy, Zhou Ming was confused. Trying to stay calm, he decided to use his abilities to find clues. After using his ability, a strange pair of eyes appeared. Based on the eye's position, it seemed the correct path was the middle one. Zhou Ming immediately dismissed that thought, because the Chinese government had warned him not to trust the talents on the second floor. The red guy's guidance made him eliminate the right hallway too. The talent made him eliminate the middle hallway. So despite the staff's obstruction, Zhou Ming didn't hesitate to run towards the left. It must be said that Zhou Ming analyzed very carefully. That decision helped him escape danger. After Zhou Ming chose, not only did that guy turn away, but those eyes also change. In the middle hallway, the image of the boy appeared. Were the eyes on his hands from the black cat? From the current information, the staff was the transformed black cat. Although both were evil, they were not allies, but enemies of each other. Back to me, at this point I had returned to the first floor. Seeing my strange actions, the black fish was completely bewildered. In fact, I had known of its existence for a long time thanks to the hint in the rules. Since the black cat had died, the fish would appear. I asked if it had anything to say. The fish still didn't understand good or bad, saying it had lost but wasn't submitting, seeing it ready to sacrifice itself. I didn't say more and ordered the white bear to attack. Soon after, it begged for help, asking me what I wanted it to say. Seeing it was so stubborn yet didn't know what to say, I told the white bear to continue. After a while, seeing it was about to pass out, I stopped. At this point, it cried and shouted that if I didn't ask it, how would it know what to say? I also felt embarrassed, forgetting to ask it what. I then told it to reveal the museum's secrets. The fish hesitated but faced with my wicked smile, it had to tell everything. It turned out it and the black cat were both museum staff. The fish and black cat used to be the museum director's pets. If one day it appeared at the museum, it could affect everyone there, including the director. Although the director tried to resist, he was no match. In that battle, many museum staff sacrificed themselves. They were also affected and turned into strange creatures. So the director had the restrooms on the second floor built, using hundreds of mirrors to trap those strange creatures. But in the prolonged battle, the director gradually became affected and completely turned into a monster. To reassure tourists, he ordered the staff to lock him on the third floor. They also frequently took something from his body as lamp oil. In his lucid moments, he left an important clue. If anyone could change the museum situation encountered them, the black cat must stop them from reaching the wax room. Because the wax room was the most horrifying place. Also his hiding spot. Although the third floor's secret gradually became clear, the fish knew this journey was not as simple as it seemed on the surface. Actually, through its memories, I had roughly understood the situation. He wasn't completely destroyed but was imprisoned in the wax room by the director somehow. Although it didn't know how to destroy him, the fish said the director had given the black cat a map, thanks to which they could escape the museum. But due to carelessness, the map was lost. The boy, his henchman, was cruel to the black cat to interrogate about the map's location. But I felt something was off in the fish's words. As the director's pet, even if the map didn't fall into its hands, it should have at least seen and known the museum's exit. But the fish kept denying it. It kept beating around the bush about the black cat completely denying knowledge of the museum's paths. Although I noticed its issue, currently I had no better clues, so I pretended to trust it, recalled the little white bear and told it to follow me. Then I used the monster director's diary again. Although the information made me doubtful, to find the map as soon as possible, I still decided to go to the third floor for clues. Meanwhile, the Korean candidate also encountered the fake black cat staff in the second floor hallway. But when the black cat pressured him to choose, the fish appeared like a savior, rescuing him. So the fish became the most trustworthy to him. It told him all the museum's secrets, and he completely believed it, unlike me. According to its version, both the black cat and the boy were his henchmen. Although the clue suggested there was a monster in the director's office on the third floor, the fish firmly stated that rule was wrong. It even cited Mai and his words in the mirror as evidence. Although a bit naive, he also realized the suspicion. He stood up, questioning how it knew their conversation. But the fish calmly said since it was originally a second floor monster, hearing their talk was normal. Hearing that, he understood and didn't ask further. Though still doubtful, he followed the fish to the third floor. There. Faced with the fish's provocations, he initially reacted, but he still had to pretend to be tough, yelling loudly then going deeper into the third floor. 
This made the audience outside realize the issue, that the fish was not as simple as it seemed. It behaved completely differently with each person. Its goal now was clear, to gain the candidate's trust then lead them to the director's office on the third floor. At this point, the Korean also realized his mistake. Panicked, he ran back to the second floor but it was too late. After just a few steps, he was pulled into the office by a strange force. As the door closed, the system announced, Korean candidate swallowed by the monster. The strange world was about to arrive, the countdown began. As for Joe Main, just returning to the first floor, he was actively approached by the black staff. As Joe Main was thinking how to respond, he found that the staff only gave him two things. One was the black cat's important eye, and two was the file of the child the director adopted, clearly stating its secret. At this point, holding those two things, Joe Main was extremely worried. Could this be the boy's file? Could the boy be the key to passing this stage? Finally, the boy's secret was revealed. In fact, after going down to the first floor, Joe Ming received two important items from the black staff, the blind black cat's eye and the adoption file of the boy on the first floor. Reading the file, Joe Ming gradually understood the situation. The director devoted his life to charity work. The boy was one he picked up from the trash. Most of his salary was donated, keeping only a little for living expenses and raising the boy. When the boy appeared, exactly at three years old, due to his young age, his cognitive ability was undeveloped. The director's power could not affect or leave any trace on him. But no matter how hard the director tried to send the boy away, he refused. Even if taken out of the museum, he would cry and run back in. Perhaps it was a family bond. But later in the battle against him by all the staff, the boy was unintentionally dragged in many times. That made the director realize he could not completely destroy him. So he found a way to sacrifice himself, temporarily controlling him. Before leaving, he entrusted the museum and the boy to some surviving staff. But even after being controlled, the museum still fell into a strange state. Everyone was unable to escape, including the boy. Some people gradually became insane even losing their minds. The boy was also affected long-term, which led to his current appearance. But he still had moments of clarity, so he ordered the staff to give Joe Ming the black cat's eye, hoping with his help to escape from his control. Hearing this, Joe Ming was moved, and immediately reassured the staff that he would share the information with me. I would definitely be able to help them defeat the monster. After that, Joe Ming didn't hesitate to return to the second floor restroom, hoping to convey the new information to me through the mirror. Both I and Andre had already left. What should he do now? As he was thinking, suddenly a black cat appeared behind Joe Main. Before he could react, it jumped three meters high, charging towards him. Joe Main panicked, only managing to throw the black cat's eye he had just obtained, hoping to buy some time. Strangely, after sniffing the eye, the black cat actually stopped. Then, to Joe Ming's horror, the black cat immediately reattached the eye. Not long after, it completely recovered. Staring at Joe Ming for a while, it then left, leaving him in a horrified expression. It turned out the cat attacked Joe Ming just to retrieve its eye. But what was the purpose of this eye, was still unclear. Meanwhile, Andre also encountered the walking fish, but he quickly found flaws in its words, just like me. After using his infinite deduction ability, Andre became more certain of that. He started negotiating, saying if it didn't tell the truth, he wouldn't go any further. Unable to find an exit, he would stay here with the staff to fight against it. Faced with Andre's defiant attitude, the fish panicked, warning that it was a very dangerous action. But Andre didn't care, because he had found a way to deal with it. In fact, Andre had used his ability to find the crucial clue. That was him saying he had passed on the way to destroy it to the staff on the next floor. They would soon take action. Hearing this, the fish was horrified, jumping up and down saying it would immediately stop the staff from going to the third floor, while warning Andre that if they acted, he wouldn't be able to escape. Seeing its panic, Andre became even calmer. He lay down on the ground, saying he had seen through life and death, just waiting. Faced with Andre's proactive surrender, the fish broke out in a cold sweat. And finally, the fish changed its attitude by 180 degrees, advising Andre not to be so negative, and to think more about his family. Seeing that it had fallen into the trap, Andre started to tighten the noose. The fish wanted him to stop the staff, while he wanted to lure it down to the first floor. The two meaninglessly argued for half an hour. In the end, the fish couldn't take it anymore. It didn't expect Andre to be so determined to die that he even wanted to drag the monster down with him. To save its master, the fish reluctantly conceded. It said it would go down to the first floor itself to stop the staff, telling Andre to wait here. Andre happily agreed right away. 
Seeing that he had tricked the fish, he immediately changed his expression, startling everyone with his quick change of heart. In fact, Andre had long deduced that the fish was on the same side as the black cat. If the boy treated the black cat so cruelly, then he wouldn't spare the fish either. He did this to make the monsters destroy each other. After making sure the fish had left, Andre took out the blue ball and continued deducing, but the result horrified him. Despite being trapped for so long, the monster could still easily interfere with his deduction ability. Even the aura beside him couldn't stop it. At this point, Andre realized the black cat was the key, but his mental strength was almost depleted, unable to use deduction anymore. His only option was to find the cat's eye himself. At that moment, the black cat suddenly appeared behind him. Although a bit surprised, Andre wasn't afraid, knowing that as long as he didn't violate the boundary, the black cat couldn't attack. Then Andre started negotiating with the black cat. Through his deduction, he knew the only way to escape was with the pair of eyes. Andre deduced that the black cat and the fish served the same master, but the fish kept trying to harm the black cat to take all the credit. If it hadn't led the boy to the second floor, the black cat's eye wouldn't have been stolen. Hearing Andre's analysis, the black cat was also furiously angry. Now it understood how it had been harmed by the fish, so it agreed to cooperate with Andre. Andre would help find its eye. In exchange, it would no longer disturb him and even provide clues. Meanwhile, that foolish fish was almost killed by the boy on the first floor when exposed. The boy only let it survive to fight against the monster with Andre. Apart from the fish, the staff also gave Andre three lunchboxes, the boy's file, and the black cat's pair of eyes. Andre ate the lunchboxes, read the file to regain his strength, then went to the second floor to meet the waiting black cat. Seeing the black cat, he threw both the fish and the eyes to it. After reattaching the eyes, the black cat's anger became uncontrollable. It charged towards the fish, its fury unrestrained. A slap shattered the fish into a pile of mud. Unexpectedly, the map also appeared then. It had always been inside the fish's belly, but seeing Andre take the map, the black cat became enraged again, wanting to take back its words and continue helping the monster. Andre calmly said it had betrayed its master by killing the fish. If it wanted to survive and leave, it had to keep its promise. The black cat then realized it had been completely controlled by Andre. Despite its talents, it was too foolish, now only able to surrender. As for Lucas, he dealt with the black cat in a completely different way. At this point, it's unknown if his mind was still normal. Lucas said that as long as the black cat was eliminated, all problems would be solved. Seeing Lucas's crazed look, the black cat also realized it shouldn't provoke him. As it was about to leave, Lucas threw a few cards like flying knives, stabbing straight into its tail, pinning it to the ground. Seeing Lucas approach, the black cat was terrified and screamed for mercy. At this moment, the fish appeared to help, but it miscalculated. Lucas didn't give it a chance to speak, turning around immediately, intending to kick it into the air. Panicked by Lucas charging at it, the fish was also horrified. It didn't expect him to be so insane as to not say a word and just rush in to tear apart anyone he saw. The fish hurriedly retreated, shouting that it was uninvolved, telling the black cat to handle it itself. Hearing this, the black cat ignored it. Seizing the chance to pull out the cards, it turned and ran for its life. Seeing this, the fish could only curse its ingratitude and also slipped into the darkness. By now, Lucas had gone completely insane. Even if he charged up, the fish had already hidden in the shadows, whether he could catch up or not. Meanwhile, as I led the fish up to the third floor, I received a tip from the Chinese government, confirming that the fish did have issues. However, since I needed it to stay and act with me, I decided to keep it for a while longer. Looking at its foolish appearance, I felt embarrassed for it. When we arrived in front of the director's office door, a strong force pulled us inside. Inside was pitch black with flickering green lights. The fish knelt before the altar, boasting that it had tricked the most handsome guy into coming here, waiting for its master to return and fully regain control. Hearing that, I pondered, knowing it had lied before, but unsure if the master it mentioned now was the monster or truly the director. Then the main character appeared. The chair turned around, a skeletal figure gradually emerged from the shadows. He praised the fish for doing well and said he would grant it more strange powers when he regained control of the museum. Then he seemed delighted by my body and ordered the fish to prepare the body swapping ritual. Seeing it struggle, I wanted to laugh. Turns out they didn't value me at all. They thought I was an ordinary candidate. Since they didn't think much of me, I'll show the fish why I'm called Red Flower. 
Actually, faced with the fish's arrogant attitude, I wasn't lenient either. I threw a flying kick towards it. I don't know if it was lucky or unlucky, but just that one kick was enough to activate my deadly secret technique. It fell face down on the ground, crying and apologizing to me. Just as it was about to reveal the secret, the monster suddenly appeared and stopped it. The monster appeared just in time, preventing the fish from revealing anything. The map in its belly was also completely destroyed by him. Seeing him appear again, I was furious. Not only did he destroy the map, but he also wanted to shove his rotten face onto me. Did he know how long it had been since he last brushed his teeth and washed his face? Facing such a powerful monster, guessed my kick might not be strong enough, so I summoned Little White Tiger and Black General to test the fire. But surprisingly, before Little White Tiger, he immediately shut up, screamed refusing to submit, then collapsed. Then a diary flew up, catching my attention. It was the director's younger brother's diary. It wrote that the two brothers were very close. Although just an ordinary employee, as an older brother, the director cared a lot about him. But their peaceful life didn't last long. First, the director became mysterious, then frequently went out. Although the employees said he was just doing charity work, the brother still felt worried. Then one day, the director suddenly brought home a boy, saying he found him in the trash and wanted to adopt him. Seeing this, the brother admired him even more. But strangely, as the boy grew up, his complexion worsened. No matter how many supplements the director bought for the boy, his condition didn't change. At this point, the brother panicked and took the boy for a checkup as his uncle. But the result left him stunned. Because the boy didn't suffer from normal anemia. From the injection marks on his arms, it could be seen that every day, a certain amount of blood was taken from the boy, while other blood was transfused in. Hearing the doctor's explanation, the brother was stunned, completely unaware of what his brother had done. When he asked, the director denied it. With no other choice, the brother took the boy away first. Through care, the boy gradually trusted him and saw him as a father. But after some time, strange things started happening. First, he saw a blind cat and a talking fish during night patrols. Next, display cases were shattered for no reason, and some visitors who went to the second floor completely disappeared. Faced with these bizarre occurrences, he couldn't sit still. He went to the third floor to confront the director, but it was too late. By then, his brother had completely turned into a strange creature. Not only was he gradually losing his mind, but he also wanted to control the entire museum. Now everyone inside the museum was trapped. Although he tried to lead the employees to resist, they were no match for that bizarre force. Luckily, the director still had feelings for him, allowing him to survive. But faced with the situation spiraling out of control, he had to find a way to stop it. So he risked his life to exchange blood with the boy. Indeed, after the exchange, he could also sense that bizarre force but couldn't control it. His body was decaying. Although he was about to become the museum's second monster, before that happened, he still had time to find an important clue in the office. The truth was, the museum director wasn't the final boss. Through the director's younger brother's diary, I roughly understood the situation. After reading the last page, the diary seemed to have completed its mission. The skeletal head that had just fallen stood up, saying that after reading the diary, I had guessed its identity. But I didn't believe it when it said it was the brother. So I asked how it felt while writing the diary. When it answered with hatred and despair, I completely confirmed its identity. Clearly, it wasn't the brother, but the museum director himself. Seeing that I had a monster with me, he knew he didn't have enough strength, so he gave up the idea of taking over my body. Instead, he pretended to be the brother to deceive me, then asked me to eliminate the real brother. But unfortunately, I could clearly sense the brother's feelings when writing the diary. The prevention he mentioned wasn't about harming, but saving. Seeing his plot exposed, he had to admit defeat, saying he would leave it to me. But seeing his lonely face, I laughed and said I didn't want to kill him for now, as he could still be useful. I summoned the doll, telling it to guard him closely, not letting him cause trouble. At this point, Black General started ransacking the room. As expected, it quickly found a few notebooks and three keys in the corners. Then I told Black General to guard the director, while I would go back to the first and second floors with the doll to find other clues. On the way back, I opened the notebook to see the new rules. Rule 12. The wax chamber is extremely dangerous. Don't try to find it. Rule 13. If unfortunately trapped in the wax chamber, keep absolutely silent. Don't make any sound. Rule 14. There are many different wax statues in the wax chamber. They are just copies. Their eyes cannot comprehend. Their bodies cannot comprehend. Rule 15. When a wax statue stares at you, make sure your eyes also stare at them. Don't blink. Otherwise, terrible things will happen. Rule 16. There are no skeleton-shaped wax statues in the wax chamber. If you see one, 
run out as fast as possible. During the challenge phase, the wax chamber has no exit. After reading, I felt something was off. According to the hint in Rule 11, if following the above rules, after touring the museum, visitors can safely leave by just going through the main gate. But the notebook kept emphasizing the wax chamber, so I thought Rule 11 was wrong. The museum's exit was likely related to the wax chamber, even possibly inside it. Meanwhile, Andre also managed to lure the black cat to go upstairs with him. Before going up, he had used his deduction talent multiple times. As long as he followed the deduction scenario, he could conveniently obtain the notebook and three keys. Indeed, after entering the office, Andre quickly found the notebook and keys. He exchanged the black cat as a reward to safely leave the third floor. As for Lucas, although the fish and black cat were still alive, they didn't dare get close to him. Facing this madman, they decided to stay silent to preserve their lives, hoping Lucas wouldn't vent his anger on them. After observing Lucas go up to the third floor, they, they were just starting to sort things out when the director's agonizing screams rang out from upstairs. Could it be that Lucas had gotten excited again? The black cat and the fish heard the director's agonizing cries. Indeed, there was something wrong with Lucas's brain. He had gone mad again. Even though the director had voluntarily handed over the diary, Lucas wouldn't have it, insisting on beating him up to feel at ease. Hearing the commotion in the office, the black cat and fish didn't dare go in, fearing they might accidentally provoke him. But in just a few minutes, their self-preservation plan went bankrupt, because Lucas kicked the director out of the office. Seeing the black cat and the fish, the director completely lost his composure. He thought they would find a suitable body for themselves. Little did he expect them to bring this madman instead. Clearly, they wanted him dead. Facing Lucas charging at him, the director didn't think, immediately throwing the black cat and the fish to take the hit. But he had underestimated Lucas's insane strength. The two couldn't withstand Lucas. Though insane, Lucas had predicted the director couldn't leave the third floor. So the scalpel in his hand sliced past the director's neck, stopping 0.01 centimeters away. Then he joked he would let the director live since he was still useful. The next morning after breakfast, he went to the bathroom on the second floor again. This time, most of the candidates had a strange consensus. At the same moment, almost all the candidates were present here. As the oldest one, I stated my view first. I thought that the black cat and the fish trying to lure us to the third floor proved that going there was not mandatory. Therefore, it could be inferred that the director's diary on the third floor was just a side quest, not necessarily to be completed. So, rule 11 in the notebook was correct. The third floor was unnecessary. After hearing this, Savadika from Zola immediately raised a question. He hadn't been to the third floor but still couldn't escape. I pondered for a while and guessed he might not have completed the most important task, which was to find the lost exhibits and put them back in their proper places. But when Savadika was about to joyfully ask for more clues, all the mirrors around him shattered. Clearly, the strange world didn't want Savadika to know more, so I suggested communicating through eye signals. But this made the younger ones quite awkward. Except for me and Andre who quickly grasped this way of communication, the rest were all flustered by that eye blinking. After communicating with Andre for 10 minutes, I was about to help the others when all the mirrors shattered. Zhou Ming looked at the broken shards, feeling helpless. Although he couldn't communicate anything, he still decided to look for the lost exhibits according to what I had said earlier. At this point, the black cat and the fish appeared, blocking Zhou Ming's way and trying to lure him to go upstairs. But thanks to my warning, Zhou Ming didn't trust them at all. Zhou Ming shouted and scolded the ungrateful black cat. Clearly, he had just helped it regain its eyes, and now it was betraying him. Hearing this, the black cat also got angry. To prove itself as the loyal Quan Erji, it dashed straight into the mirror. What happened next horrified Zhou Ming. There was a corpse inside the mirror. The black cat didn't care. It jumped in and pulled out a plate. Could that be the lost exhibit? Zhou Ming was still doubtful if it was tricking him. But suddenly the black cat got furious. Its fur standing on end even though it had no fur. Zhou Ming didn't think it was deceiving him. So he decided to trust the black cat this time. He hugged the plate and ran for his life back to the first floor. Indeed, the black cat blocked the fish, fighting with it so Zhou Ming could escape. Back on the first floor, Zhou Ming placed the plate in the cabinet. A beam of light shone out, the door opened, the prohibition disappeared. Zhou Ming was very surprised, never expecting the black cat to help him so much. It was almost like leading him straight to the finish line. But the open door was only for Zhou Ming. The security guards were still trapped inside. Zhou Ming realized the issue apologizing to everyone for not being able to complete the task on the third floor. He could only save himself first. 
Although a bit disappointed, seeing Zhou Ming's remorse, the guards also comforted and encouraged him. Initially hesitant, but receiving urgent guidance from the Chinese government, Zhou Ming decided to go out. He stepped out of the museum amid the guards' New Year congratulations. Zhou Ming became the first person to pass the museum's challenge, although he only received one star rating. Meanwhile, last night, American Rosan used his insight talent and received guidance. After breaking all the mirrors in the second floor bathroom, he noticed something unusual. Although the fish and black cat appeared to block him, since Rosan didn't violate the prohibition, they couldn't intervene directly. Seeing the monster about to revive, Rosan didn't hesitate, following last night's guidance from his talent to find the exhibit and escape. When Rosan placed the exhibit in the cabinet, the clearance notification also sounded. Since he decoded the mirror mystery himself, his reward score was higher than Joe Mains. The other candidates weren't so lucky. Savadika from Zola and Aaron from Oli also discovered the mirror's secret but failed because they didn't know about the interference in the pile of exhibits. As for me, after getting the key from the director's office, I returned to the hallway. Looking at the door in front of me, I wondered which of the over 10 doors to open with only three keys. No clues, I reopened the director's monstrous diary, hoping to find new hints. But this time, the hint left me a bit confused. I thought there were only corpses behind the mirrors as the fish said. But according to the diary, there was another important clue. At the same time as the hint, the diary also automatically burned due to exceeding the usage limit. The diary disappeared completely. Then I summoned the doll back to the bathroom, facing the mirrors. I didn't hesitate, ordering the doll to smash them all. When the mirrors broke, the corpses were revealed. But what surprised me was that their shadows seemed to turn into resentful spirits, starting to move. It was then that I understood, the mirrors not only hid the corpses but also suppressed the resentful spirits. But now it's too late. If these are the corpses of museum staff, the resentful spirits will surely go to the third floor to take revenge on the director. Fortunately, I had left the black general there. Otherwise if the director gets possessed by the resentful spirits, I won't get a perfect score. Observing carefully, I noticed the corpses were lying in a twisted manner, seeming to conceal a message. I ordered Little White Tiger and the doll to pull them all out and rearrange them. Unexpectedly, they could actually be arranged into words. I guessed the number sequence at the bottom was the door number on the second floor. So among those three doors, one must be the wax room. But I only had three chances to open the doors. I wonder if opening the wrong one would cost me. Although unsure which door was correct, with Little White Tiger and the doll guarding me, I decided to try my luck. But then a staff member in a red uniform appeared, advising me not to open the door. He said his map had information about the wax room. Although very annoyed, but wanting to defy the rules, I still took his map. The map was indeed fake. I checked the marked locations but couldn't find the wax room anywhere. I threw the map away and prepared to open the door. But the staff in red kept trying to stop me. Having defied the rules already, I showed no mercy, kicking him away. Then I shouted at him to kneel down and sing for me, not to disturb me opening the door anymore. Seeing me act like that, the Russian government immediately sent a hint to Andre. What puzzled everyone was that the information Andre received was different from mine. When Andre reached the door, he also met the staff in red. To be cautious, he used his talent to deduce the outcomes. Scenario 1. He ignores the staff and beats him up brutally. Result. A monster appears. He survives thanks to the blue ball but it gets damaged. Scenario 2. He follows the staff to the third floor to find the location marked on the map. Result. He dies immediately. Scenario 3. He ignores the staff, opens doors 3 and 5 but still dies. Only the final scenario of opening door 7 allows him to survive. But is that really the correct answer? But due to overusing it, his mental state started to become disordered, so he could only rely on himself to make the decision. After knowing the correct answer, Andre ignored the staff's obstruction. He knew as long as he didn't violate the rules, the staff couldn't do anything to him. Meanwhile, Lucas also received a hint from the American government. He also found useful clues from the corpses in the bathroom, but the door number he found was different from ours. The three of us now had three different results. Who was right? When Lucas reached the second floor hallway, he also met the staff in red, but he didn't bother listening, laughing maniacally and pulling out an old surgical knife. He took advantage of the staff's laughs, stabbing him in the waist. The staff, panicked by this madman, 
could only clutch his stomach and flee, but Lucas didn't let up, chasing after him with the knife. The result was one stab to the lung, two to meet his ancestors. Lucas looked at his work with delight. Clearly, he was no longer a normal human. The black fur on his legs was gradually spreading up to his knees. If this continued, even if the monster couldn't defeat him, he would self-destruct. But now that he had lost his mind, for the three doors he used his talent with an eerie power to find the answer on the first try. When he confidently opened door four, a surge of ominous energy rushed out, his live stream went dark. This scene left the outside viewers in shock. They thought Lucas could drag out a few more horror movie episodes, but didn't expect him to be eliminated so quickly. But why hasn't there been a system announcement about Lucas yet? Could it be that he's not dead? This didn't just happen to Lucas. After opening one of the doors, I was also surrounded by a bloody hand, and my live stream also turned black. Until now, of the three candidates who had clues about the wax room, only Andre's live stream is still functioning normally. He's being very cautious, as without the deduction talent, he can only grope in the darkness to find the entrance to the wax room. For safety, he also prepared the blue ball. This cautious attitude really makes me admire him. Luckily I'm the main character, with many supporting buffs, otherwise I would have been overshadowed by him. After searching for a while, Andre finally found the entrance to the wax room. As soon as he entered, the stone door automatically closed, cutting off his way out. According to the hint from Rule 13, if unfortunately trapped in the wax room, maintain absolute silence, don't make any sound. Although unsure if the rule was correct or not, the atmosphere forced Andre to stay silent. As he passed by the bizarre wax statues, he noticed the walls were covered in photos of the museum director. But upon closer inspection, it didn't seem to be the same person. He remembered in the diary, the director's brother said the two of them looked identical. So if there was one person here impersonating the director, could it be his brother? Then was the skeleton on the third floor the director or his brother? But now was not the time to think too much. Because just as Andre had predicted, the blue ball could no longer conceal his presence from the monster. The bizarre wax statues began surrounding Andre. With no other choice, he had to use his infinite deduction talent to find an escape. But backed into a corner, would he succeed? Meanwhile, my livestream suddenly returned to normal. As for the hint from Rule 13, I completely disregarded it. Not only did I scream loudly as soon as I entered, I even threatened to break the arms and legs of those wax statues if they dared move. After passing through the wax statues, I also saw the walls covered in photos. At first I thought they were all of the director, but upon closer inspection I noticed differences between the photos. If among them were both the director and his brother, could it be that the brother was impersonating the director? As I picked up a photo to leave, I turned back and saw the bizarre wax statues had surrounded me at some point. According to the hint from Rule 15, when they stare at you, you must stare back at them, don't blink or something terrible will happen, but I'm not an easy prey to bully. I immediately closed my eyes, no longer looking at them, and even turned my back to provoke them. My provocative action enraged the wax statues, making them charge at me. But how could these worms stand a chance against me? Under the protection of the defiant talent, one kick sent the nearest one flying, followed by a series of slaps. The slaps seemed to create a wonderful drum melody. Under the influence of my deadly secret technique, the wax statues also began crying and confessing their sins. Seeing them cry miserably, I intended to add fuel to the fire, but unexpectedly, using too much force caused their heads to fly off their necks. However, the heads of these dogs were really stubborn. Just one slap made my hand numb, so I immediately summoned Little Bear, saying I was tired. It was his turn to take the stage. Watching Little Bear easily crush all the wax statues, the outside viewers enthusiastically commented, but unexpectedly, these bizarre wax statues automatically restored themselves. Looking at them like ants, I also felt a headache, but I didn't intend to waste time here. I ordered Little Bear to destroy and restore them, repeating to buy me time to find clues. Not long after, accompanied by the doll, I found a new file in the secret room. But what puzzled me was that inside the room there was a dried skeleton identical to the one on the third floor. Moreover, the fragrance in the room was clearly identical to the one in the resting room on that floor. Could the fuel in the lamps have been taken from here, rather than from that floor? If so, this skeleton must be the director, while the one on the third floor is his brother. But why would he do that? Deliberately misleading me to think the other person was the director. No matter how much I pondered, I couldn't figure it out, so I decided to retrieve the lost item first. But due to using too much force, I accidentally tore off a piece of his finger. Although I felt a bit of remorse, he was already dead. I thought he wouldn't mind a few pieces of finger missing. But when I was about to leave with the item, a giant black shadow suddenly appeared, enveloping me. 
Oh, I must have angered this guy. I suspect the comic author frequently browses the web to read readers' comments. Actually, when I saw him revive the skeleton, I should have greeted him politely. To show my enthusiasm, I immediately threw a flying kick. This warm greeting seemed to have ignited the fire in his cold heart. With fierce red eyes, he charged and hugged me tightly. Looking at his dusty old suit, I knew he hadn't bathed for at least a few years, so I couldn't bear this passionate hug, and immediately summoned the doll to attack him. Seeing the doll, he was startled, completely not expecting a strange monster to appear in the museum. Then he shouted, scolding his stupid brother. From his words, I completely confirmed his identity as the director, while the one on the third floor was his brother. But now their identities were no longer important. I took advantage of the doll conversing with him to search for new clues. Not long after, on his old dusty chair, I discovered an abnormality. The entire chair was covered in dust except for a few grip marks on the armrests, clearly indicating a secret mechanism. When I grabbed and twisted it, sure enough, a secret door opened behind the wall. Although I didn't know if it was an exit or not, I still called Little Bear and the others to quickly retreat, telling them to go in with me. Meanwhile, Lucas from America also successfully reached the wax room and recognized the director. He noticed the difference between the director and his brother, but he didn't underestimate being surrounded by the wax statues. Just a few cards thrown sliced them in half, but seeing them reassemble and mock him, he couldn't remain calm anymore. He fell into a state of frenzy. He smashed a wax statue that hadn't recovered yet, then used a powerful technique. Cards flew everywhere without restraint. Against Lucas's indiscriminate attack, the wax statues were completely unable to resist, shattering into a pile of debris. After finishing them off, Lucas also went through the secret door, finding the director's skeleton. Not only did he snatch the item from the director's hand, but he also found the mechanism and escaped in a majestic manner. It's undeniable that, aside from the black fur all over his body, Lucas is still very handsome and elegant. Turning to Andre from Russia, he was very worried about being surrounded by the wax statues. For him, the blue ball was his last means of survival, which he would definitely not use unless necessary. But the situation had become too dangerous, so Andre decided to focus his strength in the final seconds, closing his eyes and trying to activate his talent once more. He hoped to find an escape through deduction. When Andre's talent was activated, the deduction results gradually appeared. Result 1. He refused to yield to anyone, fighting them but was immediately defeated. Result 2. He followed the rules, staring at them and slowly retreating towards the director. But before completing the deduction, the wax statue and the doll charged at him. To avoid being fatally attacked, Andre had to interrupt the deduction, opening his eyes and staring at the wax statue as the rules suggested. Seeing the wax statue stop, he finally breathed a sigh of relief. Then he tried to recall the half result of the second deduction. He clearly remembered smelling a special fragrance from the skeleton inside the secret room identical to the one in the resting room on the first floor. So perhaps that skeleton was the director. The wax statues and the doll didn't attack the director. If he applied this fragrance on himself, could he disguise himself as the director to fool them? Thinking so, he became more convinced that it was the only way. So he decided to follow the deduction, slowly retreating towards the director while being pursued by the wax statues. After more than 10 minutes, he finally reached the secret room. There, he discovered the fragrance was coming from the lamp oil next to the director. Next, a scene that astonished the audience appeared. Andre used his bare hands to scoop up the scorching hot wax oil, smearing it all over his body. His hands were severely burned, but he remained calm, not uttering a sound, truly befitting a warrior nation. After transforming himself into the fragrance, the wax statues lined up and left. Andre held his breath until they were far away before finally breathing a sigh of relief. He silently rejoiced at having made the right decision. It turned out that simply possessing an item similar to the director's could avoid attacks from the wax statues. Now that the danger had passed, he could search for clues to escape the wax room at ease. Not long after, a strange voice suddenly rang out from behind Andre. Turning around, he saw the director had come back to life and was charging at him. But Andre wasn't the least bit scared, for he had been waiting for this very moment. When he first entered, he had noticed the dent on the wooden chair. Andre deliberately turned his back to find a trap to lure the director away from the chair. And when he easily dodged the attack, turning the switch on the chair, the secret door also opened accordingly. This tactic truly brought Andre's intelligence to its peak. Thanks to that, he escaped the wax statue's attack and found a new exit without any assistance. Ignoring the director's frantic screams, Andre hurried towards the door. But when he reached the end of the path, he realized this door didn't lead to an exit from the museum. 
but rather to the office on the third floor, seeing the director's brother and the director himself chasing after him. Andre felt very confused. He didn't understand why the two identical skeletons started fighting each other upon meeting. Could it be that they had a grudge? But Andre didn't want to get involved in the brother's affairs, so he quickly stepped aside to eat popcorn and watch. Observing the two nearly identical skeletons cursing at each other, Andre realized the director's brother wasn't a good person either. With the help of the fish, he had usurped many different bodies. From their dialogue, Andre sensed that everything seemed very complicated, but before Andre could react, the two skeletons had argued and charged into their final battle. Suddenly, an invisible force pushed him out of the room. It's unclear how long it took for Andre's live feed to return to normal, but the scene before him was quite surprising. The former enemies now had completely opposite attitudes. It's unclear who was lying motionless on the ground. Just as Andre regained his senses and was about to ask about the situation, the clearance announcement suddenly rang out. Thanks to deciphering the mysteries of the first and second floors, he escaped safely, received four stars, and a special reward of a wax candle. But he didn't find the missing item, yet he still passed, how strange. Meanwhile, Lucas encountered a similar situation. The two brothers also pushed him out of the room. But in a fit of rage, the stubborn black-furred Lucas charged right back in. Now we can see what the two brothers will do. As the two skeletons released their eerie energy, forming a confrontation, an evil ghost suddenly appeared, attacking the director's brother who was caught off guard. If killed by the ghost, the brother would surely die. But Lucas charged in, not letting that happen, for no one could stop him from getting the highest score. Accompanying Lucas's strike, the ghost's agonizing scream also caught the brother's attention. These ghosts were the resentful spirits of the janitors, coming to take revenge on the director. But Lucas didn't do it to eliminate the resentment, but to make them realize their true target. The other one was the real director, the one they needed to take revenge on. Thanks to the reminder, the resentful souls finally awoke, almost falling for the director's brother's fragrance trick. But faced with the resentful spirit's attack, the director's brother suddenly stood in front of him, claiming to be the culprit behind everyone's deaths. This bizarre scene only added to the confusion in Lucas's already dim-witted mind. He didn't understand why the brothers wanted to kill each other earlier but now suddenly changed their attitudes. Or was it all just an act to provoke the other side, then sacrifice themselves for the other to live? Lucas pondered for a while but felt it didn't make sense. If so, the director couldn't have died either. The more he thought about it, the more he believed it was the truth. So to get the maximum score, Lucas attacked the resentful spirits with a knife strike. This left them stunned, not understanding why he had helped them earlier but was now attacking them madly. But against the power of the rusty knife, they couldn't resist and quickly vanished. At this point, Lucas was trying to stay sober by cutting his own arm. He feared losing control and killing the two brothers. As the two director brothers helped each other up, the system announced that Lucas not only cleared five stars but also received the resentful ghost as a reward. But Lucas didn't know this wasn't the most perfect ending to the strange museum story. Turning back to me, after leaving the wax room, I went straight up to the office on the third floor. Through the Black General's report, I also learned about the resentful ghost sneak attack. Clearly, they mistook the director's brother for the director. I knew they would definitely try to strike again, so I ordered the Black General to prevent the monsters from appearing. We had to stay in the room. Sure enough, while the two brothers were tensely confronting each other, the ghosts reappeared and attacked them both, but I immediately ordered the laughing bear and doll to stop them. My action not only confused the resentful spirits but also left the two brothers completely puzzled. I knew they were both very furious, but still asked them to stay calm so I could analyze everything from start to finish. But at this point, the resentful spirits were impatient, thinking they were the victims, so they kept bothering me. How could I tolerate that? I stepped forward and slapped them, telling them to shut up. Seeing this, the two director brothers were also stunned. They didn't understand how I could hit the spirits when they were just immaterial ghosts. Faced with their pitiful looks, I also fell silent, as I didn't know why I just habitually raised my hand, but unexpectedly, I could actually hit them. This deadly move is really useful. After being hit, the resentful spirits immediately hid in the corner, crying remorsefully. Seeing them obedient, I felt relieved and ordered the laughing bear and doll to release them. Now facing three obedient students, I was truly satisfied. I happily began to present my deductions. In my opinion, the two director brothers were originally very close. It was only because they wanted to provoke each other that they deliberately quarreled, hoping the other would defeat them so they could sacrifice themselves to save the other. The younger brother intentionally created an evil image so that when an outsider invaded the museum, they would eliminate the younger brother, 
helping the older brother escape the control of the strange forces and be reborn. The older brother did the same, although he knew the younger one couldn't be saved, he still wanted to sacrifice himself to save his brother. I had discovered from the moment I entered the museum that the special fragrance burned in the restroom on the first floor was made by the director. If he really wanted to harm the staff and visitors, he didn't need to use that substance. The reason he did it was to try to salvage the situation. But because he couldn't control the strange power within him, he locked himself in the wax room. I must say my tiny brain still contained a few things. The two director brothers admitted the truth after hearing this, but since they couldn't change it, they could only follow that plan. However, I told them not to worry, because I could extract the strange power from their bodies. Before I could finish speaking, the resentful spirits who were eating popcorn nearby suddenly became angry. As victims killed by the director, they couldn't easily forgive him. They screamed, intending to sneak attack the director right in front of me. Seeing them dare to be so rude, I became furious. I immediately slapped them again making them once more understand the cruelty of reality, only able to crouch in the corner drawing circles. Then I warned the two director brothers not to resist, and ordered the doll to begin extracting the strange power from their bodies. At that moment, the sound of the door opening suddenly rang out, and the strange boy hurriedly ran in. Seeing him, I breathed a sigh of relief, as I was worried about where to find him earlier. Now he came by himself, and the power of the two brothers originated from him so the doll could extract it all at once. When the doll's ability was activated, the strange power within the three of them also began to surge. Although they resisted, they were no match for the doll and were quickly drained. Seeing the strange nature of the power, I didn't hesitate and immediately ordered the doll to begin absorbing it. But unexpectedly, in the moment the doll turned away, it broke free from control, rushing towards the resentful spirits hiding in the corner. It merged with them into one, seeing the resentful spirits become vicious again. I was furious. Initially, they were victims, and I intended to give them a good ending. But now it's different, they challenged my limits. So I won't hold back either. I immediately ordered my three guards to attack and discipline this bunch. The outcome was predictable. Although they had merged with a strange power, against the three powerful guards with strange power. They couldn't resist and were beaten until they begged for mercy. After about 10 minutes of beating, the black general and the others finally walked out leisurely. But I noticed something quite strange. Although the strange power wasn't strong, they were a combination of three different energies. Why was there no change after merging? The doll seemed to read my thoughts, raising its carrot-shaped finger pointing down at the ground. This darkness is so bizarre. Could it be a new ability? Once again, through the strange incident at the museum. Next is the wonderful company. In fact, the doll had completely absorbed the three strange powers and evolved again. My shadow glowed strangely. Along with the doll's new ability, I was suddenly transmitted to the first floor in a strange way. Looking at the surroundings, I realized the darkness connecting me and the doll could allow me to move freely, and my body was completely normal, proving this was the doll's unique skill. I didn't have to pay any price when borrowing the strange power. This was truly a miracle beyond my imagination. As for the questions from the security staff, I thought since I'm here, I might as well reset the exhibits to their original positions. Even though everything upstairs had been thoroughly resolved, when everyone hoped I would reset the exhibits to let them out, that expectation did not come true. Seeing their disappointment, I reassured them that the rules always emphasized the wax room, so that must be the real exit. Sure enough, when I returned to the wax room, I saw the door had changed. This door was indeed the way out. But as I was about to open it, the boy's voice rang out from behind. Turning around, I saw it was everyone coming to see me off. This scene was so moving, even for me, who had gone through so much. I really hoped the strange events would soon disappear and stop harming people. When I opened the big door, a series of system notifications sounded. I had successfully passed the museum and received six star ratings. Additionally, I was rewarded with generous gifts. Besides the living wax statue that could replace me, taking a fatal blow for me at the critical moment, there was also the boy's wax pen. Just write a question, and the pen would provide the accurate answer. Although just the introduction showed the terrifying power of these two rewards, instead of joy, I felt fear. Previously, I always hoped to pass through but never received rewards of this level. There was even a wax copy number 11 that could replace me, clearly an extra life. Either the danger level of upcoming events will increase, or the monster has lost patience with me, intending to kill me. Even this time, I had consecutively passed through 10 strange events. But overthinking now is useless. Along with my success, 
the summary notification for the strange museum event also rang out across the world. Thanks to the high scores from the four of us, the corresponding countries also received different basic rewards. At this time, the people of Dragon Country were particularly joyful, as this was the first new year of peace and prosperity since the strange world appeared. However, joyful times always pass quickly. Three days later, I was brought into the strange world again. This time it was the wonderful company event. In this event, each candidate will be randomly transmitted to any space where another candidate is currently located. The only way to survive and escape the wonderful company within two days is to uncover the true secret within the company. After reading the instructions, I realized that not only had my outfit changed, but I had also completely become an ordinary worker. Before I could catch my breath, someone who seemed to be a superior casually assigned me work. However, I couldn't see that person's face clearly. What does this mean? Although the person ordered me in an unpleasant tone that made me want to slap them, since the rules hadn't appeared yet, I decided to restrain myself for now. When I arrived at the designated work location, I noticed there were clearly blood stains on the desk. Could this be the blood of the employee who sat here before? But before I could react, a cleaner rushed over and began wiping away the blood stains. The cleaner even carefully apologized to me, asking me not to complain to the director. But at this moment, I noticed something else, which was that the cleaner's face was also blurred. I didn't know the reason for this. Or was it a challenge to find teammates, like the mental hospital event? I turned on the computer to investigate the situation. The rules for this event finally appeared. Rule 1. You are just an ordinary employee. Do not argue, do not doubt, obedience is the only way to survive. Rule 2. Working hours are from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. daily. If your superior asks you to work overtime, do so unconditionally, without pay. Rule 3. The wolf culture is the company's symbol. Lazy and absentee employees are prohibited. Rule 4. No chatting or leaving your workstation for more than 10 minutes during working hours. Rule 5. Tasks assigned by your superiors must be completed on time, which is crucial for you. Rule 6. Within the company, no one is trustworthy except your superiors. No one is trustworthy. No one can order you to do anything. If a co-worker asks for help with work, you can refuse. Rule 7. To save working time, the company will provide lunch. If you want to eat something more normal, take the portion on top. Rule 8. Do not disclose or convey any information that defames the company to the food delivery person. Don't do that, they will get hurt. Rule 9. Do not use the company restroom in an emergency. Go down and use the public restroom, but it's best to report to the director and return within 20 minutes. Rule 10. The company will vote for the outstanding employee each day. Participate actively. The outstanding employee will have the privilege of leaving the company early. These rules made me uncomfortable. And what is the meaning of the black letters behind the rules? I violated many rules from the start. But why do all the people in this company have blurred faces? Actually, after reading the company rules, I pondered, although the meaning of the colored letters is unclear, certainly the rules with black letters will be more complex and important. So I need to pay attention to those rules. Moreover, I noticed all the workstations in the company have numbers. Although it's unclear if there's any hidden meaning, with my experience from many events, I decided to mark it first to be safe. Luckily there was a small knife in the drawer, so I used it to carve my name on the chair. After finishing, the sound of high heels came from behind. The self-proclaimed executive secretary asked me to edit the document content into a presentation and send it to her before lunch break today. Seeing his arrogant attitude, just like that person, it was clear he was ordering me around, so I didn't want to pay any attention to him. But he didn't know how formidable I could be. Seeing my careless attitude, he really got angry. Not only did he raise his voice, but he also threatened me with this so-called director. I've never been afraid of being bullied, nor do I know any director, so I couldn't show him any respect. That made this bossy person completely lose his composure. He pointed his finger at my face and started scolding me. His rude attitude made me feel annoyed. Initially, being a girl, I didn't want to argue with him, but he kept provoking me. So don't blame me for not being accommodating anymore. I slapped him across the face. But this arrogant secretary, instead of feeling remorseful after being slapped, actually charged at me to fight. Seeing that, I laughed. How many monsters have been defeated by my slap? It's just arrogance. So I stepped forward and slapped him again. This time, he didn't dare act aggressively anymore. Knowing he couldn't match me, he just cried and ran off to report me to the director wanting the director to punish me. But I didn't care, and started researching the presentation he mentioned. According to Rule 6, if a co-worker asks for help with work, you can refuse. So if I want to defy this rule, I couldn't refuse the secretary's request to make the PowerPoint presentation. 
thinking that, I had no other choice. Although I didn't know how to make a PPT, I still decided to write it randomly just to get it done, as long as I achieved the goal of defying the rule. So I started to unleash my talent. After a few minutes, the angry secretary and director came running, telling me to get out if I didn't want to do it. Hearing that, I completely lost my temper. Asking an 18-year-old high school student like me to make a presentation, how did they think about that? I'm still a child. No matter if they wanted to challenge me, this task was completely unreasonable. After saying all that and still not venting my anger, to completely violate these two rules, I snatched the documents from the director's hands and threw them away. Seeing that, the director's face immediately darkened. Even the secretary next to him was startled, pointing at my face and ordering me to apologize, or I would surely die. But how could I be afraid of such weaklings? If they wanted to show off their power, go ahead. I'll take a step back and consider myself defeated. But when I thought the director would reveal his monstrous form and fight me, he suddenly changed 180 degrees. Not only was he not angry anymore, he even praised me for having spirit, saying the company needed talented people like me. What surprised me more was that he then turned and played the good guy, scolding the secretary, putting all the blame on the secretary's head. This was followed by a fierce scolding. What a contradiction between words and actions, a true model of capitalists. Although I don't know what the secretary thought, but the end result was definitely gratitude and loyalty to the superiors. As for me, I found it very ridiculous. They were pretending too much. How could I swallow this hellish pill? It seems this time the challenge was not for me to overcome but for me to teach the company how to work. After hearing the secretary's declaration of loyalty, the director, satisfied, came to me and gave a new task. He said the PPT was too difficult. Instead I should make a short video advertising the company's welfare policies. Although he spoke of many welfare policies, in reality, none of them were true. But I still agreed happily, because not only did I want to expose their true nature, but I also wanted to teach this company a good lesson. I will make a video scolding the company director. But when I opened the video, I was very surprised to see that the employees in the clip had clear faces. Unlike my blurred-faced co-workers around me, or like the strange child in the previous event, I need to use a camera to see them clearly. Thinking that, I immediately took out my phone and randomly took a picture of a co-worker. But unexpectedly, the employee's face was still blurred in the photo. Why do the employees in the company have blurred faces, but the previous videos show people with clear faces? Or maybe they used to be normal, but gradually their faces became blurred after joining this company. And the more blurred they are, the more it shows they are being controlled by the company. This sudden thought made me a bit scared. But for now, without evidence, I decided to complete the task first, making a video exposing their true nature. Then I started using the rich language of Dragon Country to scold and curse the company. For example, a dog seeing Miracle Company must run and pee on them. If the director heard such eloquent words in Dragon language, he would surely be heavily shocked. However, to defy the suggestion in Rule 5, I didn't send it immediately but decided to delay until after lunch break. While I was excitedly making the video, the chosen one Matsumoto from Snail Country also received a task from the secretary, but his attitude was completely opposite to mine. Clearly an experienced worker, he not only happily accepted the task but also immediately started working on the presentation. Seeing his professional skills, he might have an advantage in this side event. In contrast, Jung Yunho from Kimchi Country, who had trained in singing and dancing for two and a half years, could sing and dance but was overwhelmed by the request to make a PPT. Then he tried to use his handsome looks to seduce the beautiful secretary, asking her to be less strict. But now the employees have been controlled by the company, devoid of personal feelings. Not only did she not show leniency, but she also threatened him that if he didn't submit the work before lunch break, he would face dire consequences. Back to me, around 12 noon after observing the whole morning, I noticed the employees had become completely indifferent. No matter what task the secretary assigned, they accepted it unconditionally. I guessed employee number 14 in the previous position might have left a clue to eat the first lunchbox during lunch. If that's true, the black text in the rule might be correct. But the black text is also part of the rule, so I still had to defy it. Meaning, to stay alert, I needed to eat that lunchbox but couldn't take it myself. As I was thinking, the delivery guy from Rotten Company arrived. Before I could react, those employees rushed and grabbed the lunches like madmen. After they took everything, I calmly walked over. To violate the rule's suggestion, 
I hugged the delivery guy and started revealing the company's secrets to him. The secret was that our director never brings toilet paper when he goes to defecate. After saying that, I didn't pay attention to the guy's embarrassed look. Turned back to my desk to eat lunch. The reason I didn't take the last one was that I had to snatch the first lunchbox mentioned in the rule. When I grabbed the lunchbox, that guy got angry, ready to fight me. But I immediately lied that this was the director's order. Hearing about the director, he instantly panicked. Sweating cold and silently sat down. Clearly, the spirit of resistance had completely dissipated. But just as I was about to take the lunchbox back to my desk, I noticed the employees had finished eating and started preparing for the next task. Although their diligent and dedicated attitude made me admire them, I didn't intend to follow. I leisurely ate and drank. Actually, while I was leisurely eating the snatched lunchbox, a person claiming to be a superior of the company suddenly appeared behind me, scolding me for eating slowly and trying to discard my lunch. Come on, it's already this late, and I still have to please him? I immediately slapped him, teaching him how to be a person. He was also stunned by the slap, holding his face and saying he was my superior and would fire me. But I didn't care who he was. I hit him to punish his hypocritical behavior. As long as I don't have morals, he can't bind me. The more I thought about it, the angrier I became, so I pinned him down on the floor and urinated on him. Meanwhile, the other candidates also faced similar situations. Andre Grayson and Matsumoto both chose to give up this legal lunch. After all, humans can go without food for a day without any major problems. But the choice of Jung Yunho from Kimchi Country was quite unusual. Despite being warned by the superior, he decided to eat his fill first, completely disregarding that warning. It must be said, this kimchi country guy is quite reckless. Not sure why the author drew him so handsome. But now, being handsome is useless. As he was happily eating, a strange aura started to envelop the surroundings. And when he looked up after finishing, his handsome face had changed. Although not completely blurred, the obvious change still made the live audience gasp in astonishment. But Jung Yunho was unaware of what was happening, being deluded by hallucinations at this point, believing this to be the true feelings of the company. Facing friendly colleagues in the illusion, he gradually lost himself, smiling foolishly and saying he had fallen in love with this company. This drove the kimchi country authorities in the real world completely mad. They had sent a warning, but he dared to ignore it. Such a stupid move was unprecedented in all the bizarre worlds, making them doubt the genes of their own country. Back to Grayson, at 1 p.m. Due to a full stomach, Grayson left his desk and went straight to the restroom despite the rule prohibiting its use. But Grayson thought going to a public restroom would waste time, and returning in 20 minutes would also violate the rules. Just as he reached the restroom, Grayson encountered the director. Surprisingly, the director made an odd gesture. Clearly not a smoker, but still lit a cigarette in front of Grayson. Maybe there was a bomb in the restroom and Grayson needed to step on it to detonate it. Thinking that, Grayson broke out in a cold sweat, made an excuse, turned around and left, saying he would come back later. But just as he was leaving the door, another employee hurriedly ran in, without thinking, and rushed straight into the restroom, seeing someone else step on the bomb for him. Grayson didn't leave either, but stood watching the spot where that person sat to defecate, wanting to see what would happen. Sure enough, soon there were screams of agony from inside. Was it some bizarre monster that liked to hide in the restroom and ambush people? Actually, after hearing the agonizing screams from the restroom, the director standing next to him calmly ate popcorn and opened the door to go in. Seeing the director go in, Grayson also realized the danger had passed. As he had guessed, the director's odd behavior was to wait for someone else to go in first. The company restroom could still be used, but someone had to go in first. The first person would definitely die. So, rule 9 was clearly a trap. If Grayson had chosen to go to a public restroom earlier, 10 minutes definitely wouldn't have been enough, violating the rule. But if he chose the company restroom, he had to wait for someone else to go first. Otherwise the consequences would be unimaginable. Thinking that, Grayson also shuddered in fear. Luckily, he was very cautious at that time. Otherwise it would have been him lying there now. Meanwhile, I completely ignored the superior's instructions. I leisurely opened my computer to watch the hottest TV show in Long Country recently. But just as the war god was excitedly battling with Bone Demon, an old man suddenly appeared behind me, pointing at my computer screen, about to report me for being lazy. I was completely confused, feeling this old man clearly had a perception issue. Didn't he see the scene where I slapped the director? Seeing his hateful face, I slapped him to teach him how to be a person. Not only that, I also threw the task assigned by the superior right in his face, ordering him to complete it before getting off work. Although he wanted to resist, facing my raised hand, 
he could only quietly lower his head, holding his face and saying he would definitely complete it before getting off work. After dealing with that, I suddenly needed to use the restroom, so I decided to go. Of course, I chose the most convenient place. When I got to the company restroom, I encountered a similar situation as Grayson. But for the unethical behavior of the director in a public place, I didn't want to comply. I stepped forward and slapped him, helping him correct his bad habits. After being slapped, the director lay flat on the floor, completely dazed. He couldn't understand why a new employee would be so brazen, but I didn't have time to pay attention to him leisurely walking into the restroom, but just as I stepped in, a strange aura appeared behind me. Although I sensed the danger in the restroom, I didn't know what it was. Before I could turn around to look, it was swallowed by the black general. The black general acted too swiftly, it must be said. Just a few minutes after I safely left the restroom, I saw the director still standing there, dazed. He clearly didn't expect that I could survive and come out. But seeing him still there, I decided to let him unleash his full enthusiasm. After washing my hands, I wiped the water on his shirt. Seeing his constipated look, I knew he was powerless against me. In the end, I didn't violate the rules. While he didn't know all my tricks, he could only be uselessly angry after I left. After using the restroom, I was in a good mood. But just as I returned to my desk, intending to continue watching the show, I found that my previous viewing history had disappeared. Not only that, when I looked again, the name carved on the desk had also vanished cleanly. Could this no longer be the bizarre world I was in before? I realized this was no longer the old bizarre world. The opening game instructions said each candidate would be randomly transmitted to another candidate's space. But looking around at the blurred employees, I had no idea whose world I had ended up in. Until a colleague appeared, and I looked at his half-blurred face and realized he was not a monster but a candidate with a perception problem. After that, I also confirmed this through the files on his computer. But why did Kimchi Country choose an idiot to participate in the event? This made me quite puzzled. Before I could think about the next step, the secretary suddenly appeared, throwing documents on the desk and rudely ordering me to complete them on time. But I was not as easygoing as this idiot. I slapped him, but unexpectedly, the idiot standing next to me, who was eating popcorn, suddenly rushed out to shield the secretary. This made me suspect he was a spy. But now, I no longer respected his status as a candidate. I intended to teach him a lesson. But when I enthusiastically slapped, I was successfully ambushed by the secretary. Initially, I thought thanks to the protection of my heaven-sent talent, he, a native of the bizarre world, couldn't harm me. But unexpectedly, this guy was a dog, immediately opening his mouth and biting my arm. Although I kicked him away immediately, my arm still had a bite mark. I realized something was wrong. Theoretically, with ordinary strength, the secretary shouldn't be able to penetrate the protection of my talent, unless my talent had no effect. I guess this must be the bizarre world of Jung Yunho. My talent had not resisted the rules in this space, so it couldn't be effective. Indeed, the bizarre world will continuously try to invalidate the talents of some candidates. This time I was lucky it was just the weak secretary. If a powerful character had suddenly attacked me unprepared, I might have died. Meanwhile, the Long Country authorities monitoring live were also startled by this scene. They realized the weakness of my talent had been exposed, so they ordered close monitoring of the other candidates. Any clues to pass the test must be sent to me immediately. As for Snail Country, seeing me finally injured, they rejoiced, hoping I would be eliminated in this round. Back in the bizarre world, apart from me being transmitted to another space, Matsumoto from Snail Country also appeared next to Lucas. But faced with the secretary's assignment, the two had completely opposite attitudes. One nodded obediently, the other directly charged and knocked him down. At this moment, Matsumoto looked at Lucas's crazy attitude. Inside, Matsumoto was also startled by Lucas's crazy attitude, fearing Lucas might suddenly lunge at him with a hip thrust. So he paid close attention to Lucas's every move. Fortunately, Lucas only went to the restroom, so he breathed a sigh of relief. Only after Lucas left, did he hurriedly start working on the plan, as he still had to help Lucas complete it. Otherwise, even if the monster didn't attack him, he could have died at Lucas's hands. Actually, after completing the secretary's task, Matsumoto from Snail Country was very proud. But in front of this bizarre director, he was still truly afraid. When he saw the director coming, Matsumoto respectfully handed over the documents and introduced his creative idea. He said although he had removed most of the misleading advertisements, he kept a few, so that viewers would know they were watching an advertisement. This bizarre idea not only astonished the audience but also darkened the director's expression immediately. But surprisingly, the director, who was about to get angry, 
suddenly changed his attitude by 180 degrees. He declared Matsumoto an outstanding employee and said he would announce the result after work for him to wait. After saying that, he left, leaving Matsumoto eagerly awaiting the good news of being able to leave soon. But at 5 p.m., Matsumoto and I were transmitted back to our original bizarre world. So was his evaluation valid? Back to me, the delivery person appeared again. But the rules only mentioned the company having lunch, not dinner. There was no mention of dinner, yet the employees lined up. This made me quite puzzled. At that moment, the employee who had accused me at lunch suddenly appeared, bringing a lunchbox to apologize to me. But there was something unusual here. I definitely wouldn't eat that lunchbox. I threw it back at him, telling him to eat this portion himself. Meanwhile, the other candidates also received lunchboxes from their colleagues. And except for Jun Yunho, most people refused to accept them. But this time, something unexpected happened. 